Preface of Scene on the Stage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, StageLeft.org Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton Preface The papers assembled in the present volume have been previously printed, in earlier versions, in Vogue and The Bookman and to the proprietors of those publications I am indebted for the privilege of quoting from my contributions to their pages. In re-editing the large mass of my comments on the current theater from the autumn of 1917 to the spring of 1920, I have decided to reprint only those articles which happened to deal with topics of abiding importance and to cast into the discard the many other articles that dealt with matters that were merely timely. This book does not pretend to any unity, except in so far as a certain sort of unity may be suggested by an honest record of the reactions of a single mind to a multitude of multifarious phenomena. The present volume may be considered, quite informally, as a sort of suffix to the theory of theater, studies in stagecraft, and problems of the playwright. And I should prefer that it might, if possible, be read in association with its predecessors in the series. C. H. New York City, 1920. End of Preface Chapter 1 of Scene on the Stage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, stageleft.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton, Life and the Theater. The quickest answer to the question, What is the purpose of art? would come with the retort courteous, What is the purpose of life? For both aims are indeed identical, since art is nothing else than the quintessence of life. The purpose of life has been discussed ever since the human race became articulate, and an adequate review of this discussion would require a resume of all the great religions of the world. Without attempting to cover so colossal a subject in an unpretentious essay, the present writer asks permission to offer an opinion concerning what appear to him to be the noblest and the meanest answers to this all-important question. The most ignoble definition of the purpose of life was formulated in fairly recent times by the Puritans of England and the Calvinists of Scotland. According to the concept of these dour, sour, glowering religionists, this world is nothing but a veil of tears, through which a man should slink whining like a beaten dog with his tail between his legs in the hope of being caught up subsequently into a nobler and better life which shall offer to him a renewal of those opportunities for positive appreciation which, on principle, he had neglected throughout the pitiful and wasted period of his sojourn upon earth. The Puritans and Calvinists warned their devotees against the lure of beauty and branded it as an ensnarement of the devil, and by this token they are damned, if there is such a sentence as damnation in the Supreme Court of Everlasting Law. The noblest answer to the basic question, what is the purpose of life, was asseverated by the noblest men who ever lived, those great Athenians who crowned this earth with their Acropolis two thousand and four hundred years ago. These men asserted that our world should be regarded as a valley of soul-making, a sort of training camp for infinite futurity in which the individual should find an opportunity to indicate his worthiness to live by accepting every offered chance to prove himself alive. That lovely and lasting phrase, the valley of soul-making, was not invented by the ancient Greeks. It was formulated by John Keats, who is their true apostle to all modern nations and, because of that, the greatest poet of recent centuries. It was Keats also who was destined to remind a forgetful world that beauty is truth, truth beauty, and that both of these ideals are identical with the ideal of righteousness. 
There is one God in three aspects. Beauty, which appeals to the emotions. Truth, which appeals to the intellect. Righteousness, which appeals to the conscience. This is the Gospel according to John Keats. This is the Law and the Prophets. If this world, according to the ancient Greeks, is to be regarded as a valley of soul-making, and if, according to the apostolic vision of John Keats, there is no basic difference between beauty, truth, and righteousness, it becomes the duty of every transient visitor to this valley to develop, in the little time allotted to him, what Rudyard Kipling has described as the makings of a bloomin' soul by keeping his spirit at all moments responsive and awake to every drifting evidence of what is true or beautiful or right. If the purpose of life is to prove ourselves alive in order to indicate our fitness for continuing to live in some hypothetical domain where second chances are accorded in the future, it behooves us to live as intensely and convincingly as possible throughout that fleeting period of threescore years and ten which is allotted to us on the average in this immediate valley of soul-making. It is only at infrequent intervals throughout our period of living that the best of us is able to feel himself to be alive. Sir Thomas Brown has penned an eloquent comment on this fact in the concluding section of his famous Letter to a Friend, in which he says, quote, And surely if we deduct all those days of our life which we might wish unlived and which abate the comfort of those we now live, if we reckon up only those days which God hath accepted of our lives, a life of good years will hardly be a span long. End quote. There is also in the record of eternal literature a comparatively recent poem by John Macefield called Biography, in which the poet, bemoaning the ironic chance that many inconsiderable days in his experience may be reduced by his biographer, quote, to lists of dates and facts, end quote, celebrates with lyric eloquence the unrecorded dates of several magnificent impressions and expressions of the soul which would escape the merely secondary apperceptiveness of any scholarly investigator. The purpose of life appears to be to live well yet we may, as the poet Tasso told us in one of the most forlorn and lovely passages of lyric literature, to seize every fleeting opportunity for feeling and asserting that we are alive in order to indicate our fitness for continuing to live in some hypothetic future region, quote, beyond the loom of the last lone star through open darkness hurled, end quote. Immortality, in order to be one, should be deserved, and no man is worthy of eternal life unless he has accepted every chance for living that has been offered to him in his transitory progress through this difficult but dreamful valley of soul-making. We feel ourselves to be alive only at those divided and ecstatic moments when we overwhelmingly become aware of the identity of beauty, truth, and righteousness and thereby undergo an instant flash of cosmic consciousness. It is evermore our purpose to repeat these moments. We desire ardently to prove ourselves to be alive. Many of us follow false allurements, drink or drugs, religion, or the unspontaneous and manufactured fire of simulated love. But if such mortals fail in their pursuit, their failure should be written down to inexperience and not necessarily to conscious abnegation of a floating and far-off ideal. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. And this axiom is so augustly sound that it is nobler to faint and fall in the pursuit of some ignis fatuus of truth or beauty than to slink through all experience reservedly like a cringing cur with tail between the legs. In the experience of the average man, whose acuteness of perception in the intellectual, emotional, or moral sphere is merely ordinary, the actuality of living offers only infrequent and wistful opportunities for life. For this reason he is required to rely on art to present to him those opportunities for life that he has missed. Art extracts the quintessence of life and serves it up freely to millions of men who, because of their own dullness, have not been able to extract it for themselves. Art offers to the average man the only royal road to an appreciation of all the wonders of this valley of soul-making, 
and affords him the only available opportunity to experience the sense of life vicariously. This, then, is the excuse for art and the answer to any theoretic question that seeks to probe its purpose. The aim of art is to provide a sense of life for men who in themselves are not sufficiently alive to create art by their very living. We may come now, as a corollary of this thesis, to consider the proper function of the theatre. The theatre exists, in theory, as an institution which promises to provide the ordinary man with a keen impression of life in exchange for two dollars of money and two hours of time. The theatre promises the public a more instant and intense sensation of the miracle of life than is usually offered in a month of living. The average man has only a few years in which to live in this valley of soul-making, and if he can save a day, a week, or possibly a month by going to the theatre, he is more than willing to follow the allurement of this royal road. But in response to this fidelity, which can only be regarded as idealistic, the theatre incurs and is required to assume the duty of offering to the average man the promised taste of life. There are two ways in which the theatre can furnish to the public a vicarious experience of life. First, by imitation, and second, by suggestion. The first method is employed by the realists, and the second method is employed by the romantics. This is not a time to argue concerning the respective merits of these two contrasted methods. It is sufficient, in the present context, to state that neither method can succeed in practice unless it shall convince the public that the two hours required for the traffic of the stage have been spent more profitably in the theatre than they might have been spent elsewhere. The average spectator, disappointed for the moment by his individual experience of living at large, attends the theatre in the hope of quickening his consciousness of life. He wants the play to happen not so much upon the stage as in himself, he goes to the theatre quite literally to enjoy himself, that is to say, his own contributive response of emotion and of thought. The play must happen to him, or else, by his judgment, the play must be dismissed as a failure. He is seeking an opportunity to live and to feel himself alive, and if this opportunity is not accorded to him, he will warn his friends away from the production that he has attended. For this reason, a realistic play that invites the quick response of recognition for facts that have been faithfully observed must carry out the letter of its contract, and a romantic play, which pretends, without reliance on admitted and accepted facts, to suggest some evident, irrefutable law of nature, must also convince the members of the audience that they have really witnessed vicariously a vision of life itself, as life is generally understood. Nothing in the theatre can ever be successful unless it offers some vicarious experience of life. The best-made play will fail unless it affords some suggestion of life that is more potent than its emphasis on mechanism. The popularity of actresses and actors is measured by the extent of their ability to seem alive. This ability in many cases may result from training and experience, in many other cases, it may result more directly from that inexplicable power which is commonly described as personality. Life is what the public seeks in going to the theater, and the appearance, or else the illusion, of life is what it welcomes and rewards in those who exert themselves behind the footlights. End of chapter 1 Read by Chuck Lavazzi StageLift.org April 2023「Chapter Two of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Personal Greatness on the Stage. Sir Harry Lauder. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote a noble essay on the uses of great men but in this disquisition he neglected to discuss the simplest and the subtlest service that is rendered by great people to the ordinary public he is great said emerson who is what he is from nature and who never reminds us of others and again every one can do his best thing easiest 
but the philosopher omitted the important point that any one who does his best thing easily without reminding us of others seems always more alive than the common herd of humankind great men are more alive than others and this is the token of their greatness furthermore the liveliness to call it so that tingles in them is a central and creative source of energy that radiates an influence electrical through all of the environing ether nothing can be dark that sits unshadowed in the sun and no human being can be dull when he comes into contact with a superman of any personage who does supremely and superbly anything that ordinary people find it difficult to do it may be said in the biblical phrase that a virtue goes out of him because he feels himself to be alive he communicates unconsciously a sense of life to many other people who seemed dead before he walked among them great men can never be mistaken or ignored by their works you shall know them if it be possible to watch them at their work or to study after many years or centuries their easily accomplished products but otherwise it is always possible to recognize them by their very presence something clutches at your throat and squeezes tears into your eyes it is a recorded fact of history that one day when abraham lincoln was gazing out of a window of the white house he turned suddenly to secretary stanton and said there goes a man his eyes had been attracted by a casual pedestrian that he had never seen before this man was walt whitman the greatest american with the single exception of lincoln himself that has ever yet been born the thing to be admired among men is greatness and wherever greatness undeniably exists there is no time to quarrel about minor questions of degree or quality whoever can do any tiny thing however trivial more perfectly than any other person in the world is admitted by this token to the fraternity of greatness nearly twenty years ago it was my privilege to meet a bootblack in detroit whose name i never asked but whose eyes i shall never forget my shoes were very shabby as i mounted his throne for they had not been shined since i had left new york he went to work upon them with a will and when he had finished can they do that better in the east he asked and no i answered that's because i put my soul into it he said this was an italian boy with a face like those that ghirlandaio loved to paint many centuries ago in florence and he will never see this printed paragraph that celebrates his glory but he made me feel alive one little moment nearly twenty years ago and i wish now that i knew his name whatever sits in moonlight is lighted by the moon and silvered into poetry and whoever comes into contact with a super person is tingled for the moment into life the recipient imagination leaps upon the back of pegasus for like calls out to like and a great person unconsciously requires us to greet him sympathetically with a kindred greatness we ascend to something better than our ordinary self when we encounter the greatest maker of poems or of pies that happens to be living in our world these encounters add a cubit to our stature and send us back to our customary tasks eager to labor and eager to be happy the mystic force called personality is nothing but an aura that is worn by people who can do some single thing extremely well and with consummate grace personality is always charming and enlivening and the application of its power is not at all dependent on the exercise of that particular proficiency in which the person who attracts us may excel great people are not called upon to prove their greatness sarah bernhardt at the age of six and seventy can no longer slink about the stage with that agile grace as of a panther that some of us remember in fact because of her amputated leg she cannot walk at all when the curtain rises she is now disclosed reclining on a couch or seated in a chair and only at the climax does she climb to her feet with obvious assistance and thereby send a shudder through the audience but her triumph comes early at the very rising of the curtain before she has made a movement before she has uttered a single syllable with the shattered remnants of a voice that once was golden for the audience immediately knows 
without asking or waiting for any evidence that this is one of the great women of the world there are cheers and there are tears for greatness is rare and demands the sounding of senates and the pouring of libations journeys are measured by milestones and our journey through life is measured by those moments when we have been quickened into momentary greatness by contact with great people to be a great baseball player is more impressive than to be a mediocre painter a second-rate statesman or an ordinary author it is nobler to be able to beat the world at some plebeian task like the sewing on of buttons than to be an inefficient king or a defeated general this the public always knows without asking any questions and nobody is certain or is worthy of applause unless he can do at least some little thing that he was born to do by nature more perfectly than that thing can be done by anybody else but such a person seems to be transfigured by the central and essential source of energy that lives within him and this transfiguration easily includes whoever comes within the circle of its radiation the service of great people to the public may be summed up in the saying that whosoever looks upon or listens to them is always lifted for the moment out of mediocrity and required to ascend to the height of the occasion on the evening of october twenty second nineteen seventeen the lexington opera house which is one of the largest theatres in new york was crowded from the floor to the roof hundreds of people were standing up and hundreds of other people had been turned away this vast audience sat respectfully through a vaudeville program of five preliminary numbers at last the orchestra struck up a medley of familiar scottish airs and there came a quickened sense of something wonderful about to be and then the miracle occurred a little stocky man in a red kilt came trotting on the stage and turned the funniest of faces to the footlights and the whole enormous auditorium exploded with volley after volley of applause and the high shrill shriek of cheers it was a long long time before this thunderous initial roar subsided but when he could be heard the funny little red-faced man proceeded to sing a song with the refrain i'm going to marry Arry on the fifth of january there was no art in the words and very little in the music but there was great art in the rendering the audience shouted with laughter and every laugh came precisely at the predetermined moment with the full power of three thousand pairs of lungs behind it then came other songs and the stocky little man who had made that whole vast theatre full of people laugh as one soon made them weep as one and ultimately made them sing as one his third or fourth number was a new song which nobody had ever heard before but when harry lauder came to the refrain he heard it taken up and hummed by hundreds and hundreds of voices in the auditorium then he paused and with consummate tact he deliberately rehearsed the audience in the proper handling of the chorus so that when he came again to the refrain the very walls resounded with the singing of a thousand happy people these people had come to enjoy the art of harry lauder but the great man had given them a greater gift by teaching them to enjoy themselves through all of this the present writer retained sufficient critical intelligence to perceive the artist's mastery of rhythm and of tempo his marvellous sense of the emphasis of pause and his genius for taking immediate advantage of every unforeseen reaction of the audience he never said or sang a word too little or too much he never overworked a laugh nor allowed a tear to dry and be forgotten but these are minor matters for art however brilliant must take second place to life and it was life itself that harry lauder flung full-fingered through the auditorium when calls for encores came it was harry sing us this and harry sing us that for he was only harry now and hundreds of people were shouting loud the titles of the songs that they desired there were many many calls for we hoose among the heather but harry paused before he rendered it that's nemer a song he said it's a hymn now and he told how he had sung it lately before fifteen thousand scottish troopers at arras 
he sang it again in the lexington theatre but it sounded now as if all scotland had burst spontaneously into song and then the audience began to see the transfiguration of a great artist into a great man for something had happened to the harry lauder that we used to know and it was this death had touched him with its accolade and bidden him rise up as a knight-errant in a stricken world where he now lives the life of two sir harry went down to camp upton to entertain our soldiers he told them of the flowers of france and how they grew in full profusion right up to the line that the huns had marked with desolation he told them of his love for france the second home and foster-mother of all the artists of the world who worship beauty truth and righteousness then he paused and added i own a bit of france now my boy is buried there End of chapter two chapter three of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org scene on the stage by clayton hamilton hero worship in the drama abraham lincoln hero worship as carlyle has told us is a fundamental instinct of the human mind and this is particularly evident whenever people are gathered together in crowds nothing else so strongly stirs emotion in a multitude as the visible presence of a hero whatever be the nature of his prowess line fifth avenue with congregated thousands let general pershing ride adown that human lane on horseback and only the walking dead will be callous to resist that gulping in the throat which is the prelude to enthusiastic tears in the good old days of baseball this phenomenon could often be observed at the polo grounds when christopher mathewson was called upon in the ninth inning to save a game that hung tremulously in the balance it was beautiful to see him as he strolled serenely to the centre of the diamond apparently unconscious of the plaudits of the crowd he was a great man in his own profession and he had the dignity of greatness he excelled all other pitchers and this excellence was testified immediately to the eye by the unusual simplicity and ease of his bodily movements his two arms swept superbly upward in an absolute curve that reminded the spectator of greco-roman statues of athletes in the vatican and that was all he had perfect personal poise he was never nervous never flustered never angry mathewson made himself a hero not merely by his prowess but also by his personality the multitude adored him and by awakening this adoration he bestowed a benefit upon uncounted crowds for nothing more effectually emancipates the average man from his dreary prison cell of self than a wished-for opportunity to worship some big person who does something it does not really matter what it is much better than that same thing could be done by himself or by anybody else the almost tragic need for heroes accounts for the abiding popularity of such otherwise inconsequential games as baseball football and boxing prize-fighting justifies itself when it permits a world of men and boys to worship such a hero as georges carpentier worship in itself uplifts the soul as men are helped by prayer regardless of the god to whom they pray clemenceau old in years assailed by an assassin smashed up in an accident but still the tiger of france does good to his country by merely continuing to be and thus permitting millions to adore him most of us are lowly people and lead lowly lives and in order to carry on we need the spiritual sustenance of lifting our hearts up to the hills whence cometh our strength in view of this fact it is hard to understand why the theatre should persistently neglect its easy opportunity to exhibit figures of heroical dimensions every audience is a crowd and is subject to the incentives of crowd psychology design a set of gothic buildings suggestive of medieval orleans throng the stage with supernumeraries decree an entrance of jean d'arc clad in silvery armor and seated high upon a snow-white horse and the audience will cheer and the most case-hardened of dramatic critics will have a hard time trying to hold back his tears for this is drama 
the drama began in the church an institution which exists for the purpose of stimulating a wished-for mood of worship in a gathered multitude to the end that souls of men may be uplifted toward their ultimate salvation what is the use of fiction if it cannot show us imaginable people who in one way or another are bigger than ourselves the opportunity of the theatre is immense for it may unlock for us the ivory gates that give upon immensity is it after all worth while to pay five dollars for the privilege of seeing the heroine of a bedroom farce dive under a bed when the same expenditure of time and money might procure the great experience of awakening within us that quick response to the heroic which is ever more instinctive in a gathered crowd when the high heart we magnify and the sure vision celebrate and worship greatness passing by ourselves are great because of the obtuseness of our american managers for our managers are more to be blamed than our playwrights for the vacuity of our american drama it remained for an english poet john drinkwater to discover the simple fact that a great emotion could be evoked from the gathered public by exhibiting upon the stage a hero so generally known and so unanimously worshipped as abraham lincoln mr drinkwater has drawn a portrait of lincoln that is faithful to the truth if not at all points to the facts of history that is very nearly all that he has done but it is enough it is better to spend two hours in the imagined presence of one of the greatest heroes of all time than to spend a hundred evenings at the winter garden and this the public knows mr drinkwater's play is so extremely simple that either it is artless or else it is one of those rare works in which the highest sort of art succeeds in concealing itself it exhibits six successive episodes in lincoln's career these episodes are not related logically to each other but each of them shows the hero at some moment when he is required to make a decision that shall determine not only his own future but also the future of his country on past occasions i have sometimes disagreed with the theory of william archer that the element of crisis is the one most indispensable element of the drama but on this particular occasion i am constrained to agree with mr archer because mr drinkwater has undeniably succeeded in setting forth a satisfactory portrait of lincoln by adopting the easy expedient of showing him at six successive turning points in his career at a hasty glance this play might be dismissed as a mere summary in dialogue of the high spots in lord charnwood's biography of lincoln but a closer study of the text reveals the fact that mr drinkwater has written a piece that is surprisingly effective not so much by reason of what he has done as by reason of what he has resisted the temptation to do his drama is singularly beautiful in its reticence and all the more impressive by reason of its shy and quiet dignity it is so deliberately untheatrical that it could hardly have been composed by an author who was not a master of the theatre mr drinkwater does not overstate the case for lincoln instead he understates it and thereby stimulates the audience to erect a huge heroic statue of this man of many sorrows End of chapter three chapter four of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Seen on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton Napoleon on the Stage Napoleon was a master melodramatist. In any situation he saw himself as an actor playing a part, and seldom failed to hit the histrionic note of the occasion. Even his enemies could not deny the popular appeal of his theatricism. When he escaped from Elba and landed in the south of France, he found himself confronted by a company of troops expected to be hostile. He stepped forward, flung back the flap of his overcoat, and cried, Which of you will fire on your general? The troops turned and marched behind him, all the way to Paris. There was nothing else for them to do. Even in his tomb, Napoleon speaks forth with the authentic voice of the greatest stage director of all time. When you enter the Invalide, 
you are prepared for profound emotion by the mystic bluish light that floats down from the dome and broods upon the huge sarcophagus with solemn grandeur this meditative haze is emphasized by the golden glow that gleams about the altar no more masterly stage setting has ever been designed but the climax of emotion comes when you read the great inscription that was written by napoleon himself je désire que mes cendres reposent sur les bords de la seine au milieu de ce peuple français que j'ai tant aimé few there are who can read this sentence without tears it is so triumphant in its trumpet blare of prose napoleon had many faults as a man but none as an actor the present age deplores and deprecates his lust for limitless dominion future periods may refuse to laud him as an emperor or even as a general the world may finally regard him only as a lucky upstart with the arch adventurer of history but the time will never come when any commentator will deny that he was a noble artist by sheer imaginative power he managed to transform himself into a legendary figure which lives in the memory of all mankind with the immortal life shared only by the greatest characters of fiction and the drama he is one with hamlet don quixote and oedipus the king napoleon died in eighteen twenty one which is nearly a century ago since then his image so easy to ape and imitate in makeup has been often represented on the stage but never adequately napoleon is easily the most dramatic and the most theatric figure bequeathed to memory by modern history yet there is no great play about him the reason is that no playwright has arisen in the world since eighteen twenty one whose imagination was sufficiently immense to cope with the unlimited theatrical fertility of napoleon himself unfortunately for the drama the author of coriolanus died so long ago as sixteen sixteen napoleon is not a character to be depicted by pinero or hauptmann or brieux many attempts by secondary playwrights to exhibit napoleon as the hero of a drama have met with swift disaster the reason was in each case that the image in the public mind was bigger before the curtain rose than after it descended it is always futile in a theatre to dissatisfy a high expectancy as emerson remarked to a youthful harvard student who had written an essay in disparagement of the philosophy of plato when you strike at a king you must kill him the danger of attempting to depict napoleon upon the stage and of failing ignominiously in this high endeavor was deftly dodged by so preeminent a dramatist as edmund rostand when he applied himself to the task of composing the napoleonic drama called la glon the great actor coquelin had asked him for an opportunity to play a grumpy grenadier a grand moustache and the part of flambeau was conceived from this suggestion but m rostand soon realized that napoleon if permitted to appear would take the play away from the character designed for coquelin to keep napoleon off stage the author advanced the period to eighteen thirty when the emperor had been dead for nearly a decade and only his weakling son remained as a relic of his majesty but contrary to the author's expectation the dead napoleon still appealed so emphatically to the public through the person of the ineffective little boy whom he had left behind him that the part of the duc de reichstadt took the play away from the part of flambeau and laglon intended as a vehicle for coquelin became instead a vehicle for sarah bernhardt many dramatists have dodged the difficulty of attempting a life-sized portrait of napoleon by introducing him as a subsidiary figure and depicting only a single aspect of his multifarious personality this formula was followed by sardot in madame saint Jean readers who remember the performance of this play by ellen terry and sir henry irving will recall the fact that napoleon was intended only as a minor character in the dramatic pattern but they will also recall the more impressive fact that when irving entered and exhibited his studious depiction of napoleon he ran away with the play as actors call the process and took the stage away without intention from miss terry the only way in which the figure of napoleon has been successfully presented in a theatre is through the medium of the frankly antithetic mood of satire 
an author, lacking eloquence to worship fittingly a monumental character, may manage, through sheer cleverness, to overturn the image and laugh at his own impudent audacity in exhibiting the statue upside down. This procedure was followed by Bernard Shaw in his amusing skit, The Man of Destiny. The part of Napoleon, in this celebrated sketch of Mr. Shaw's, was originally played in this country by Arnold Daly, and Mr. Daly has more recently appeared before the public in another satirical depiction of Napoleon, this time in a play by Herman Barr entitled Josephine. Herman Barr is the second ablest living dramatist of Austria, and he is known already to the theater-going public of New York as the author of The Concert and The Master. In the present episodic composition, Herr Barr has attempted to depict Napoleon from the point of view of his wife. There is a proverb that tells us that no man is a hero to his valet, and it may be stated even more emphatically that no man can ever hope to be a hero to the woman who has seen him brush his teeth and comb his hair. What Colonel Roosevelt once called the heroic mood demands an absolute defense against the impudent intrusion of the sense of humor and this defense can seldom be maintained in the face of an admitted intimacy. In the first act of this play, the heroine is overwearied by the amorous insistence of her recent husband, and, in order to get rid of him and to enjoy an opportunity for flirting with the cooler and less violent Barat, she contrives to have Napoleon directed by Barat to go away and conquer Italy. In the second act, we are told that the angry ardor of Napoleon in attacking the Austrians was inspired by his disappointment at receiving only niggardly and infrequent letters from Josephine. But his conquest of the Austrians raises him to a pinnacle of unexpected power, and this advancement of his destiny ironically overturns the tables of his domestic situation. Josephine henceforth besieges him for evidences of affection and he finds himself too busy to pay attention to her. The third act of this desultory chronicle contains a passage that is thoroughly delectable. Napoleon is about to be proclaimed and crowned as emperor, and he realizes at this tardy moment that, having begun life as a Corsican adventurer, he stands in need of lessons in imperial deportment. He sends, therefore, for the great actor Talma, who has been famous for depicting Roman emperors upon the stage for many years. Talma understands the art of seeming every inch a king, and Napoleon asks Talma to rehearse him in the unexpected part that he is called upon by destiny to play. Talma studies the physical peculiarities and limitations of Napoleon, and, after considerable thought, invents for him the legendary pose, with the right hand thrust into the left side of the waistcoat and the left arm hurled behind the body. Talma also teaches him the way to walk and the proper way to hold his head. It is needless to remark that this entire passage is deliciously satirical. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Seeing on the Stage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Seeing on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Acting and Impersonation, George Arliss. In a recent Sunday issue of the New York Times, Mr. John Corbin published an interesting essay on acting and impersonation. He pointed out the fact that the ablest impersonators seldom make good actors, and that great actors seldom make more than passable impersonators. The reason for this fact is very simple. Imitation is the method of impersonation, but the method of acting is suggestion. Acting is an art, and the important thing about it is that essential something which the actor has to say, through the medium of all his stage disguises. Acting like any other work of art, can be no greater nor less great than the man who makes it. Its purpose is to stimulate the imagination of the spectator into a quickened consciousness of life. The actor's subject matter is himself, and, in a high sense, it is his duty always to act himself, regardless of the makeup and the costume that he may be wearing in his part. 
if he is a great man it is to be assumed that he contains multitudes as whitman said or in other words that he is really many men consequently he can play himself in a score of different roles without incurring any danger of monotony thus richard mansfield was greater than any of his parts his performances of different characters were very different and he was noted for his range and versatility yet he was always richard mansfield and it was mainly for this latter reason that the public always went to see him the impersonator on the other hand confesses that he finds no subject matter in himself and asks for admiration of the trappings and the suits of his disguises his stock in trade is a special talent for exactness of imitation and whenever imitation is exact there is no art c'est imiter quelqu'un qui plante des choux said alfred de musset or as mr austin dobson has translated it in the refrain of the best of his ballades the man who plants cabbages imitates too an almost uncanny instance of exactness and imitation was afforded by the late benjamin chapin's impersonation of lincoln which was exhibited on the lecture platform on the legitimate stage and later on in moving pictures mr chapin was endowed by nature with a striking physical resemblance to the martyred president his figure was almost precisely a replica of lincoln's and his face could easily be changed to lincoln's by a very simple make-up furthermore mr chapin made a lifelong study of the character and personality of the hero whose aspect was all but repeated in his own and by virtue of this study he was able to depict the mutable expressions of lincoln's living countenance yet mr chapin did not even claim to be an actor and so far as the present writer is informed he never appeared before the public in any other part sissy loftus despite the exceeding cleverness of her imitations never achieved a notable success as an actress in the legitimate drama in fact there is a legend in the theatre which may or may not be true that once when she was being rehearsed by the late augustin daly in the part of one of shakespeare's heroines mr daly suddenly stopped the rehearsal and said my dear miss loftus won't you please imagine the performance of some actress in this part and then give us an imitation of her elsie janice can imitate bernhardt and ethel barrymore but she cannot act like either of them even so supreme an impersonator as albert chevalier a man without a peer in his own profession looked like an ordinary stock comedian when he acted a part in a regular play on the other hand so distinguished an actor as john drew appears in part after part without changing his mask or altering the cut and quality of his clothes and yet contrives by sheer suggestion to create many living characterizations mr drew is always mr drew yet the people that he plays are by no means the same people and even an admiring public does not always recognize the exercise of art required in order that mr drew may seem so easily himself in all his different parts the distinction made by mr corbin should constantly be borne in mind in judging performances upon the stage it explains for instance the reason for the fact that so many minor actors who make emphatic hits in what are called character parts never succeed in climbing up to the rank of leading players it also explains the fact that a great artist like yvette gilbert can stand up in a corner of a room without scenery without makeup without stage costume without any trick of lighting and suggest by sheer imaginative means the very presence of any kind of woman young or old whoever lived in france she does not have to smudge her face with coal in order to impersonate a scullery maid nor to wear a crown in order to impersonate a queen i once saw richard mansfield who was wearing a dinner jacket at the time change from dr jekyll to mr hyde in a chair of his own library not more than half a dozen feet away from me he had been asserting that the method of the true actor was to appeal to the imagination and he performed this tour de force in order to convince me that he did not need the adventitious aid of lights and makeup, but could force me to imagine that I saw what he wanted me to see. But, though Mr. Corbin's distinction is fundamentally sound, it must not be assumed that the art of acting and the craft of impersonation are never united in the same performance. A few great actors have also been remarkable impersonators and have managed to combine the two methods of imitation and suggestion without any detriment to either 
the most remarkable instance of this combination which has come within the range of the present writer's observation was the dual equipment of sir henry irving irving was first and foremost a great actor and that is only another way of saying that he was always henry irving the personal aura of his keen imagination informed in aristotle's sense every one of his creations yet irving was also an astonishing impersonator anybody who has seen his charles i his napoleon his dante will remember how absolutely different they looked from each other and from irving himself irving was actually a tallish slender man but any one who saw him only as napoleon would have sworn that he was short and stout the stoutness of course was easy to manage but how did the actor cut a cubit from his stature as napoleon he trotted rapidly around with quick and nimble feet and his gestures were hinged from the elbow and the wrist as charles stuart his stride was long and slow majestic and a little languorous and his gestures were hinged from the shoulder the face of irving's charles was copied from the numerous great portraits by van dyck and the head of his dante was modeled from the bronze bust at naples but the craft of the impersonation did not end with this irving's dante as he walked leaned forward and held his left shoulder a little higher than the other these details of course were called from the description by boccaccio who saw the divine poet with his own eyes when he himself was an observing little boy of nine since the death of sir henry irving no other celebrated actor has also exhibited such clever achievements in impersonation as mr george arliss at the present time mr arliss is perhaps most noted for his impersonation of disraeli but he had already asserted his eminence in the finer art of acting long before he first put on the make-up of lord beaconsfield mr arliss first came to this country in nineteen o one with mrs patrick campbell and made a keen impression with his performances of cayley drummel in the second mrs tanqueray and the duke of st alfred's in the notorious mrs ebsmith he was equally at home in both parts although the former had been created by mr cyril maud and the latter by so different an actor as sir john hare for some years after this mr arliss appeared in a series of eccentric characters in which the note of comedy was usually paramount he was then persuaded by mr david belasco to appear in several sinister and malevolent roles such as that of the cynical hero of the devil and that of the murderous prime minister in the darling of the gods since mr arliss in these various disguises contrived always to be somehow mr arliss we could have no surer proof that he is a gifted actor for off the stage he is neither cynical nor eccentric he is a man of keen intelligence a scholar and a gentleman and in the habit of his mind he is always simple straightforward and direct he knows the art of acting not only subconsciously but also consciously with an intelligence that is not only creative but critical as well he is one of the few actors i have ever known who have been able and willing to explain how bad they were in performances for which they have been highly praised when mr arliss was appearing as judge brack with mrs fisk in had a gobbler he told me that his performance was all wrong despite the fact that it had been greeted with golden encomiums from every critic in new york brack ought to shake things when he comes into a room mr arliss explained to me i can't do that i am too slight and delicate i have therefore been obliged to murder ibsen's character and substitute a totally different fabrication anybody who does not see this does not understand the play mr arliss's disraeli was a masterly impersonation but and this is the important point that the writer has been trying to lead up to his alexander hamilton was scarcely an impersonation at all it was that far finer thing a bit of imaginative acting mr arliss with the assistance of a very simple make-up actually looked like disraeli he did not look like hamilton and he did not try to do so he attempted instead to make his spectators imagine that he looked like hamilton mr arliss has neither the face nor the figure depicted in the trumbull portrait and he is actually twenty years older than hamilton was at the period of the play yet the dominating note of this imaginative exhibition was the note of almost boyish youthfulness and there was never a suggestion of the sinister or the eccentric 
this impersonator of many character parts succeeded even more emphatically in acting a straight part he recreated on the stage a great and ingratiating person who is honored in history as one of nature's noblemen and he made this person every inch a hero end of chapter five read by andrea kotzer chapter six of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org scene on the stage by clayton hamilton john barrymore in richard the third the development of john barrymore as a serious actor has been both gradual and thorough he is at the moment of the present writing nineteen twenty thirty-eight years old his rise has been so rapid in the last four years that his recent triumph in richard the third might be regarded as a sudden flash by the sort of people who think that genius is a miracle and do not know that it is neither more nor less than a tireless capacity for taking pains but intimate observers of the work of mr barrymore will regard his richard rather as the logical result of long and careful years of preparation his career is still in its ascendancy fine as his acting is to-day there is every reason to believe that it will be finer in the years to come ten years from now unless all indications fail he should be established as one of the greatest actors in the history of our american theatre john barrymore started out with many obvious advantages he was born of an illustrious family and absorbed in childhood the best traditions of the american theatre he displayed at an early age an unusual talent for drawing and began his work in life as a newspaper cartoonist he did not go upon the stage until nineteen o three when he was twenty-one years old seven years later than the first appearance of his sister ethel there were plenty of people to teach him how to act but he once told me that he had learned more from willie collier than from any other actor he was for several years a member of mr collier's company and he was trained assiduously throughout the decade of his twenties to be a light comedian not even his best friends foresaw that he would some day develop into a tragic actor the slightness of his figure and the shortness of his stature seemed to preclude him from undertaking heroic or impressive parts his voice though pleasing was thin in quality narrow in range and monotonous in tone and those who watched him closely could see that he was restricted by a paucity of gestures his main assets were his handsome presence his exceedingly sensitive and mobile face and his charming personality it was a whimsical personality showing always an underlying glow of almost wistful poetry and irradiated every now and then with sudden flashes of brilliant wit with ten or a dozen years of experience john barrymore grew to be a skilled farceur and one of the most entertaining performers on our stage he became very popular and like many other matinee idols could always be counted on to draw the women in large numbers to the theatre at the outset of his thirties he had won both fame and fortune most actors in such a situation would have been contented with a fixed achievement and would have continued season after season to play the same sort of popular parts in the same sort of popular farces but john barrymore was not contented with what he had done he wanted to do something different and something better he tried his hand at melodrama in kick in a crook play of no particular account 
and showed for the first time that he could be not only amusing on the stage but thrilling as well there were flashes of almost tragical intensity in his rendering of this vulgar but exciting melodrama he was besieged at that time by many authors who wished him to make money for them by appearing in their farces but he decided in his own mind that he would not act any more farces for a while an opportunity for more serious effort was afforded to mr barrymore when john d williams offered him the part of falder in john galsworthy's justice this was in the early spring of nineteen sixteen those who were most intimate with john barrymore at the time will remember how earnestly he grasped this opportunity he went into training for the part precisely as an athlete goes into training for a prize fight or a race till then he had always seemed to take his work in a careless and easy-going manner but there was nothing careless about his preparation for the part of falder he was and is one of the most modest actors i have ever known one of his strongest assets as an artist is the fact that he is always keenly conscious of his own limitations he may have fooled the public now and then but he has never fooled himself and in nineteen sixteen he did not feel at all certain that he was capable of creating the sort of character that mr galsworthy intended now that the event may be viewed in retrospect i may perhaps be pardoned for narrating a little incident which i knew about at the time but which has never yet escaped into print a day or two before justice opened at the cohan and harris theatre then called the candler theatre john barrymore happened to approach the front of the house and saw his own name displayed in very large letters on the billboards while the name of the author was extremely inconspicuous he went into the managerial office and said if anybody wants to see this play it is not because john barrymore is acting in it but because john galsworthy wrote it take my name off the billboards and print the name of the author in large letters otherwise i shan't be here on monday night he meant what he said and the change was made the play achieved an unexpected success and mr barrymore astonished the public and the critics by the high sincerity and artistic self-effacement revealed by his enactment of the role of falder at this time mr barrymore owed much to the sterling influence of one of his best friends the gifted author edward sheldon i believe that it was mr sheldon who persuaded him to resist all offers to return to farce and to undertake the title role in the late john raphael's dramatization of george de marier's immortal story peter ibbotson a play that had been refused by many managers because they knew that there was no money in it this project appealed particularly to john barrymore because the part of colonel ibbotson would afford an opportunity for the return of his brother lionel to the metropolitan stage after a long and regretted absence the piece was produced by constance collier and the barrymore brothers it achieved not only an artistic but also a commercial success and john barrymore surprised his friends by the exquisite poetry of his performance by this time john barrymore had become a popular star in moving pictures and unlimited money was offered to him if he would devote his entire time to the movies i don't think that i am indiscreetly revealing a secret when i print the fact that mr barrymore is not particularly interested in acting for the screen but he has adopted a habit of devoting several weeks each summer to moving picture work with the frank intention of gathering in enough money to guarantee his undertakings in the theatre throughout the subsequent season mr barrymore and author hopkins were first attracted to each other by a common desire to produce 
the living corpse by count leo tolstoy and when this project was in contemplation mr barrymore returned to the movies for a while to earn sufficient money to ensure the production i mention this fact merely to illustrate the point that mr barrymore cares little about money for its own sake but cares about it very practically as capital that may be employed for the propagation of art the living corpse re-entitled redemption got off to a bad start in the midst of an epidemic of influenza but the business grew and grew until this somber drama was established as one of the big successes of the season of 1918 to 1919. Nevertheless, the money-making run of redemption was interrupted in mid-career in order to clear the stage for production of The Just of Sam Benelli. Several months before this event, John Barrymore told me that he was not confident that there was any money in Le Sene delle Beffe. But I want to do this Italian play, he said, because it will afford an opportunity for my brother and myself to appear once more together in the same cast on Broadway. Lionel's part is showier than mine. He ought to make a big hit. That's the main thing that I care about. Lionel Barrymore, as everybody knows, fulfilled the confident prediction of his brother. But John's performance was the more difficult and the more delicate of the two. This poetic melodrama achieved an astonishing success. The English version was prepared in verse by Edward Sheldon, and this occasion afforded to John Barrymore his first opportunity to read verse upon the stage. Already this ambitious actor had cast his eye on Shakespeare. He was keenly conscious of the handicap imposed upon him by the fact that he had had no training whatsoever in the reading of verse or in the playing of Shakespearean parts. He was conscious also of the limitations of his slight physique and his restricted voice. He was conscious of his lack of scholarship and began to study earnestly. He read Shakespeare and discussed his text with noted scholars. He placed himself in the hands of a vocal expert and devoted many weeks of practice to the gradual development of deep and rich and rounded tones in a voice that theretofore had been defective. He dedicated all his energies to this new task with his customary modesty. He knew very clearly what he did not know and tried very hard to learn. I believe that is now no secret that Hamlet was the one part in Shakespeare that most attracted him. But, unlike most other actors, he was not at all sure that he was ready to play Hamlet. He saw the great Hamlet of Walter Hampton several times, admired it, and praised it, and studied it. Then he began to consult his friend about the role of Romeo. I remember well the conflict between difficulty and enthusiasm which took place within his mind in the spring of 1919 while he was considering this part. Ultimately, he decided, very sagely, to make his first Shakespearean appearance in the role of Richard III, a very showy part that is comparatively easy to depict. His rendition of the character is almost astonishingly fine, but to me it is, perhaps, most interesting in its subtle revelation of the actor's unbefuddled consciousness of his own restrictions and limitations at the present stage of his development. The cheers of the assembled audiences, the flow of money to the box office, the extravagant laudations of the critics, have not persuaded Mr. Barrymore to believe that he is already a great actor. But he is destined to be a great actor, one of the greatest actors of our American theater. Of that I am confident, because I understand so clearly that he is willing and eager to learn what he has still to learn. 
success will not stop him because he is endowed with the rare virtue of modesty and the rarer capacity for taking infinite pains it is no longer a sacrilege to say that richard the third is not a great drama although it is signed with the famous name of william shakespeare it is in fact one of the most ragged of the many chronicle histories that were hastily thrown together in the elizabethan period and is not at all comparable as a work of art with such more careful products as the edward the second of christopher marlowe or the perkin warbeck of john ford yet this piece has been kept alive in the theatre for more than three centuries by the lucky fact that its central figure offers a very showy and comparatively easy part that many generations of aspiring actors are ambitious to portray richard the third though not printed till fifteen ninety seven was probably written not later than fifteen ninety three we know with certainty that marlowe collaborated with shakespeare in preparing for the stage the three parts of the chronicle history of henry the sixth and there are many items of internal evidence to indicate that marlowe collaborated also in the concoction of richard the third this would date the drama before the tragic death of marlowe who was born in fifteen sixty four and was murdered at the early age of twenty nine william shakespeare was two months younger than his colleague in those earliest days of the elizabethan drama marlowe was undeniably the greater man of the two it was this atheistic flame-haired poet who first discovered the new idea that god and the devil do not dwell afar in heaven or hell but reside within the soul of man kit marlowe imagined a new theme for tragedy the exhibition of a big man ruined from within by the defects of his own character ambition was the flaunting flag of marlowe and ambition was the subject that he analyzed from one point of view or another in all his tragedies his tamburlaine crashed downward to disaster because of an insatiable lust for illimitable conquest his dr faustus was destroyed by an insatiable lust for illimitable knowledge his jew of malta was ruined by an insatiable lust for illimitable wealth in the chronicle history of richard the third this basic theme appears once more the hero is ultimately shattered by an insatiable lust for illimitable power the text also is replete with passages that resound with the martial march of marlowe's mighty line shakespeare may have been the main author of richard the third but the point to be emphasized is that this was a very early play concocted in the fever of their youth by a couple of hasty and careless and tremendous poets the chronicle histories of the elizabethan playwrights were produced continuously one after another like those puppet plays of the neapolitans that relate the legends of carlo mangio and take up the story every night where they left it off the night before the points at which an elizabethan drama of this type began and ended were therefore arbitrary and almost accidental the figure of the bunch-backed duke of gloucester appeared as a matter of course in the later scenes of the chronicle history of henry the sixth before a subsequent play was devoted to the record of his own reign Collie Kibber, therefore, exercised a thoroughly legitimate prerogative when he decided to begin his depiction of the character of Richard III by presenting a couple of scenes culled from the antecedent chronicle history of Henry VI. Kibber made his acting version of Richard III in a period when the name of Shakespeare was not so awe-inspiring as it subsequently grew to be he did not hesitate to rewrite the latter passages of the play it was kibber for example who first introduced the famous line chop off his head so much for buckingham or 
off with his head, so much for Buckingham. For both versions are still extant, but this line was cleverly compounded out of scattered phrases that are discoverable in different places in the text of Shakespeare. Ever since the reign of Queen Anne, Colley Kibber's text of Richard III has held the stage in preference to the earlier text of Shakespeare and Marlowe, and there seems to be no reason to regret this fact. The present version has been prepared by an anonymous author, but it is possible, without violating confidences, to suspect the hand of Edward Sheldon. Until the time of Richard Mansfield, the hero of this melodrama had always been acted as a man of the same age from the outset to the termination of the play. The fact, of course, is evident that Shakespeare knew little and cared less about chronology, and there was no necessary reason why an actor should pay attention to the circumstance that the events narrated telescopically in this careless chronicle had, in actuality, been scattered through a period of not less than fourteen years. But Mansfield conceived the fresh idea of growing up and growing older as the play progressed, and this idea had been accentuated even more in the most recent version. The play begins with a rendition of the very first scene in the very first act of the third part of the chronicle history of Henry the Sixth, and this new arrangement of the text affords to Mr. Barrymore an opportunity to make his first appearance as a callow fledgling before his subsequent ambitious purpose had been formulated in his scheming mind. Mr. Barrymore's rendition of the role of Richard is, as I have said already, astonishingly admirable. To the surprise of many of his friends, he reads Elizabethan verse with a justness of ear that is all but impeccable. His one fault in the delivery of the lines is the evident fact that he is still restricted to a single tempo. His voice has been deepened, richened, and matured by the careful tutelage to which he has subjected it. His enunciation is meticulously precise. But the fact is still apparent to a careful listener that he does not yet trust himself to read rapidly in scenes where haste is insistently demanded. Richard III is a headlong, hurrying, and hurly-burly sort of melodrama, and Mr. Barrymore calls undue attention to its manifest defects as a dramatic composition when he plays it with extreme deliberation. Mr. Barrymore's greatest asset as an actor is the mobility of his sensitive and beautiful face, and his facial play in the depiction of this part is wonderful to look upon. As a self-examining artist, Mr. Barrymore is clever enough to know that his face is more effective than his voice. In consequence, he has concentrated his attention on a physiological analysis of the successive moods of Richard, and his performance of the part is mainly mental. Oddly enough, he has missed the point, which seems to me apparent, that Richard of Gloucester was not only agile in mind, but also agile in body. Despite his physical deformities, this bunchbacked king was undeniably an athlete. Richard Mansfield skipped and pranced throughout the early scenes, and fought his way through the final battle with a dauntless physical agility. But Mr. Barrymore plays the entire part as quietly and carefully as if he were depicting a mainly meditative character like Hamlet. It is apparent to a careful eye that Mr. Barrymore still suffers from a paucity of free and easy gestures and that he is just as cleverly aware of this present limitation as he is keenly conscious of his present inability to read verse rapidly. His performance, from the outset to the end, is interesting and absorbing, yet at many moments a friendly observer was moved to wonder why it should fall short 
with such sudden and unexpected emphasis of the well-remembered performance of richard mansfield it is rather garrulous to rake up the past but i remember now that mansfield told me more than once in the glowing hours after midnight that his rendition of richard the third was the finest that had ever been shown upon the stage or that ever would be shown he did not argue he merely asserted and explained the fellows who come after me he said will miss my point that richard was a romping athlete in his youth and then subsequently lost his guts when he was stabbed successively by the many terrors accumulated in the region of his large ambitious mind comparisons are inevitable and it is obvious of course that mansfield was endowed with a better equipment for this particular part than mr barrymore though just as short in stature as mr barrymore mansfield was much more mighty in physique and immeasurably more powerful in voice in mr barrymore's performance the famous dream scene is comparatively ineffective this actor can do nothing to approach that tremendous effect of mansfield's when he falteringly touched the armor of the entering radcliffe and let out a blood-curdling yell when he discovered that this emissary was not a ghost mansfield also easily excelled mr barrymore in resiliency and variety except in the single detail of facial expression but there is one moment at least where mr barrymore surpasses his great predecessor this is at the close of that sardonic scene in which richard is offered the crown mansfield at that moment employed the traditional business with elaborations of his own he pretended to read his prayer book sedulously until the delegation of citizens had left the stage watching their exit with the tail of his eye he subsequently looked back at his breviary and discovered that he had been holding it upside down he turned it about with a sarcastic smile then he closed the scene by flinging the prayer book triumphantly over his shoulder mr barrymore has cancelled this traditional and undeniably effective bit of business and has substituted something better left alone on the stage he slowly draws himself up to a kingly stature by standing on his toes while his right hand trembles up in a triumphant gesture as if it grasped already an imaginary sceptre in the difficult scene of the wooing of lady anne mr barrymore is very interesting to watch because of the sly and subtle handling of his face and of his voice but in my opinion his performance of this passage is far inferior to mansfield's because mr barrymore plays the entire scene flat-footed his mental agility is marvellous but he shows no physical agility at all his steps and gestures reveal a sense of stricture that is still to be regretted and his work is further handicapped by the fact that lady anne who ought of course to run away from him and to lead him a chase around the dumb accusatory body of the murdered king stands anchored in one spot upon a large and empty stage as if her fleeing feet had been caught in a rabbit trap the evident defects of mr barrymore's astonishingly fine performance are emphasized from the outset to the end by the faulty stage direction of the play in every scene every actor with the single exception of mr barrymore has apparently been ordered to stand still upon a predetermined spot and never under any circumstances to use his arms for the purpose of natural gesticulation the resultant effect is manifestly artificial the whole production looks very much like a revelation of the imaginative adventures of mr barrymore among a group of wax figures bought at auction from the eden musee the supporting company appears to be so very bad that a charitable critic is moved to wonder 
whether those same actors might not have managed to acquit themselves with better credit if their natural efforts to act had not been paralyzed by the apparent tyranny of an inhibitory stage director there is of course a time-tested formula of practice which assures us that all eyes will be focused on the star of the performance if no other actor is allowed to move a muscle while the star is active on the stage but john barrymore is already an artist of such excellence that he does not need at all to resort to this mechanical method of focusing attention on himself i have always known him personally to be a very modest man and i cannot believe that he has consciously resorted to this silly subterfuge for apparently exalting himself above his fellow actors i am inclined therefore to assign the blame for the faulty stage direction of this play to arthur hopkins who has been willing to assume upon the printed programme his due share of responsibility for an undertaking that is emphatically inartistic mr hopkins has long nurtured a theory that stage direction should be simple it is easy enough to simplify the art of acting if all save one of his performers are forbidden to move their legs or arms but the sort of simplicity which denies a natural expression of the spontaneous impulsions of life itself is not a thing to be desired but though the stage direction of richard the third is manifestly bad the collaborative contribution of the art director robert edmund jones is worthy of unstinted praise in true elizabethan fashion he has erected a single and permanent set which may be altered in a few seconds to suit the momentary exigencies of the ever-changing narrative his successive designs are simple in conception effective in composition and harmonic in color and he has handled in a masterly manner the contributory element of stage illumination End of chapter 6, read by Bookbard. Chapter 7 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. The Permanence of Craftsmanship. Henry Bernstein whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well and this is the only answer that is necessary to critics who question the importance of technical accomplishment in art in that decadent period which suddenly ceased to be in august nineteen fourteen a hare-brained handful of young anarchs in all the nations that had gone to seed asserted very noisily that art was merely a matter of impulse and was not dependent upon craftsmanship the first duty of the painter we were told was not to learn to paint the first duty of the writer was not to learn to write the first duty of the musical composer was not to learn the laws of harmony and counterpoint the cubists the futurists the imagists the vorticists one can't remember any longer the interminable list of ists proclaimed that crudity was a proof of genius and that the aim of art was to be emphatically inartistic this disease attacked the drama and the heresy was held that the one thing that a playwright should avoid was any effort or ambition to produce a well-made play the very phrase a well-made play was bandied about by anarchistic critics as if it were a badge of scorn we were asked to admire the madras house of mr granville barker the most appallingly unpopular play that has been produced in london within the memory of living men for the reason that it was inchoate and helter-skelter like a london suburb instead of planned and patterned like that lantern of the world the high acropolis even mr bernard shaw who had made great plays and made them well consider candida for instance caught the fever and allowed himself in getting married and in misalliance to make two plays as badly as he could in order to prove himself a genius 
the criticism of that now forgotten period was marked by a jaunty impudence towards any craftsman who had ever taken pains to learn his craft stevenson was sneered at because of his picked and polished prose raphael was ridiculed because he knew how to draw tennyson was insulted because of his unfaltering and faultless eloquence pinero was padded scornfully upon the head because he had happened to be the ablest living master of his craft it was assumed that if a man had taken time and pains to learn to say things well he could not possibly have anything to say our respect for the traditions of the past was airily dismissed as mid-victorian it was considered merely scholarly and dull for any person to remember the almost religious reverence of such a master craftsman as velasquez for the very tools of his trade poor velasquez he had never learned to paint carelessly and badly he was therefore not a genius after all that anarchistic period is past the world is done with mental drunkenness and with the lassitude that comes of over-leisure the change came when the earth was rocked with war and nothing any more was heard except the clarion that called to battle the army of unalterable law reims was bombarded venice was endangered and men who loved both reims and venice learned to die for those ideals that erring little creatures used to laugh at a little such a little while ago the rasping and discordant ezra pounds have ceased from troubling for the rupert brooks and alan seegers have gone smilingly to keats and sit with him serenely in that region where beauty is truth truth beauty and there is never any question of the axiom thoughts fade and die ideas are transitory opinions pass like little ripples on the surface of an utterly immeasurable sea even the seeming certainties of science crumble and decay like rocks beneath the beating of repeated rain what survives let mr austin dobson answer with these lines all passes art alone enduring stays to us the bust outlasts the throne the coin tiberius only the bust must be beautiful and the coin must be cunningly designed for in the league-long history of art there is no antidote against the opium of time except that workmanship which is won only by good and faithful servants much has been said about the message of the artist but to any great artist his material seems less important than his method thoughts opinions and ideas may be controverted within that winking of an eye that mortals call a century but time itself can cast no dust upon a piece of work that has been done supremely well the world no longer seriously ponders the abstract contributions made to philosophic thought by thomas de quincey but such a pattern of alliteration as sweet funeral bells from some incalculable distance wailing over the dead that die before the dawn will never be forgotten so long as living men have ears to hear this man knew how to write that is his epitaph and it is also the token of his immortality world-conquering religions after centuries dissolve themselves into discarded myths but eloquence lives on artistry or to call it by that other and more ugly name technique is not a matter to be laughed at after all for technique is the sole preservative of art against corruption and decay in la levation that clever craftsman m henry bernstein has endeavored to express that exaltation of the spirit which was suddenly and unaccountably required from more than forty million souls in france by the onslaught of the hun against the gate this is a theme that preferably should have been discussed by a playwright more endowed by nature to ascend with soaring wings to the height of the occasion for m bernstein despite his admirable ingenuity is not by any means a poet Lelevation, 
because of its material, is the most appealing of his plays. It is impressive, also, by virtue of the fact that it is less mechanical in method and more augustly simple than the intricately clever compositions that have made this author famous in the past. But there still remains a hint of calculation behind its moods of spirituality, and, though it is a noble work, one feels at times a disappointing wish that it had been written by a nobler man. In other words, the critical observer is not entirely convinced that M. Bernstein was the proper and inevitable person to write this epopee of France. The play begins by setting forth the old conventional triangulation of husband, wife, and lover. The only novel circumstance is that this first act is dated in August of 1914. The lover is immediately called to the colors. The wife, when questioned by her husband, refuses to kill time by telling lies, and the husband, though deeply wounded by her guilt, suggests a sort of moratorium of the emotions until assaulted France is saved and humanity has reachieved the leisure to be human once again. The second and third acts reveal an almost miraculous transfiguration of each of the three figures involved in this conventional entanglement, because of the redeeming sense, which has come to each of them in turn, that nothing really matters except France. The injured husband grows too generous to blast the reputation of his rival by the easy means of showing many damnatory letters written by that unreliable and faithless lover in the careless days before the war. The erring wife accepts a martyrdom of social obloquy in order to sit by the bedside of her wounded lover, where all the world may see her, and the lover, who formerly was nothing more than a cynical and sinful rambler of the boulevards, dies like a hero for the sake of an ideal that he had never understood until he had been called upon to bleed and suffer for it. Each of these three people have been ennobled by an overwhelming need to sacrifice the element of self for the sake of humanity at large. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Scene on the Stage – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton The Laziness of Bernard Shaw About a dozen years ago, Mr. Bernard Shaw appears to have decided that there was such a thing as being too proud to write. Like many other men of slow beginnings who have suddenly achieved a huge success, he turned lazy at the very height of his career, and ceased to take his own profession seriously. Mr. Shaw had waited long for recognition. Then, suddenly, by reason of the enterprise of Mr. Arnold Daly in this country and Mr. Granville Barker in England, he flashed forth unexpectedly as one of the most successful of contemporary dramatists. His success had been earned honestly by hard study and long practice, to quote a phrase made almost classical by the ablest of all living dramaturgic craftsmen, Sir Arthur Pinero. But this success had been so long deferred, and was ultimately launched so swiftly, that, temporarily at least, it turned the head of Mr. Shaw. The author of such well-made plays as Arms and the Man and Candida and You Never Can Tell and Man and Superman decided, at the age of nearly fifty, that it was no longer necessary for him to undergo the manifest discomfort of making plays as well as he knew how to make them. He assumed that the critics would praise and the public would applaud anything that he might subsequently sign, whether it might happen to be good or happen to be bad betrayed by this assumption he relaxed into a period in which he allowed himself the lazy luxury of writing down whatever chanced to occur to him without forethought without selection and without arrangement and adopted the audacious practice of calling the resultant mess a play for this impudence mr shaw was promptly rebuked in london by the total failure of getting married and misalliance and he found himself so much discredited that in order to recapture the good graces of the public he was forced to write a carefully constructed comedy and to launch it in nineteen eleven without his name upon the programme 
fanny's first play succeeded because of its inherent merits before the london public had discovered that mr shaw had written it in new york both getting married and miss alliance have fared better than in london our public is less exacting than the public of the older capital and we are more inclined toward the naive assumption that anything that is signed with a big name must be a big work we americans are fond of bowing down to celebrated names in illustration of this point it is necessary only to call attention to the covers of our current magazines no other dramatist than mr shaw would have been permitted to state the matter in a vivid phrase of current slang to get away with the lazy last act of the doctor's dilemma or the feeble and faltering construction of pygmalion as for getting married and misalliance their utter formlessness was actuated by the fact that they were easy to write the author of a play so nearly great as candida must have known as well as any other playwright or dramatic critic that these incoherent and protracted conversations were lacking in all of the essential merits of dramaturgic composition he deliberately set them forth and to quote another phrase of current slang attempted cunningly to put them over because at the moment he despised the public that applauded him in this procedure there is discernible what may be called an intimation of immorality one of the highest and holiest of proverbs is the one which tells us that noblesse oblige if the true artist may claim in any way to be superior to common men it is only because his mental code calls for a stricter obedience to the dictates of a more exacting conscience it is a point of morality for the true artist never to sign his name to any bit of work however humble in intention that he knows to be unworthy of the talents with which he finds himself endowed an artist may be forgiven for a failing of his powers that may be caused by illness temporary perturbation senility or any of a multitude of other causes that are clearly beyond his own control but an artist should never be forgiven who in the undisrupted plentitude of his ability does work which he knows to be unworthy for the simple reason that he deems it no longer necessary to exert himself in order to succeed of all artistic tasks there is none more difficult than the architectonic task of building a play but of all literary exercises there is none more easy than to pen an endless stream of incoherent dialogue for mr shaw the task of writing dialogue is even exceptionally easy because he has a special gift for witty conversation the dialogue of his indolent and sloppy pieces is fully as amusing as that of his other and earlier plays which are worthy of respect because of the dignity of their construction but the pity of it is that a man who had been capable of building candida should cease to be a master builder or indeed a builder at all and that this infidelity to a high vocation should be motivated by both laziness and insincerity noblesse oblige and mr shaw should have set a more inspiring example for younger playwrights who in later years may be tempted also by some sudden showering of wealth and fame to deride the very public that has treated them with courtesy and kindness as a propagandist mr shaw is never insincere he believes his own opinions even at those many moments when they happen to be wrong but as an artist he is often insincere and on this point it is easy to convict him out of his own mouth consider for example the impudent announcement which he printed as a prefatory note to getting married there is a point of some technical interest to be noted in this play the customary division into acts and scenes has been disused and a return made to unity of time and place as observed in the ancient greek drama i find in practice that the greek form is inevitable when drama reaches a certain point in poetic and intellectual elevation this statement as applied to giddy married is not true and what is more important mr shaw knows as well as any other critic that it is not true getting married is not greek in form and it never reaches a point of either poetic or intellectual elevation it is nothing but a witty conversation without beginning without middle 
without end devoid of plot devoid of climax devoid of all those other virtues of technique that were codified and analyzed by aristotle the greeks were mighty architects of plays and getting married no more resembles oedipus the king in structure than a diamond necklace resembles the parthenon mr shaw is an educated man he must have studied at some time or other the electra of sophocles the trojan woman of euripides and the poetics of aristotle he cannot honestly plead ignorance of the principles and practice of the most strictly architectonic drama that the world has ever known and when he says that getting married is classical in form he is talking with his tongue in his cheek not even mr shaw can make a bad play look like a good play by writing a criticism of it which he knows to be a lie miss alliance which immediately failed in london when it was first produced in nineteen ten is the poorest play that mr shaw has ever written like getting married it is merely a continuous but incoherent conversation that lasts for two hours and a half in the earlier composition most of the talk was centred on the topic which gave the piece its title but in miss alliance the ventriloquial puppets of the author discuss a score of different topics which reveal no logical relation to each other i have seen miss alliance once and read the text three times and yet i find myself unable to discover what the piece is all about not only does it lack a story and a plot but it also lacks a theme there are nine characters in miss alliance and all of them are mad furthermore they all suffer from the same kind of insanity their minds have all become unbalanced by the fact that their mental processes are merely intellectual all nine of these puppets think as clearly and as cleverly as mr shaw but none of them can feel and by that token none of them is human stab them with a dagger and you will merely ruffle straw they have no blood within them end of chapter eight chapter nine of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Read by Chuck Lavazzi. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Satire on the American Stage. It has been frequently pointed out that the ability to laugh is the only function that distinguishes mankind from all the lower animals. Furthermore, a man's degree of evolution may be measured by the sort of things at which he laughs most heartily. There are many different grades of refinement in the sense of humor so many that to codify them would require the attention of a profound philosopher. I have never read the celebrated essay of M. Henri Bergson on the subject of laughter and cannot tell, in consequence, whether or not he has covered the field. But this point at least is pertinent, that it is possible to paraphrase an ancient proverb by saying, Tell me what you laugh at, and I will tell you what you are if any evidence were needed to confute the utterly unreasonable statement that all men are created equal it would be necessary merely to point out that all men do not laugh at the same order of ideas the germans laughed when the lusitania went down and by this laughter they distinguished themselves from the preponderant proportion of mankind it is easy enough to laugh at physical eventualities when a man's feet slip from under him and he falls with a dull sickening thud on the fattest and least vulnerable part of his anatomy no human observer of the incident can easily suppress a loud guffaw the appeal of such material is perpetuated in the theatre by the proverbial slapstick which the greatest of all comic dramatists did not forbear to use in such forces as les fourbières du scapin and is kept alive forever by an endless race of amply cushioned actresses like Marie Dressler. A slightly higher degree of evolution is demanded before a man can learn to laugh at mental accidents. The French, in their reasoned catalogue of criticism, have registered a clear distinction between the mode de situation and the mode de caractère. To the common mind, 
it is obviously funny for anyone to fall downstairs. But a greater degree of culture is required to realize that some people may be funnier still if they merely walk downstairs and never fall at all. Of a certain small but very pompous citizen, some happy-minded commentator once remarked that he always seemed to strut while sitting down. And this phrase may be accepted as an illustration of what the French intended by a quip of character. But it is still comparatively easy to laugh at someone else. And civilization may be said to begin at the point when a man becomes capable of laughing also at himself. It is easy to be humorous. It is harder to sustain a sense of humor. It is easy to make fun at the expense of the other fellow. It is harder to take fun at the expense of oneself. Some of our greatest humorists have, by common account, been deficient in the receptive sense of humor. I never knew Mark Twain, although I met him half a dozen times and talked with him as a very young apprentice would naturally talk to an admitted master, but many of his friends have told me that this monumental humorist was incapable of seeing and accepting a joke against himself. A slightly higher rung upon the ladder is attained when men begin to laugh at words and at the jugglery of words instead of laughing merely at situations or at people. Words are symbols of ideas, and only a civilized person can see the fun in an idea. When Oscar Wilde permitted one of his puppets to say, I can resist anything except temptation, he carried laughter into the realm of the philosophical abstract. As a test of the many different degrees of humor, the reader may be recommended to enter any barber's shop and say with due solemnity, <clears throat> I desire a diminution of the linear dimension of my capillary appendages. An uncivilized barber will be offended and may even cause the philosophical experimenter to be ejected from his chaste establishment, for there is nothing more offensive to the common mind than the sort of humor that it cannot understand. But a civilized barber will say, Oh, hell, you mean a haircut, and will proceed with laughter to suit his action to your words. A still higher realm was reached when the ideas that are laughed at are the very ideas that are held most seriously by the man that leads the laughing. This is the realm of satire, which must consequently be regarded as the most loftily developed mood of humor. The satirist laughs not only at himself, but also at those very thoughts which he regards as the light and leading of his life. A humorist can make a joke, a man endowed with a more subtle sense of humor can see and take a joke against himself, but a satirist can see and make a joke against his very God. Many things in life are holy, but to the satirist, the gift of laughter is more sacred than any of the others. The satirical mood may be illustrated easily by reference to Lord Byron's immense and teeming poem called Don Juan. Time after time, in the course of this composition, the poet winged his way aloft on a wind of lyric inspiration, only to pause suddenly and laugh tremendously at the very incentive that had excited him to this eloquence. When I was in my teens, I used to hate this poem because of Byron's habit of laughing in his loftiest moments and blaspheming, as it seemed to me, against the dictates of his genius. But in recent years, I have begun to appreciate, and almost to admire, his nimbleness of mind in presenting an august idea from antithetic points of view. Any man can see a subject from one side, but the mark of culture comes when a man is able to see a subject from several sides at once. The satiric mood demands an extraordinary alertness of intelligence not only on the part of the humorist, but also on the part of his audience. Mr. Chesterton, for instance, whose essential mood is one of deep religious reverence, has a disconcerting habit of laughing his way into the very presence of his God. And this habit is bewildering to minds that are less cultivated than his own. Satire, which may be defined as an irresponsible and happy-hearted toying with ideas, can flourish only in those ages which acknowledge an obedience to the high ideal of culture. Satire can be conceived and written only by gentlemen, 
like the Roman Horus, the French Boileau, the English Dryden, or the American Henry James. A man must be distinguished before he can afford to laugh in public against the very things he holds most holy. Also, he must feel assured of the existence of an agile-minded audience to appreciate the perilous gymnastics of his mind. Our American theater has long been regarded as uncivilized, but a certain sign of promise has been registered by its recent tentative incursions into the unprecedented realm of satire. If our native playwrights can afford to be satirical, a time has come at last when our American theater may be accepted as a grown-up institution. The popular success of Why Marry by Jesse Lynch Williams obtrudes a hopeful indication that our theater is becoming civilized. The piece has been published by Charles Scribner's Sons under the different title And So They Were Married, and it constitutes a contribution not only to the American drama, but also to American literature. In Why Marry, the merits and demerits of marriage as a social institution are discussed from every imaginable point of view. The author has no thesis to expound unless it be a general suggestion that, although marriage bears a load of scarlet sins upon its back, it is at least more easily endurable than any substitute that has been offered for defining the essential unit of society. Each of the contrasted characters is provided with a theory that he or she is prepared to defend and fight for. But it should be registered to the author's credit that he permits his characters to express and illustrate their several opinions without obtruding any comment of his own. The piece, of course, invites and challenges comparison with getting married and misalliance. The present critic does not hesitate to state that Mr. Williams' comedy is superior to either of these compositions by the celebrated Mr. Shaw. From the technical point of view, the superiority of the American fabric is so manifest that it requires no discussion. Mr. Williams tells an interesting story. This story is practicable for the stage, it is coherently constructed, it shows what Aristotle called a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it rises to a climax when a climax is expected and desired by the audience. These merits, called from any ABC of dramaturgy, are mentioned merely because, in the recent comedies of Mr. Shaw, they have been more honored in the breach than in the observance. A more important point is that Mr. Williams, by virtue possibly of his experience as a novelist, has created real and living characters. Whereas Mr. Shaw, in the compositions under question, has created merely talking dolls. It is difficult to go out to dinner without sitting down beside one of the people that Mr. Williams has imagined. But none of us will actually meet the brilliant super puppets invented by the arch ventriloquist of the contemporary theater. The dialogue of Mr. Williams is nearly as witty as the dialogue of Mr. Shaw, and it is much more humorous and human. To use once more the definite phraseology that has been bequeathed to us by the French, the Irish satirist is more inclined to mot d'esprit, and the American is more inclined to mot de caractère. There is an undercurrent of emotion and of friendly sympathy for human nature in this comedy by Mr. Williams that is lacking in all but the very foremost plays by Mr. Shaw. End of chapter 9 Read by Chuck Lavazzi, St. Louis, Missouri, March 2023Chapter 10 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mari McLean. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. The Career of Camille. The career of La Dame aux Camellia is, in many ways, unique in the annals of the theater. In the opinion of the best French critics, and the French are very careful in their criticism, this play has never been regarded as a masterpiece, nor was it rated very highly by the author himself. Yet, though over sixty years have now elapsed since the date when it was first produced in Paris, La Dame aux Camélias is still popular throughout the theatre of the world. 
and bids fair to be applauded a century from now when the later and greater plays of the same writer have been relegated to the library. Alexandre Dumas Fils was born in 1824, and he was scarcely more than 21 when he wrote his first successful novel and called it The Lady of the Camellias. The material was drawn directly from his own immediate experience of that demi-monde of Paris to which he had been introduced by his prodigal and reckless father. As he has said in later years, this youthful narrative was the echo, or rather the reaction, of a personal emotion. The book was immature and sentimental and immoral, but in the turbulent days which anteceded the revolution of 1848, it made a momentous impression on the reading public. The project of dramatization was suggested to the author, and he asked the advice of his famous father, who was perhaps the ablest playwright of the period. The elder Dumas reported to his son regretfully that it was impossible to turn the novel into a practicable play. And Alexandre Dumas père nearly always had the right idea in regard to questions of success or failure in the theater. Nevertheless, the youthful writer decided to waste a week or two in an attempt to dramatize his novel. He retired to the country and wrote the play in eight successive days. Since the piece is in four acts, it will be noted that he allowed himself precisely two days for the composition of each act. It may be doubted if any other play which has held the stage for more than half a century has ever been written so quickly and so easily. But of course we must remember that the author was already familiar with his plot and with his characters before he sat down to write the dialogue of the play. Yet after the play had been completed, there was a doubt for many months that it would ever be produced. Although it had been dramatized from a successful novel, and although it was signed by the son of one of the most famous novelists and dramatists of France, it was rejected by nearly every theater in Paris. After three years of hopeless wandering, the manuscript was ultimately accepted at the vaudeville only to be interdicted by the censorship. After new delays occasioned by political contentions, La Dame aux Camellia was finally produced in Paris at the vaudeville on February 2, 1852. The author was, at that time, less than 28 years old. The piece achieved an instantaneous success in France and has since been added to the repertory of every other nation in the theater-going world. It may be doubted if any other play composed since the initiation of the modern drama in 1830 has been so continuously popular in every country of the habitable globe. In the opinion of those disinterested critics whose judgment is not conditioned by the verdict of the box office, La Dame aux Camellia has always been regarded as inferior to many of its author's later plays and especially to his admitted masterpiece, Le Demi-Monde. According to the judgment of the present commenter, Alexandre de Malfis wrote, first and last, no less than half a dozen dramas which are more important from the point of view of art than this youthful effort that was struck off at white heat. The faults of La Dame aux Camellia are many and apparent. The view of life expressed is sentimental, immature, and in the main, untrue. The thesis is immoral, because we are asked to sympathize with an erring woman by reason of the unrelated fact that she happens to be afflicted with tuberculosis. In the famous big scene between the heroine and the elder Duval, the old man is absolutely right, yet the sympathy of every spectator is immorally seduced against him, as if his justified position were preposterous and cruel. The pattern of the play is faulty, because it rises too quickly to its climax, or turning point, at the end of the second act, and thereafter leads the public down a descending ladder to a lame and impotent conclusion. In the last act, the coughing heroine, like Charles II, is an unconscionable time a-dying. The writing of the dialogue is artificial and rhetorical. Indeed, this noted play exhibits many, many faults. Why, then, has it held the stage for more than half a century? And why, if it is not a great drama, does La Dame aux Camellia still seem destined to enjoy a long life in the theater? The obvious answer to this question leads us to explore an interesting bypath in the politics of the theater. This celebrated piece is continually set before the public because every actress who seeks a reputation for the rendition of emotional roles desires at some stage of her career to play the part of Marguerite Gautier, or, as the heroine is called more commonly in this country, Camille. This part is popular with actresses for the same reason that the part of Hamlet is popular with actors. Both roles are utterly actor-proof, 
and anybody who appears in the title part of either piece is almost certain to record a notable accretion to a growing reputation. No man has ever absolutely failed as Hamlet, and no woman has ever absolutely failed as Camille. On the other hand, an adequate performance of either of these celebrated parts offers a quick and easy means for adding one's name to a long and honorable list, and being ranked by future commentators among a great and famous company of predecessors. Here, then, we have a drama which is kept alive because of the almost accidental fact that it contains a very easy and exceptionally celebrated part that every ambitious actress wants to play. La Dame aux Camellia is brought back to the theater decade after decade not by reason of the permanent importance of the author, but by the reason of the recurrent aspirations of an ever-growing group of emotional actresses. The most recent production of The Lady of the Camellias in New York was due to the justified ambition of Miss Ethel Barrymore. Miss Barrymore is a very able actress and deserved to have her hour with this celebrated play. The one thing which I found both difficult to understand and to forgive in considering this most recent repetition of La Dame aux Camellias was the tampering with the text that had evidently been commissioned by Miss Barrymore. Assuredly, a very famous piece that dates from 1852, if deemed worthy of a new appeal to public patronage, should be presented, frankly, as a play of 1852. And there is no reason whatsoever for disguising its historic date beneath a camouflage of those conventions that have recently become established on Broadway. It is as silly to cut out the soliloquies and the asides from a play of 1852 as it would be senseless to suppress the soliloquies of Hamlet. Mr. Edward Sheldon, in attempting to improve the text of an author who is commonly regarded as the foremost French dramatist of the 19th century, discarded the great soliloquy of the heroine as she writes her farewell letter to Armand. And this soliloquy will be recalled as the finest passage in the play by anybody who remembers the performance of Modjeska. He decided to suppress the reappearance of the elder Duval in the midst of the gambling scene and transformed this whole third act into a sort of Greenwich Village masquerade, and he enclosed the entire text in pursuance of the pattern exemplified in his own play called Romance, within the framework of a prologue and an epilogue that accentuated, instead of lessening, the traits of artificiality apparent in the piece itself. These frantic efforts to disguise an old play as a new play defeated themselves. It would be just as reasonable to require Hamlet to call up Polonius on the telephone in order to establish a scientific reason for the reading of the famous soliloquy on suicide. Is that you, old man? This is Hamlet. Yes, H-A-M-L-E-T, Prince of Denmark. I have something on my mind. Here it is. Are you listening? To be or not to be? That is the question. Any resurrection from the past should be undertaken in a mood which admits a fitting reverence for the conventions of the past, and though the younger Dumas has been honorably dead for many years, there is no reason why a recent playwright should be commissioned to rewrite the text of one of the most celebrated dramatists of modern times. End of chapter 10this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Warren Bergman. Seen on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Chapter 11 Henri Lavdin in the American Theatre. Throughout the last three decades, Henri Lavedan of the French Academy has been recognized as one of the foremost representatives of contemporary French dramatic authorship. And though his work is intimately national, he has enjoyed a quite unusual success in the commercial theater of this country. The first of his plays to be presented in America was Catherine, which was produced by Annie Russell in 1898. Oda Skinner produced The Duel in 1906, and Sire in 1911. In 1918, Mrs. Fisk presented Service, and the latest item on the list, the Marquis de Priola, was added in 1919 by Leo Dietrichstein. Of these five plays, three have run for not less than an entire season in this country, and the others have been played for many weeks. 
What is the reason for this remarkable success of Monsieur Labdon, with a theatre-going public that rejects so many European dramatists of even larger reputation on the ground that they are foreign, and therefore not immediately comprehensible? The reason is that Henri Labdon is to be admired mainly as a painter of portraits. His greatest gift is his ability to delineate a character that is original in concept and vividly alive in execution. This is the sort of character that every actor likes to play, and the significant fact should be remarked that each American production of a piece by Monsieur Labdon has been brought about by the personal desire of some prominent performer to depict the leading part. A playwright who can devise attractive acting parts, like the Lady of the Camellias, for example, stands a better chance of extensive success upon the boards than a more momentous dramatist who creates important characters that are true enough to life but not alluring to succeeding generations of actresses and actors. The dramatis personae of Monsieur Lavdon are notable in equal measure as portraits and as parts, as characters and also as characterizations. They are sufficiently true to life to be admired by those commentative men of letters who, when they attack the theater, may be described as undramatic critics, and at the same time they are sufficiently theatrical to inspire many actors with a keen desire to portray them. Among his confrères of the French Academy, Henri Labdon is recognized not only for his prime ability as a portrait painter, but also for the literary ease and brilliance of his dialogue, and furthermore for his sincerity and earnestness as an almost homiletic moralist. His writing is particularly rich in that quality of sprightliness which the French call esprit, and indeed he first attracted attention in the years of his apprenticeship by publishing in various journals and reviews a series of little dialogues of which the most obvious merit was their literary liveliness. But of course this special quality is necessarily diluted by the process of translation, and whatever residue may still remain is more than likely to fall upon deaf ears in a Broadway auditorium. On the other hand, the American public is no doubt unconsciously attracted by the fact that Monsieur Labdon is more sincerely and emphatically moral in his work than any other of his French contemporaries with the single exception of Eugène Brieux. The moral conscience of Monsieur Brieux is social. He puts society, so to speak, on trial and reads it a reverberating sentence from the judge's bench. But the moral conscience of Monsieur Labdon is individual. He creates a living villain, and then condemns him to his just deserts by fighting against him fairly and disarming him. In this respect, his method is similar to that of one of the most honorable authors of our recent English drama, and would not be at all beside the mark to describe Monsieur Labdon as the French equivalent of Henry Arthur Jones. Alexandre Dumas-Fils, who, like Labdon and Jones, was both a playwright and a moralist, once said that a drama should set forth a painting, an ideal, a judgment. Henri Labdon fulfills this formula with ease. He is first and foremost a great painter. He never loses sight of the ideal, even though his primary employment at the moment may be directed toward depicting its reverse and he is always ready with a judgment that shall be sufficiently impressive to satisfy the most exacting moralist among his auditors. The Marquis de Priola, which was first produced at the Théâtre Français in 1902, with the great actor the Bargy in the title role, is regarded by French critics as one of the three greatest plays of Henri Labdon, the other two being Le Prince d'Orec, 1892, and Le Nouveau Jeu, 1898 and the American public is deeply indebted to Leo Dietrichstein for the privilege of witnessing so fine a composition in our commercial theater. It is easy enough to see that the main motive which impelled Mr. Dietrichstein to produce the play was his desire to appear before the public in the part created by the Bagi nearly twenty years ago. This desire was natural, and the ambition of Mr. Dietrichstein has been justified by the result. The present commentator has enjoyed the privilege of seeing both performances. The Bagi's creation showed more levity than Mr. Dietrichstein's, but Mr. Dietrichstein excels his earlier competitor in grim sardonical intensity. The Bagi was more witty, more suave, more graceful, and more brilliant. 
but Mr. Dietrichstein is more horribly repellent in the passages of tragic retribution. The sinister figure of the Marquis de Priola is one of those great acting parts which are destined to keep a play upon the boards recurrently, because of their appeal to the natural ambitions of actor after actor. In this respect, the character is similar in quality to that of the Baron Chevrial, which was made forever famous on our stage by Richard Mansfield, though this fascinating part appeared in a conventional and easily forgotten play by Octave Feuillet, entitled A Parisian Romance. Leo Dietrichstein is not, by any means, another Richard Mansfield, but in depicting the Marquis de Priola, he approaches much more nearly the high point set by Mansfield for this eccentric kind of characterization than any other actor who has trod our stage since Richard Mansfield died. In the Marquis de Priola, Monsieur Lavedan, according to his custom, has set forth a painting, an ideal, and a judgment. The painting is a portrait of a man so absolutely wicked that his own creator felt constrained to account for his obliquity of character as an inheritance from a long line of malevolent progenitors dating from the Renaissance. This marquis, to state the matter seriously in a phrase that is popularly current in American slang, is a devil among women. By his very nature he has been heart-free from his birth and his experience has merely hardened him to a mood of philosophic cynicism. Though actuated evermore by the inherited instinct of the moth to flutter wings against a flame, he has escaped from the singeing of innumerable candles by his implanted ability to laugh aloud at a moment a little antecedent to the point when his adventures turn to tragedy. This is the painting that is hung up for inspection in the Marquis de Priola. The ideal is suggested by the process of negation. The author easily persuades us that his own ideal of manhood is at all points antithetic to this tremendous monument of evil that is permitted to strut and fret its hour on the stage. Through the medium of a fresh and pure young mind, the mind of Pierre Morin, a foster son of the Marquis de Priola, who turns out later to be his natural son, we are permitted to observe the Marquis as this incarnate devil really looks to Lavdan himself. The plot of the play is planned for the purpose of exhibiting the great philanderer in action, and the public is permitted, so to speak, to look and listen through a keyhole, while the Marquis simultaneously carries on his elaborate efforts to subjugate three women of three very different types, one of whom is his former wife, now comfortably married to another husband. In the end, the Marquis is defeated by the very intricacy of his own devices. The judgment comes when the Marquis de Priola is punished, after due forewarning, with paralysis, as an inescapable result of his past carelessness of the laws of reasonable living. No finer feat of physical acting has been shown upon our stage for many years than the histrionic moment when Mr. Dietrichstein is stricken, tumbling to the floor at the conclusion of this play. This great moment also is foreshadowed finally at the conclusion of the penultimate act when the Marquis is suddenly afflicted with a partial and premonitory paralysis of the right arm, which ever afterwards hangs limp and shrunken from the shoulder of the actor. Mr. Dietrichstein has depicted these effects with such extreme adroitness that his performance, while detracting not at all from the moral purpose of the author, persuades us to applaud the wicked Marquis for his consistent villainy until the bitter end, and for his gallantry displayed in a last and losing battle against the inevitable sentence of moral retribution. End of chapter 11 Read by Warren Bergman, Nina, Wisconsin February 18th, 2023Chapter 12 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. A Drama for Adults, The Torches by Henri Bataille. There is ample evidence that man must be by nature a theater-going animal. Otherwise, it would be impossible to account for the apparent prosperity of the theaters in New York at a time when scarcely any plays are being shown which are worthy of an hour's attention from adults 
of intelligence and taste. Cultivated people who have climbed to years of discretion do not waste their time in the consideration of bad music, bad painting, bad sculpture, or bad architecture. But there always seems to be a public for bad plays. The passion for going to the theater must be written down as irresistible, like the love of woman or that other weak and amiable habit of wasting time and money. In seasons when the plays are meritorious, the public enjoys a sense of satisfaction. But in seasons when the plays are unendurable, the public attends the theater nonetheless. From this curious phenomenon, we might deduce a proverb that the next thing most desirable to a good play is a bad play, and that the only absolute negation to the theater-going impulse would be no play at all. An English version of Le Flambeau by Henri Bataille was produced by Mr. Lester Lonergan on the evening of Wednesday, October 24, 1917. By exact count, this was the 40th legitimate play presented for the first time in New York during the course of that particular season, and it was the first of all the 40 that seemed to have been written by a grown-up man for the enjoyment of a grown-up audience. All the others might have been appreciated easily by children or by adults lacking both intelligence and education. Our theater, for the most part, has ceased to be a grown-up institution, and whatever ideas it ventures to convey are commonly expressed in words of one syllable. Among the playwrights of contemporary France, the Sieur Bataille may be regarded as the eighth or ninth in the order of importance. Assuredly, he does not rank more loftily than that among his colleagues, and before the first production of Les Flambeaux in 1912, he did not even rank so high, since the late Paul Herdu was living at the time to push him further down the ladder. Yet the torches puts our native dramatists to shame and makes our American drama seem childish in comparison. Like all French playwrights, Monsieur Bataille pays his auditors the compliment of asking them to think. It goes without saying that he is himself endowed with brains, for it takes brains to make a practicable play, however empty it may be of permanent significance, and even our American playwrights are not devoid of the ability to think. The point at which Monsieur Bataille surpasses our native dramatists is merely this. He expects his audience also to be endowed with brains. In these times of storm and stress, no soapbox demagogue would dare to stand up and assert in public that Americans in general are undereducated and deficient in intelligence. Yet, week after week, the patrons of our theater are insulted in these very terms by a drama which vociferously claims to set before the public what the public wants. Monsieur Bataille is not so temerarious he does not venture to insult the public. But then, of course, his public is composed of Frenchmen who, when insulted, rise and say, they shall not pass. When a man calls in a doctor, he expects to be told something more about his liver than he knows already. When a man retains a lawyer, he expects to be told something more about the laws of contract or the laws of divorce than he knows already. And when a man pays money to a dramatist, he has a right to be told something more about life than he has previously known. Why should any person pay five dollars for a pair of tickets to the theater if he is doomed to suffer from a sense that he knows as much or more about the phase of life that is discussed as the dramatist himself? The only real excuse for the existence of an author, in the theater and in the library as well, is that he can tell us something that we want to know or make us think of something that would never have occurred to us except for the stimulating contact between his mind and ours. Speaking merely as a layman, and not at all as a critic or a playwright, I must confess that the main motive which attracts me to the theater night after night for weeks and months and years is the constant hope of taking off my hat to some invisible brain behind the footlights that has thought and said something about life which my own mind unassisted by the dramatist, could never possibly have thought and said. We go to the theater, and this is particularly true of critics, not to teach, but to learn. Not to assert our own knowledge or experience, but to attend to the testimony of an author who is able to contribute to our education. Mr. Christopher Matthewson could hardly be expected to listen patiently to a lengthy lecture on the craft of baseball delivered by that imaginary 
Bush League pitcher whose living semblance has been drawn in the delightful sketches of Mr. Ring W. Lardner. But is there any greater reason why an educated man should listen patiently to a homily on life composed, let us say, by Mr. George V. Hobart, the author of that popular monstrosity experience? If our theater has no mind to set before us that is obviously wiser than our own, why, in heaven's name, should our educated public continue to pay money for the privilege of going to the theater? Monsieur Henri Bataille had something to say in Les Flambeaux, and this something is discussed very clearly in an eloquent passage in the second act. This passage records a confidential conversation between two great and memorable characters. We are not merely told that these characters are noted men, but we recognize them to be great because of the nature and the quality of the thoughts which they exchange. One of them is a Belgian poet named Pernier, who has been offered the Nobel Prize, but has waived it in favor of a French scientist named Bouguet, who has recently isolated and conquered the bacillus of cancer. Erner expounds to Bouguet his philosophy of life and explains his reason for renouncing the great prize in favor of his colleague. Life, according to this hypothetic Belgian poet, whose traits of mind may possibly have been suggested by Verheeren, is lived on three planes, the sensational, the emotional, and the intellectual. He attributes his own ascension, from the first plane through the second to the third, to a reading at the age of thirty of the scientific writings of Bouguet. But when Erner has paid this humble tribute to the unadulterated reason of Bouguet, the scientist reacts with a counter-confession that in his own experience he has recently discovered and resisted a potent tendency to descend from the plane of the intellect through the plane of emotion to the plane of mere sensation. In the American theater, it is indeed a rare experience to listen to a colloquy between two characters, each of whom knows more and says more about life in general than has ever yet been thought by the casual and careless auditor. The story of the torches discusses the difficulties encountered by Bouguet in his effort to conduct his personal and private life upon the lofty plane of pure intelligence. He is a great and famous scientist, and in intellect he easily transcends the average man. Yet this very superior intelligence is continually subject to assaults from suppressed emotions and inhibited sensations which a more commonplace and ordinary man would be able easily to master. Bouguet, because of his intelligent ambition to live forever in the region of pure reason, is easily betrayed to error by those functions of the mind which are by no means reasonable. He is led by his sensations into sin and by his emotions into perfidy, and his unadulterated intellect is subsequently impotent to harmonize his actual experience with his ideals. Bouguet, in the story of the torches, commits a momentary sin of sex and subsequently suffers for it, although this passing madness has not in any way assailed the integrity of his intelligence. Because of one unthinking hour in a lifetime of half a century devoted to the high pursuit of science and the benefaction of mankind, Bouguet is challenged to a duel and wounded mortally in the consequent encounter. But before he dies, he manages to extract from his impetuous assailant a solemn oath to carry on his uncompleted scientific work, in order that humanity at large may not be made to suffer from the deep damnation of his taking off. M. Bataille apparently agrees with Dante that a sin of mere sensation is, after all, a minor matter for a man whose sheer integrity of spirit has not been scotched by this momentary, unpremeditated abnegation. This is a thesis that deserves most careful pondering by modern moralists. Whatever may be said by a dramatic author on this topic is worthy of considered evaluation by any auditor who is adult and is not, quote, yet to learn the alphabet of man, end quote. It goes without saying that The Torches is a well-made play. Monsieur Bataille is a disciple of Alexandre Dumas-Fils and has inherited that fine technique which, first formulated a century ago by Eugène Scleeb, has been improved by generation after generation of French dramatists. The French are clear-minded people and see things as they are. It is a cardinal principle of their criticism that any work worth doing is worth doing well. They expect an artist to learn his craft and to revere the tools of his trade that have been handed down to him 
by the great artists of the past. They hold these truths to be self-evident, that the drama should be dramatic, that the theater should be theatrical, and that all art should be artistic. The technical merits of a play like Les Flambeaux are, in consequence, beyond discussion. End of chapter 12 Read by Chuck Lavazzi, St. Louis, Missouri, March 2023Chapter 13 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sonia. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Chapter 13 The Theatre du Vieux Colombier. In the now forgotten period before the war, not even the most civilized of nations escaped entirely that taint of decadence which comes from long protracted leisure and a consequent excess of lassitude in france the flag of art had been nailed to the mast for many centuries but it began at last to droop and to seem a little sullied when no vivifying wind had blown upon it for more than forty years paris was becoming wearied of its own distinction as the citadel of those who know even the french theatre which had led the world since eighteen thirty was beginning to grow dull something had gone wrong with france and with the world at large the wreath that decked the statue of strasbourg in the place de la concorde had almost begun to shrivel up and be forgotten and then but we are talking now of the time before the war and of the condition of the french stage in a period of leisure and of lassitude the theatres of paris unbelievable as it might seem had almost descended to the level of the tedious there were two reasons for this sad condition two antithetic tendencies which account together for the dearth of living drama in the somnolent and easy-going paris of the light and laughing years before the war in the first place more than half the energy that was expended in the french theatres of the time was devoted merely to a meaningless continuance of the traditions of the past and in the second place the only relief from this incubus of ponderous conventionality was offered by a wild and whirling group of anarchists and lesser breeds without the law french art to talk in terms of politics was languishing between a formal past of louis xiv and a formless future of the bolsheviki between an over-emphasized respect for law and an exaggerated tendency to take a gambling chance on lawlessness hence those mixed and indigestible salons of painting and of sculpture which seemed bewildering at the passing moment but which are easy enough to understand in retrospect to-day in that recent but now superseded period when the great art of the drama seemed destined either to die of old age or to perish stillborn in expectancy an ambitious actor by the name of jacques copeau decided to establish a little unpretentious theatre which should seek to light a vivid torch from the dying embers of the inspiration of the past m copeau was neither a reactionary nor an anarchist he was merely a lover of the maxim that beauty is truth truth beauty and he had a vivid feeling that there is nothing either new or old in that eternal region where truth and beauty join hands and dance together to the music of melodies unheard m copeau assembled a little group of cooperative actors and founded a new theatre in paris on october twenty second nineteen thirteen this theatre took its title from that medieval street in the quartier latin leading somewhat vaguely westward from the place de saint sulpice which might be named in english the alley of the ancient dovecot between october twenty second nineteen thirteen and may thirty first nineteen fourteen more than three hundred performances of fourteen plays both classical and modern were exhibited to ever-growing audiences at le théâtre du vieux colombier among the many authors represented were shakespeare moliere thomas haywood alfred de musset dostoevsky paul claudel and henri beck before the end of his first season m copeau had received golden encomiums from eleanora duse igor stravinsky claude debussy henri bergson paul claudel 
Emil Ferraren, and many other leaders of the art life of Europe. In the spring of 1914, Monsieur Coppeau was regarded, by the court of last resort, as the regisseur of one of the few theatres in the world which manifestly seemed alive. The principles of Jacques Coppeau were very simple. He was neither a reactionary nor an anarchist. He neither respected the past for the insufficient reason that it was the past, nor revered the future for the insufficient reason that it was the future. He freed his mind at once from traditions and from fads, and devoted his attention to the lofty task of drawing the thing as he saw it for the god of things as they are. One theory he clung to absolutely, that the drama is essentially an art of authorship, and that the purpose of the theatre is to recreate and to project the mood and purpose of the dramatist. In adhering to this theory, M. Coppeau seceded not only from the immemorial tradition of the Comédie Française, which sets the actor higher than the author, but seceded also from the heresy of Mr. Gordon Craig, by which the actor is suppressed in order that the decorator may be almost deified. M. Coppeau has little use for scenery or decoration. He does not believe, like Mr. Craig, that the drama is essentially a pattern of lines and lights and colours. Neither does he believe, like Mr. David Belasco, that the drama is a mere accumulated and assorted hodgepodge of properties and accessories. He believes that the idea of the dramatist is the only thing that counts, and that this idea may be rendered lovingly, without extraneous assistance, by an eager company of cooperative actors. In the Gospel of M. Coppeau, the play is the thing, and the purpose of the acting is to vivify and recreate the play. This gospel, simple as it seems, appeared exceptional in Paris in the year before the war, for at that time the reactionaries claimed that acting was the thing, and the anarchistic revolutionaries claimed that decoration was the thing. Between the shade of Talma and the shadow of Gordon Craig, the theatre was obfuscated by a twilight that was doubly deep. Then came M. Coppeau, with his very simple dictum. Moliere wrote plays intended to be acted. Moliere acted plays intended to be seen. Therefore, the only purpose of the theatre is to convey, through the fluent medium of acting, the creative purpose of the author. Decoration, after all, is nothing more than decoration. The idea of the play is the only thing that is eternal. With this formula, M. Coppeau succeeded and before the advent of the month of may in nineteen fourteen le théâtre du vieux colombier was already known and celebrated throughout europe shakespeare moliere and a dozen other dramatists were enjoying once again a vivid life in the alley of the ancient dovecot then fell the war most of the actors were immediately mobilized the theatre ceased to be for many months it seemed that art itself was being shelled and shattered by the hun together with that symbol of all that is in art most christian and most sacred the church of joan of arc la cathedrale de reims le patron du vieux colombier was like othello a hero with an occupation gone this artist of the stage a man of more than military years was suddenly divested of his theatre or in other words his spiritual home what was he to do the question was answered by the minister of fine arts who advised him to come to the united states in order to deliver a series of discours in the now forgotten days when this country still pretended to be neutral between right and wrong many emissaries were sent over to our shores by the antithetic nations the germans and the austrians sent over a small army of assassins bomb planters artists in arson and inciters to sabotage the french sent over jusserand brieux and many other gentlemen instructed to do nothing and to say nothing but to leave us quite religiously alone until we had had time to consult our own underlying conscience brieux when he landed in new york in the fall of nineteen fourteen said to the reporters i am coming as an emissary from the french academy to the american academy i am coming from a free people who can think to a kindred free people who can think and so long as i enjoy your hospitality i shall say no word about the war jacques coppeau when he first came to america in nineteen seventeen was similarly tactful 
he talked to us of art and moliere and said no word about the war we know now that france was bleeding at the time but this artist sent over by his government talked to us only about truth and beauty eternal matters in the midst of many things succumbing momentarily to death we welcomed jacques Copeau because he wore the face of dante because he had the voice and the demeanour of one having authority because of any of a multitude of reasons that are trivial and real we asked him naturally to remain among us and this request was backed by a guaranteed subscription collected in support of the occasion by mr otto kahn and some of his associates in the directorate of the metropolitan opera house in consequence of this support from a friendly nation overseas the french government was easily persuaded to encourage a transference of le théâtre du vieux colombier from paris to new york such actors of the company originally chosen by m copeau as had not already been killed in action were demobilized for the specific purpose of carrying the torch of art from paris to new york and the reconstituted theatre wearing as a sort of proud panache the name of le vieux colombier was sent overseas as an item of friendly and disinterested propaganda meanwhile mr khan and his associates had leased the old garrick theatre and caused the auditorium to be entirely rebuilt and redecorated in conformity with the desires of m copeau this new edifice became as pleasing to the eye as any theatre building in america the old top gallery was discarded the boxes were removed from the proscenium to the rear of the auditorium and the gilt and tinsel of broadway were replaced by the lath and plaster of the sixteenth century the interior became remarkable for its simplicity and quietude of tone and suggested a sense of medieval inyards in warwick or beauvais the stage of the vieux colombier as planned by jacques copeau more nearly resembles the stage of shakespeare than the stage of moliere before the curtain there is of course an apron devoid of footlights which is accessible from either hand through a couple of proscenium doors behind the curtain the main stage is spacious free and unencumbered no scenery in the belasco sense is ever used upon it but sometimes the stage is developed to two levels by the introduction of an elevated platform about five feet high which is accessible by steps from every side and sometimes the acting space is contracted with enclosing screens or curtains and localized by the introduction of certain set pieces of property at the rear of the stage there is a balcony borne aloft by columns which may be used when needed as the upper room of shakespeare or when not needed may be curtained off by an arras and employed merely as a decorative background this free and easy stage may be entered from any angle and from a multitude of levels as in the globe theatre on the bank side the main purpose is to get the actor on and to allow him to deliver the lines of the author the lighting of course comes entirely from overhead like the natural sunlight of shakespeare the fluency of this neo-elizabethan stage for fluency i think is the only word that is appropriate was amply illustrated at the opening performance on november twenty seventh nineteen seventeen when les fourberies de scapin was offered as the piece de resistance this farce though written so late as sixteen seventy one represented a return to the earlier manner of moliere inherited from the acrobatic antics of the italian commedia dell'arte the scene is said to be a public square in naples and moliere no doubt used the fixed set that is summarized and still exemplified to students of the stage in the theatre of palladio at vicenza but m copeau thinks rightly that the scene is really any public place accessible from all sides by actors unimpeded by an obligation to account for their exits and their entrances he projects the piece upon two levels before beside beyond and more especially atop the portable platform with which he is enabled to adorn as by a plinth of statuary an otherwise empty and unfocused stage m copeau's performance of scapin may be described as a reminiscence and a revelation it showed the acrobatic grace and rhythmic keen agility that have been ascribed by history to moliere's own teacher that immortal scaramouche who came from italy to paris to remind the modern world of the grandeur that was rome 
plautus seemed alive again when this actor snaked and floated through his many fourberies and belaboured the minds or bodies of his victims with literal or figurative slapsticks m copeau was ably aided by m louis jouvet who projected a memorable character performance in the role of old gironde jouvet's bewildered repetition of the famous line mais que diable allait-il faire dans cette galère is a thing to be remembered always and laid away in lavender together with one's memories of the greater and the lesser coquelin the rest of the company was adequate to the occasion m copeau has organized a group of players who have learned to speak and learned to act and learned a proper reverence for the authors who have written down the lines assigned to them as an induction to this inaugural performance of les fourberies de scapin m copeau composed an impromptu du vieux colombier which was modelled on the impromptu de versailles and which repeated many of the most pertinent comments on the art of acting which were made in sixteen sixty three by moliere himself this playful skit served the purpose of introducing quite informally to the american public the associated actors of the company one passage was especially noteworthy because it summarized in a few words the attitude of those who came to us from france toward the cataclysm which at that time overwhelmed the world a young actor fresh from the trenches m lucien weber said to the director il faut aussi nous laisser le temps patron de nous ressaisir d'écarter de nos yeux des images trop affreuses moi je suis de reims and m copeau replied ces images mes amis ne les écartez pas de vos yeux il faut qu'elles nous inspirent mais gardons les secrètes nous n'exploiterons jamais des émotions sacrées nous ne parlerons pas de nos souffrances nous ne déploierons pas sur une scène de théâtre le drapeau des combats nous ne chanterons pas d'hymnes guerriers nous ne ferons pas applaudir un acteur sous l'uniforme bleu celui qui représente ici la france qui est l'ami de ronsard de shakespeare et de tous nos vieux auteurs nous a donné l'exemple de la délicatesse et de la dignité mais dans toutes nos actions dans tous nos gestes dans la moindre intonation du beau langage qu'il nous est donné de parler nous tâcherons d'être reconnus pour de véritables français End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, stageleft.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton, Alfred de Musset in the theater. Alfred de Musset once wrote a little poem in which he expressed a wish that, in due time, he might be buried beneath a weeping willow tree. I have forgotten the text of that poem, but I remember that it is inscribed upon the rather ugly monument that marks his grave in Père Lachaise. Over this unpretentious tombstone there hangs, or used to hang, a lonely branch of willow, the languid offshoot of a sapling planted by some pious hand. I remember being struck by the incongruity between the verses, carved in rock, and the sickly little tree that had drooped forlornly over them. This impression dates from twenty years ago, for at the age of seventeen I renounced the youthful habit of visiting the graves of the great. It must have been about that time that I read R.L.S. on Old Mortality. But now the thought occurs to me that the sculptured verses may be taken as a symbol of the permanent frame of de Musset as a poet, and the struggling willow branch may be regarded as a symbol of his slender but still growing reputation as a dramatist. Perhaps some later traveler can tell me if the simile may be developed even further. That nearly leafless sapling which made me smile a score of years ago may now, for aught I know, be grown into a healthy and promising young tree. In that event, the fanciful comparison would be perfected for the fame of de Musset as a playwright has steadily increased in recent years. In the history of all the arts except the drama, the posthumous achievement of a noble reputation is not at all unusual. Many painters, many sculptors neglected in their lifetime and derided by their own contemporaries, have subsequently come to be regarded as men whose only failing was that they were doomed to work on earth before their time. 
so recent a painter as Jean-François Millet lived in penury while he was making canvases that now are sold at auction for $100,000. The painter and the sculptor manufacture objects that are durable and may appeal to the leisurely consideration of posterity. Their merit is finally evaluated by a small but perpetual minority composed of those who know, a minority that may summon but a few votes in any single generation, but that triumphs ultimately by an undisrupted repetition of its verdict throughout the tireless succession of the centuries. The history of literature has been enriched by many similar instances of men who, scorned by their contemporaries, have been accepted as apostles by posterity. A notable example is afforded by the case of Keats. This man was absolutely honest, and when upon his deathbed he requested Joseph Severn to inscribe upon his tombstone the pathetic legend, Here lies one whose name was writ in water, he believed exactly what he said. His poems had been appreciated only by his inner circle of friends. Even by his inner circle he had been regarded mainly as a promising disciple of Leigh Hunt, and to the general public he had merely been made known as a butt for the sarcastic and heavy-headed ridicule of Lockhart and Wilson. His short life seemed a failure, and he died a disappointed man. Yet now, one hundred years after the publication of his faulty and faltering first volume, Keats is commonly regarded as one of the very greatest of all poets in the English language, and one of the very few important apostles to the modern world. It is only in the domain of the drama that these drastic reversals of an adverse contemporary verdict are so rare as to seem almost absolutely negligible. As a general rule, but rules of course are always open to exceptions, it may safely be asserted that a playwright who has failed to please his own contemporaries can scarcely hope to attract the patronage of posterity. The reason is, of course, that the drama is a democratic art. It succeeds or fails by a plebiscite of the immediate, untutored public instead of by a vote delivered by the small but self-perpetuant minority composed of those who know. A book may keep itself alive if only a single printed copy chances to avoid the iniquity of sheer oblivion and happens, in some future century, to fall into the hands of an appreciative critic. But it is very difficult at any time to persuade a theater manager to reproduce a play that failed to interest the theater-going public in the very year when it was first produced. The exercise of any art, as RLS has told us, is nothing but the playing of a game, and the game of the dramatist is to interest the public of his time, assembled in the theater of his time, in the predetermined antics of the actors of his time. The playwright, because of the conditions of his craft, is required to appeal to the immediate many instead of the ultimate few, and his efforts to interest a helter-skelter audience must stand or fall by the democratic verdict of the public towards which he has directed his immediate appeal. Such representative great dramatists as Sophocles, Shakespeare, Moliere, and Ibsen succeeded amply in attracting the applause of their immediate contemporaries and thereby laid the basis for a favor that has been bestowed upon them by succeeding generations. Their plays are still produced by commercial-minded managers because the fact has been established that there is a public willing to patronize them. On the other hand, there is nothing, in the general domain of art, more difficult to resurrect than a play that once has died in the presence of a gathered audience. Volumes and volumes of testimony might easily be drawn upon to support the thesis that dramatic art cannot appeal to the verdict of posterity, but one exception to this reasonable rule of criticism is obtruded by the plays of Alfred de Musset. This author was regarded justly in his lifetime as one of the supreme triumvirate that led the renaissance of French poetry in the first half of the 19th century. But he received no recognition whatsoever as a writer for the stage. It is only since his death that de Musset has been at all respected as a dramatist. His career in relation to the theater is so exceptional that it calls for recapitulation. Alfred de Musset was born in Paris in 1810. His first play, La Nuit Venetienne, was offered at the Odeon in 1830, the very year of Victor Hugo's epic-making Hernani. It will be noted that de Musset was at the time less than 21 years old. This fledgling effort was a failure, and the author, disgusted with the theater, refused thereafter to write pieces for the stage. This petulant renunciation reminds us now of Dante's famous phrase, the great refusal. For there is no longer any doubt that de Musset, if he had chosen to take the theater seriously, 
might easily have rivaled the popularity of Hugo with the contemporary public. He continued to compose in the dramatic form because of a necessity of his nature, but instead of offering his pieces for production, he printed them successively in the Revue des Deux Mondes. While Hugo was writing claptrap melodramas disguised as literature by the flowing garment of his gorgeous verse, Dumousset was writing in neat and nimble prose fantastic comedies conceived in an unprecedented mood of witty and romantic playfulness. These pieces, as they appeared in print, were regarded by contemporary readers merely as vacationary exercises by a writer whose more serious medium was verse. The reading public tolerated these relaxations of a noble mind, but it never occurred to any critic that Dumousset's printed comedies might possibly be actable. The author did not care. He hated Hernani and despised Antony of Old Dumas, and he had a happy time composing little pieces for a theater that existed only in his own imagination. It was in 1833 that Dumousset became involved in his famous affair with Georges Sand. Their trip to Italy took place in December of that year and lasted till April 1834, when Dumousset returned to Paris. His final rupture with the famous female novelist took place in 1835. It was precisely at this period, and for the most part during the Italian tour, that Dumousset wrote nearly all the comedies composed for the theater of his dreams. Even as a closet dramatist, if a critic of the living theater can stoop to use that hated self-defeating word, Dumousset's work was finished for all time when he was scarcely twenty-six years old. It is only fair in any posthumous appraisement to remember that the comedies of Alfred de Musset were written not only for a non-existent theater, but written also by a young man in his early twenties. The poet lived until 1857, when he was forty-seven years of age, and before he died, the theater of his time began to find him out. His one-act play Caprice was the first of all his comedies, since La Nuit Benetienne, that was acted in his lifetime. It was first presented, far away from France, in the French theater of Petrograd, and its success was so striking that the piece was soon re-imported to Paris by Madame Alain. This was in November 1847, nearly fifteen years after Caprice had been composed. Within the next four seasons, the poet witnessed the production of half a dozen of his other plays in Paris. And, subsequent to his death, his career as a contributor to the current theater was continued. On the Badine Pas avec l'amour, which has remained in the repertory of the Comédie Française, was first produced in 1861. Barberine, which was acted in New York in 1918 by the company of Le Vieux Colombier, was not presented for the first time till 1882, nearly half a century later than the period in which it was composed. The biography of Barberine is unique in the history of the theater. The piece was written, in his early twenties, by a man who had retired from the theater before the date of his majority and was almost totally unknown to his contemporaries as a dramatist. It was acted for the first time fifty years after it was written and twenty-five years after the author had been laid away in his resting grave. Yet, in 1918, when de Musset, to count the ticking of the clock exactly, was one hundred and eighteen years of age, Barberine pleased many English-speaking people in a city half the world away from Paris. To students of the theater, the record of this fragile, unpretentious play is more remarkable in many ways than that of Hamlet. That sickly little willow wand and Père Lachaise need no longer weep and wither. A breeze is blowing from the west to cause its leaves to overturn their silver sides in a ripple of delighted laughter. Barberine is delicately entertaining and the appeal that it makes to the aesthetic sensibilities is representative of the appeal that is inherent in all the comedies composed by Alfred de Musset. Disdaining the theater of his time, this poet understood more clearly than the celebrated author of the Preface to Cromwell the meaning and method of the comedies of Shakespeare. Alone among all modern playwrights, he has recaptured and restored the magic atmosphere of the Forest of Arden an atmosphere which marries to identity the usually antithetic methods of loveliness and wit. He flutes a little melody upon a slender reed, but his music awakens echoes from an organ which resounds with the diapason of eternity. 
The story of Barberine is suggestive of any of the hundred tales of Boccaccio, which date from a period when narrative was naive and had not yet become self-conscious and sophisticated. Count Ulrich is married to a perfect wife. A dashing, attractive, and self-conceited youth, Astolf de Rosenberg, makes a bet with Ulrich that he can seduce the latter's wife while her husband is away from home, and the laying of his wager is witnessed by the Queen of Hungary. The Baron Rosenberg goes to the castle of Count Ulrich, secures admittance as a guest, and tries his arts against the Countess Marberine. But he is unexpectedly repulsed by the clever Countess and locked up in a room to which both food and water are denied except upon condition that Rosenberg shall devote his entire time, without remission, to the woman's work of spinning. In this ridiculous predicament, the incarcerated Baron is discovered ultimately by Count Ulrich and by the gracious Queen of Hungary. This is a story of the sort that, according to our modern standards, may be described as a tale intended to be written in words of one syllable. But the author has embroidered it with many interesting corollaries and has told it with an art that is reminiscent of that sudden and surprising wisdom which comes occasionally from the mouths of babes. The whole play is so childlike, yet so utterly delightful, that it makes us fumble for a reason to explain the purpose of the manifest complexity of the majority of modern dramas. Most of Dumas's plays provoke a similar response. Their merit is so simple and so obvious that it remained unrecognized for half a century. It was deemed impracticable to expect a gathered public to enjoy a sort of daydream that a poet had narrated to himself in a mood of self-enjoyment. The tardy and almost accidental discovery of the fact that the fantastic comedies of Alfred de Musset are stage-worthy after all is an incident unparalleled elsewhere in the whole history of dramatic theater. End of chapter 14. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, stageleft.org, March 2023. Chapter 15 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Broomhill. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. In Praise of Puppet Theaters. Tony Sarg. Life in New York is more fleet-winged and transitory than life in any other city, and natives of New York, who are less than 40 years of age, can look back to a now-departed period with that luxury of reminiscence that comes only, under usual conditions, to people who have passed the traditional three-score and ten. Twenty years ago, or thereabouts, there used to stand in Spring Street, a little westward from the Bowery, an Italian puppet theater that was eagerly frequented by enthusiastic newsboys. And just around the corner in Elizabeth Street, a little to the northward, there was another puppet theater, up a flight or two of stairs, which also carried on a high tradition inherited from medieval Italy. In those days, it used to be a great delight for a native of New York to go down to Little Italy and spend an evening with the animated dolls. The present writer used to be a welcome guest at both these institutions, and in the Spring Street Theater, he served on more than one occasion as a puppeteer. In these Italian puppet theaters, a continuous tale was told called mainly from the legends of Carlo Magno and his peers, as chronicled in the immortal epic of Lodovico Ariosto. Each night, as in the Chinese theater, the story was resumed at the point where it had been relinquished on the night before. The predicted doings for the current date were announced in advance of the performance on sudden flaring posters that were set up on the sidewalk. These posters informed the newsboy public that tonight they might be privileged to witness, for three cents or five, the heroic combat between the Christian knight Tancredo and some mighty Saracen, or else the poetical adventures 
of the knight Rinaldo in the bower of the sorceress Armida. These posters, dear to memory, served to stimulate the appetite of passers-by for the wonders to be shown in the tiny auditorium upstairs that defied the fire laws and made a little home for Tasso and for Ariasto in a quiet and unnoted corner of New York. In that now departed period, I used to go behind and work a puppet now and then in that stuffy little room in Spring Street. These Italian dolls were rather heavy. They weighed from 90 to 100 pounds, and a rolling up of sleeves was necessitated by the task of helping them go about their business. The puppet plays of that time were replete with alarums and excursions, and many mortal combats between armored warriors were demanded, night by night, by the limitless scenario. One evening, by accident, I found myself installed upon the backstage platform as the special puppeteer of the Paynim, Sultan Solomon. This Sultan, according to the previous announcements on the flaring posters, was expected to fight a losing fight against some Christian hero and to go down scornful after a gentlemanly effort to assert himself and do his best. But when the moment came for the big fight that was to cap the climax of the storied evening, I became so interested in the situation that I refused to allow the Sultan Solomon to die. I whacked the Christian hero over the head so hard and so repeatedly that the congregated newsboys out in front rose spontaneously to their feet and began to cheer the villain of the play. The curtain had to be rung down to restore order in the house, and it could not be rung up again until I had consented regretfully to permit my favored Sultan Solomon to receive his death wound from the hand of the crusader hero. After this surrender had been successfully negotiated, the play went on. In those days, the lines were delivered by a decrepit old Sicilian who knew the stories to his fingertips and improvised the necessary dialogue to suit the action of the puppets. This man was never at a loss for speech. Hidden from the audience, he used to go down on his knees and, with his face suffused by smiles or bathed in tears, he used to launch the sort of language that was obviously needed to suit the mood of the occasion. After the evening was over, this eloquent old man, whose very name I have forgotten now, would wander about behind the scenes where the congregated puppets were dangled upon hooks like so many carcasses in the window of a butcher's shop and pat them with affection and say, as if in confidence, next Thursday this fellow will have to kill himself, or tomorrow night this gentleman is destined to be married to this lady. Nobody who has really loved the puppet theater in his youth can ever quite forget this affection in his later years, and the present writer is ready to confess with frankness a pre-established disposition to favor any theater of marionettes. This feeling was accentuated, almost tragically, 10 or 15 years ago when the Italian puppet theaters in New York were driven out of business by the advent of the five-cent moving picture play. The old address in Spring Street was changed between two winkings of the eye from a temple of delight where one might muse upon Orlando and the magic blowing of his horn to a place of commerce where one could only be informed through the medium of the flickering screen of the perpetual desire of rich bankers to seduce impoverished stenographers. The present writer, 15 years ago, stood once upon the curb of Spring Street in the very midst of a midwinter snowstorm and figuratively wept at the passing change of fashion which had annihilated a living theater of marionettes and substituted at the same address a lifeless moving picture show. Until the outset of 1914, the finest development of the puppet stage that had taken place in any country was achieved in the celebrated theater of marionettes in the Ostalungs Park in Munich. The enterprising Germans had easily surpassed the traditional Italians in this minor department of artistic activity, and in 1913, the German puppet theater was undeniably the finest in the world. But the preeminence of the Munich Theater of Marionettes has, more recently, been disestablished by the exhibition of Tony Sarg's Marionettes in New York. 
The puppet theater that has been invented and developed by Mr. Tony Sarg is unique in the annals of the world. This American artist has expressed more through the medium of his mannequins than any of his many predecessors. The technical capacity of the inspired dolls of Tony Sarg is unsurpassed and according to all due prediction, unsurpassable. Their bodily gyrations equal easily the acrobatic antics of any human athletes, and their vocal expression is rendered adequately by a congregation of professional actors. Each of the three plays disclosed in the course of Tony Sarg's initial program was especially praiseworthy because of its adherence to the atmosphere of make-believe that is most to be desired in a theater of marionettes. The Three Wishes was adapted from an ancient puppet play by F. Pochi, and The Green Suit and A Stolen Beauty and the Great Jewel, both of which were written by Hamilton Williamson, were deftly suited to the mood of the occasion. The agile prowess of the animated dolls afforded ample evidence of the activity of half a dozen puppeteers, whose names were duly noted on the program. But the artistry impressed upon the gathered public by the scenery, the lighting, the narrative invention, and the harmonizing sense of mise-en-scene must be registered to the account of Mr. Tony Sarg. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, StageLeft.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. The Betrothal of Maurice Maeterlinck. It is not often that New York is honored with the privilege of witnessing the first performance in the world of a masterpiece by one of the foremost dramatists of Europe. It was doubtless due mainly to the exigencies of the war that the famous Belgian poet, in the summer of 1918, shipped the latest heir of his invention overseas to be adopted by the American public. But since authors are always tender of their progeny, we may be certain that Maurice Maeterlinck would not have sent his littlest child so far away from Ghent and Normandy unless he had known that a kindly foster father was waiting on the hither side of the Atlantic to receive it. The world premiere of The Bluebird took place at Stanislavski's Art Theatre in Moscow. This also was a long distance from Belgium and France. But Stanislavski's theatre at the time was the most highly regarded in all of Europe. For the privilege of witnessing the world premiere of The Betrothal, New York is indebted to the respect of the great poet for an American manager, Winthrop Ames, and Mr. Ames has shown himself worthy in every way of the trust imposed upon him. The Betrothal is a sequel to The Bluebird and constitutes the second canticle in an uncompleted trilogy of lyric dramas designed to summarize the whole experience of humankind as it is normally unfolded by the quest for those three gardens that are sought instinctively in human life at its beginning, at its middle, and at its end. Tiltil, the hero, represents the human race. In each of the plays he fares forth on a journey through the present, past, and future, imagined as three mystic notes that sing together into the single chord of eternity in search of a different ideal. The first ideal is truth, the second beauty, the third righteousness. Three in one, and one in three. In the Bluebird, Tiltil is but a little boy, and the human race is young. What he toils for is that understanding of all the things that are which shall put an end to problems and appease the seeking soul with happiness. The Bluebird in itself is not so much a symbol of happiness as a symbol of that comprehension of the truth of all things which is the necessary precedent condition to the mood of perfect happiness. In the Betrothal, Tiltil has become adult, and what he seeks is love. The truth that had been taught to him alone by his former journey through the universe still needs and seeks its complement. Truth, like the fabled god named Janus, wears two faces. The other face is beauty, 
and beauty must evermore remain mysterious until love is ready to lift the veil that has enveloped it. In the third play, which remains as yet unwritten, Tiltil would be shown as an old man, and will fare forth on his final journey through the very gates of death in search of that dear garden of peace which is the ultimate reward of righteousness. It is only fair to the reader to confess that the present writer is not possessed of any inside information that this hypothetical third play is now in contemplation. The prophecy has merely been derived by logical deduction from an appreciative study of the hitherto existing works of Maurice Maeterlinck. At the outset of the betrothal, Tiltil, now seventeen years old, is tossing in bed at that mysterious hour which immediately antecedes the dawn. The fairy Berlune appears to him, looking rather like the widow Berlingo, who used to be his neighbor. Berlune inquires quaintly if he is interested in the subject of love, and Tiltil replies that he has thought of it a bit. Half a dozen lovely girls have already looked at him invitingly, the daughters of the woodcutter, the butcher, the beggar, the miller, the innkeeper, and the mayor, and he would find it rather easy to love any of them, and not particularly difficult to love all of them. The fairy cautions him that if his life is to be truly happy, he must focus his affections on one and only one, and she invites the adolescent Tiltil to fare forth upon a journey through the universe in quest of the one and only woman. Tiltil goes forth upon this quest, followed faithfully by the six young girls who have already looked upon him favorably and alluringly. A seventh figure trails along at the very end of the procession, but she is scarcely noticed because her face is veiled. Money, it appears, is needed for the journey, and for the purpose of securing money, the fairy Berlune first leads Tiltil to the miser's cave. Here for a time the miser is seen groveling obscenely over his gathered gold. But as soon as Tiltil turns the magic jewel that he wears upon his cap, the miser remembers the long-forgotten truth that, in reality, his heart is generous, and pours forth by handfuls to the questing youth uncounted bags of gold. Tiltil, for a time, discards his magic cap, or else forgets to turn the mystic jewel, and at once the six young maidens in his train are reduced in semblance to the very women that they actually are and fling themselves into the common sort of catfight that is customary among females who are attracted amorously by an identic male. But Tiltil soon recovers his cap and turns the magic jewel, and the six young girls immediately are revealed again as the wonder-seeking women that they really are. The quest of Tiltil leads him soon into the abode of his ancestors, which is peopled by hundreds and hundreds of individuals who seem to him surprisingly concerned in a matter so apparently personal as his choice of a bride. Some of his ancestors were respectable, some disreputable, some lofty, some lowly, some to be remembered and some to be forgotten. But all of them are interested eagerly in his selection of a wife. The assembled senators among Tiltil's progenitors consider gradually in review the six young and glowing girls who have been willing to attach themselves to the hero's soaring and high-minded quest, as a trailing tail is appended to a sailing kite. But, with long and aged consideration, the ancestors find these many women wanting. With eyes dimmed by several centuries, they fail to see, however, the veiled figure that still follows in the wake of the more immediate candidates for Tiltil's troth. But Tiltil is soon led by the guiding hand of the fairy Berlun into the abode of the children, which corresponds in little to that kingdom of the future which he was privileged to visit in the course of his former journey through the universe. Here, Tiltil encounters face to face his own children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so forward through an endless and illimitable series. These future and still hypothetical descendants display an even greater interest in his selection of a mate than had been shown by his ancestors. To them, of course, his choice is epic-making. In this region of futurity, the tallest children by virtue of rigid logic are those who live still furthest from the world. They grow little and still littler as they dwindle through the foreshortened generations from great-grandchildren to grandchildren and finally to children. The littlest child of all is, consequently, the one that is most ready to be born into the world. In this mystic region of futurity, 
It is Tiltil's littlest child of all that rushes forward with arms wide to acknowledge his predestined mother. This littlest child, in mystic and manifest agreement with all of the long-bearded members of the ancient council of Tiltil's ancestors, rejects the glowing group comprised of the half-dozen candidates regarded all along as not easily to be dismissed, but welcomes eagerly that vague and veiled and trailing figure who follows Tiltil in his quest most modestly and with a monumental silence. The littlest child of all flings his arms instinctively around this shadowy unknown and hails her with the honored name of Mother. And five other children, only slightly taller, add their voices to this indicated harmony. It is, of course, the littlest child of all who is permitted first to lift the veil from the enshrouded face of his predestined mother. This face is very lovely, but Tiltil does not at the moment recognize it. There are so many, many other matters to occupy the mind of humankind at the interested age of seventeen. When, after all these adventures, Tiltil awakens in his bed, he is vaguely aware that many things have come to pass, but as yet he knows not what they are. At the hour of awakening, he is called back to the realm of actuality and invited to give welcome to the widow Berlingo, his former neighbor, who shows a strange resemblance to the fairy Berlune, imaginatively privileged to wand his recent dreams. The widow Berlingo has brought along with her a little daughter whom Tiltil had negligently ceased to think of several years before. The same little girl to whose hands he had entrusted the bluebird which had forthwith fluttered freely from her grasp to be recovered some day. So soon as Tiltil looks clearly to the eyes of this young girl, who for so long has followed him in dreams as a veiled and shrouded figure, he perceives her to be in very truth, the bride that all along has been predestined for him. Their betrothal is exchanged within the winking of an eye, and as they march hand in hand to sit at a table, a wicker basket overhead bursts spontaneously into song. They look aloft, and lo, it contains the bluebird which had flitted and fluttered away from their grasp ten years before. Whistler, with his happy habit of talking of one art in the terms of another, might have called this parable a harmony of blue and silver. It suggests somehow the color of the sky before dawn, in that moment when the deep blue grows aware of the waiting and the morning star trembles with imagining of day. It is in this mood that the scenic investiture of the betrothal was conceived by Mr. Ames and executed by the able collaborators that he judiciously assembled. The spectacle was presented very simply on an inner and outer stage. The transitional passages were narrated on the front stage before a variable background of blue and silver curtains. For the more dramatic passages, these curtains were withdrawn and a full stage was opened to the vision deep and high, and lyric with the beckoning of unobtrusive hints to lead the eye to wander through infinity. The scenes were designed by Herbert Pouse and painted by Unit and Wicks. The costumes were imagined by Mrs. O'Kane Conwell. The dancing numbers were arranged by the school of Isidore Duncan. The incidental music was composed by Eric Delamater. But this repertorial catalog is not to be regarded merely as a list of names. It ought rather to be carved on granite as a roll of honor. The American theater has never before disclosed throughout its long century of effort a production so completely harmonized as this. The betrothal may or may not be finally accepted as equal to the bluebird in importance or in popularity. But considering the author of this play, a final little word must certainly be said in praise of him for it is always hallowing to feel ourselves alive in the same world that looks so lovely to the clear eyes of a laureate poet of that laureled little nation which, throughout uncounted future centuries, will be remembered with respect and admiration and saluted with the gentlemanly gesture of hats off. The work of Maurice Maeterlinck, to quote the ineffable simile of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's, is like a hand laid softly on the soul. End of chapter 16. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, stageleft.org, March 2023. Chapter 17 of Scene on the Stage 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton The Secret of Salome there is a point of absolute intensity beyond which sensations that differ utterly in origin become indispensable from each other this fact has been established by a familiar experiment in physiological psychology within ordinary limits it is easy enough to feel the difference between heat and cold but if a man be blindfolded and if his back be pricked in quick succession with a red-hot needle and with a needle point of ice he will be unable to distinguish between the two impressions similarly in the more exalted regions of aesthetics there is also a point of absolute intensity beyond which all emotions regardless of their origin produce upon the spirit an effect of beauty oscar wilde in all his works was a deliberate and conscious craftsman and in salome he attempted the psychological experiment of producing an effect of beauty by intensifying an emotion that in itself is inconsistent with our ordinary notions of the beautiful as a student and experimenter in the realm of theoretical aesthetics wilde was always singularly sane he understood of course that the most revolting of all reactions is the response of the normal human being to the emotion of horror but it occurred to him also that if horror were sufficiently augmented it might cease to seem disgusting and might assume a virtue that is commonly accorded to many less intense emotions of another kind in answer to this philosophical intention the author set himself the task of composing a piece in which horror should be piled upon horror's head until the finally accumulated monument should take the moonbeams as a thing serenely and superbly beautiful this according to my understanding was the goal that oscar wilde was aiming at with salome maeterlinck had proved already with la mort de tintagel that the emotion of terror might be intensified to a point beyond which it would become indistinguishable from the more abstract emotion of the vaguely tragic but terror is to horror as the soul is to the body and it is far less difficult to raise to the nth power an abstract sense of fear than a concrete sense of physical repulsion this latter task was attempted by oscar wilde in salome actuated by that careful niceness which always guided him in his aesthetical decisions wilde wrote the play in the french language and refused unto his very death to translate it into english the current english version of the text was paraphrased from the original french by lord alfred douglas the medium of the clearest-minded critics in the modern world was picked out as the only proper vehicle for this adventurous incursion into a domain of metaphysics that had scarcely ever been so explored in english art this neat and simple language selected by the irish oscar wilde was the same language that had been chosen previously for the same aesthetic reasons by the belgian maurice maeterlinck and indeed it is obvious enough that wilde owed much to maeterlinck in salome in particular he took over from his predecessor the expedient of repeating words and phrases until this repetition should lull and drowse the auditor into a state of auto-hypnotism in which any pointed impression would register an effect that would be accepted as indefinitely beautiful the danger of this expedient is of course that if it fails it is liable to throw the audience into titters of antithetic merriment 
because the emotion of humour is scarcely distinguishable from the emotion of beauty when feeling has been lifted arbitrarily to a level that is unforeseen wilde of course was sufficiently a satirist to scent this danger and this may be regarded as another reason why he chose to write his tragedy of salome in the language of maeterlinck a medium effectively immune from light-hearted and unsympathetic sallies of his fellow-countrymen also he composed the play as a vehicle for sarah bernhardt and thus insured himself in advance against the danger of a hostile audience in foreseeing and in solving these minor incidental problems oscar wilde was no less clever than in conquering his central difficulty of proving to the world the theoretical aesthetic proposition that the most repulsive sort of horror would seem beautiful if only it could be made to seem sufficiently intensified though salome was written a quarter of a century ago it must still be accepted and admired as a monument of dramaturgic craftsmanship end of chapter seventeen read by alan mapstone chapter eighteen of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Warren Bergman. Seen on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Chapter 18 The Jest of Sam Benelli. Two quotations, like deep bells tolling from afar, are ringing in the ears of the present commentator as he attempts the task of rendering a record of the quickening impression made upon the mind by the recent production in new york of la cena de la beffa a tragedy by sam benelli known in english as the jest the first of these is a refrain borrowed by robert louis stevenson from some anonymous old poet and recorded in the amateur emigrant out of my country and myself i go the other is that passage in robert browning's by the fireside which begins with the enchanting lines and we slope to italy at last and youth by green degrees and climbs to a climax in the great ejaculation o oh, woman country wooed not wed loved all the more by earth's male lands laid to their hearts instead the love of italy is as personal as the love of youth and as poignant as the love of woman and though in these days Italy is regarded merely as a political entity disfavored by the President of the United States in its age-old argument against the Austrians of yesterday, the Yugoslavs of the moment, no man whose soul has in his youth been nourished at the breast of Browning's woman country can ever keep up a rhetorical pretense of discussing any project of Italian art in a spirit of aloofness. Out of my country and myself I go, in no other region of the european world is it possible to escape so easily from one's habitual anchorage in self-centeredness as in this land replete with many pasts and we slope to italy at last and youth by green degrees here we find the explanation of the miracle for italy and youth are interchangeable when regarded as milestones in the progress of the spirit many thousands of americans have been to italy and most of us who have followed the road to rome have been wise enough to make the pilgrimage when we were young youth is the proper time to buy a donkey and to roam among the towered towns of umbria and tuscany in search of far-forgotten frescoes by nameless makers of madonnas youth is the time to fall in love with the lithe and lissom hands of filipino lippi's maidens and the faces of garlandeo's little boys and the mightiness of michelangelo for all of us who have been privileged to go to italy when we were young it will never more be possible to slope to italy again without sloping back to youth by green degrees the signal triumph of the american production of la cena de la beffa was not so much that it took us back to italy as that it took us back to youth out of our country and ourselves we went 
We left the electric lighted region of Times Square and were wafted overseas to lose ourselves in the sharper shouted and more wondrous region of the Renaissance in Florence. But also, when the curtain rose, we doffed the incubus of our accumulated years and dashed back at a gallop to the time when we were young. Since criticism, according to the formula of Anatole France, may be defined as the record of a soul's adventures among masterpieces, any work which can force the soul to enjoy the miracle of rejuvenation must be accepted as a masterpiece. Italy, of course, can always make us young, but Italy, as Secretary Baker has reminded us, is 3,000 miles away. Youth, for most of us, is further away than that, Yet we do not find it difficult to swim the seas and slope back at the beckoning of such a dramatist as Sam Benelli. Another reason why La Cena della Beffa takes us back to youth is not merely that it beckons us to Italy, for some of us, alas, have never visited San Gimignano della Bellatore, but that it also allures us to the contemplation of a region of romance that cannot be punctuated by any ticking of the clock as methods for distilling and recording the quintessence of experience realism and romance must be regarded as commensurably equable it is possible through the exercise of either method to tell the truth and to engrave it upon granite but whenever a toss-up occurs between the two it is safer to bet upon romance if there is any question of longevity the realist as he improves his method is inclined more and more to center his attention upon the meticulous task of depicting the manners of his own country in his own time but in proportion as he focuses the scope of his attention he sacrifices the unlimited appeal to the receptive many who consider life at large without glancing at the clock and are as willing to accept an unauthenticated tale of patagonia as a record of experience in a boarding-house in forty-fourth street the Italian poet Sembinelli has been known to our American public for several seasons as the author of the popular romantic opera, The Love of the Three Kings. He was only 25 years old when La Cena della Beffa was first produced in Rome in 1909. It took the capital by storm. A second company was organized for Florence, and in these two cities the piece ran simultaneously for hundreds and hundreds of nights. Since then, it has been acted in every town of the peninsula and has never left the Italian stage. In 1910, Sarah Bernhardt produced the play in Paris under the title of La Beffa and appeared in the part that was depicted in this country by John Barrymore. This French production was also signally successful. Any American manager might have produced The Just in New York at any time within the last ten years. It is a known fact that several of our best-known impresarios considered the undertaking and decided, one by one, that since the jest was obviously a great play, the public could not be trusted to patronize it. The jest is popular because it permits our theater-going public to worship at the shrine of a trinity whose all but holy names are youth, romance, and Italy, three in one, and one in three. The piece is gorgeously romantic and gloriously young, each of its four acts crowds together and hurries forth upon the stage enough theatrical material to furnish out an ordinary full-length play not a moment or a line is wasted the author is so young and vigorous that he flings himself high-hearted to the enterprise of capturing his public by assault instead of laying a more leisurely and careful siege to the emotions he deals with an epoch that for many reasons is fruitful in theatrical material if those of us who are alive today should be invited by some god to transfer our transit through the world to some past period of history and were allowed to choose the period we should select first of all the time of pericles in athens when human civilization touched its height and as our second choice we should pick out the time of lorenzo the magnificent in florence in either of these times and places it would scarcely have been possible to cast a casual stone without hitting some artist inspired with a singing sense of all that was and is and evermore shall be the civilization of athens was submerged beneath the iniquity of oblivion when the barbarians of the north poured downward upon rome and overwhelmed the ancient world then ensued a thousand years of darkness for the medieval centuries are justly labeled in our histories as the dark ages but after a thousand years the world was born again and tardily recalled the glory that was greece and the grandeur that was rome 
This renaissance was centered in that million-lilied city that bore the flowery name of Florence. The dramatic quality of this period arises from the fact that Florence was divided between the delicate aristocrats who still remembered, after many centuries, the grandeur that was Rome, and sought once more to brandish overhead the ancient but unextinguished torch of art, and the mighty men of northern birth, strong-armed and little-minded, who sought still to keep mankind enslaved in military bondage. Politics in Florence were corrupt. The city and the province were trampled down beneath the march and countermarch of militant Teutonic hordes. But meanwhile, men endowed with Latin souls, by hundreds and by thousands, impelled to recall the glory of the ancient world by some burgeoning, as spontaneous and irresistible as the shooting up of tulips in the early spring, were painting pictures of aloof and singing angels dancing serenely upon the pansied fields of paradise. Our blessed and angelic brother, Fra Beato Angelico, thought not about the Teutons who had overwhelmed the world by force of arms. Quite quietly he painted frescoes upon convent walls that would remain to be remembered long after all the Teutons in the world had been forgotten. With this hectic and dramatic struggle between the strong arm of barbarism and the strong mind of civilization, exemplified supremely in the Renaissance, Sembinelli deals in Lucena de la Beffa. This is a great subject, because it stands aloof from any touch of time. The specific story of the play is concerned with a personal contest between a Pisan mercenary, Neri Chariamentesi, who, descended from the Teutons of the North, is a giant in physical strength but a pygmy in mental ingenuity, and a Florentine aristocrat, Gianetto Malaspini, who is physically weak and tremulous but is endowed with that metaphysical gift of penetrant imagination which is the heritage of civilized mankind. Neri is a soldier, and Gianetto is merely a painter of Madonnas. Neri is a giant, and Gianetto is undersized. Neri is brave, and Gianetto is cowardly. Neri is mature, and Gianetto is perilously young. Yet the weakling painter of Madonnas, by the exercise of mental subtlety, overcomes his much more powerful antagonist and drives him mad by making him the victim of a well-imagined jest. This is the theme of the Cena de la Beffa, and if this tremendously dramatic theme is comprehended by the reader, it will not be necessary for the commentator to summarize the story of the piece in more particular detail. The English adaptation has been admirably made by Edward Sheldon. Mr. Sheldon's version is rendered in iambic pentameter, and it is somewhat surprising to discover and to note the fact that this gifted author writes even better in blank verse than he has long been accustomed to write in prose. End of chapter 18 Read by Warren Bergman, Nina, Wisconsin, March twentieth, twenty twenty three. Chapter nineteen of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton Two Plays by Aquinto Benevente The Bonds of Interest and The Passion Flower The romantic dramatist enjoys this large advantage over realistic rivals, that his plays are more easily transferable from country to country and from generation to generation, because he refrains from focusing attention on matters that are local and timely. The illustrious realists of the modern French drama, like the great Emile Auger and his important disciple Eugène Brieux, are little known outside their native country, because their work has been devoted to a study of social conditions that are peculiarly French, whereas Edmund Rostin, with the far-flung romance of Cyrano de Bergerac, lassoed the rolling world. The realistic dramas of John Galsworthy will be forgotten before fifty years, because the social inequities and inequalities which he attacks with such commendable fervor will be remedied in half a century, and that future fiat of the public conscience which is destined to render these timely compositions obsolete will be hastened by Mr. Galworthy's undeniable ability to make his plays persuasive to the present generation. On the other hand, 
There is no danger that a romantic composition like Barry's Peter Pan will ever be legislated out of existence by political reformers of the future. The present commentator is required to confess the regrettable lack of any special knowledge of the work of Agento Benevente, the greatest living dramatist in Spain. But if The Bonds of Interest may be regarded as a representative example of his output, it is obvious enough that his ambition is to write not of an age, but for all time. The story that is repeated in this comedy has been traditional in Spanish literature since the distant heyday of the picaresque romances, and it has been familiar in the theatre of the world since the ancient days of Plautus. The essential points of the narrative may be patterned very quickly in a summary. Two penniless adventurers, a master and a servant, come to a town where they are totally unknown and impress the local citizens at first sight by pretending to be rich. The clever servant entangles many of the slower-minded local characters in an imaginative scheme for making money, whose only possible success depends upon the maintenance of their faith in the wealth and prowess of his mysterious and silent master. His method of enmeshing them is to bind each man to the common undertaking by the bonds of his own interest. United they will stand, divided they will fall. Therefore they remain united, and a fortune is easily conquered by the strength that arises from their union. The two penniless impostors are enriched, but the very people they intended to impose upon are enriched at the same time. Therefore, in the end of all, these two unprincipled adventurers turn moral and settle down to finish out their lives as the most respected citizens of the community that they have unintentionally benefacted. This summary has been written purposely in terms that are abstract, and the reader will notice that, thus formulated, it would be pertinent to review of Get Rich Quick, Wallingford, or any of the twenty or thirty American comedies and farces that, in more recent years, have been written in emulation or imitation of George M. Cohen's most celebrated play. Yet all of our American playwrights, following the lead of Mr. Cohen, have rendered a realistic treatment of this timeless story which has been passed down to our modern theatre from the ancient days of Plautus through the medium of Moliere. They have all attempted to persuade the theatre-going public that this perennial plot is indigenous to America and peculiar to the present generation. The result of this realistic treatment was inevitable. When Get Rich Quick Wallingford was revived a few seasons ago, it failed dismally because the public regarded it already as out of date and none of our American plays of this type has sustained the test of being acted successfully in a foreign language overseas. The depiction of local life in the office of a small-town American hotel that was presented in the first act of Mr. Cohen's Wallingford was nothing less than masterly in sheer theatrical technique, but would this clever act, if translated into Spanish, be interesting to an audience in Madrid? Yet the bonds of interest, when translated into English, was interesting to an audience in New York. The main reason is that Benevente, in treating a plot that has been traditional since Plautus, has sagely decided to set his story not in his native Spain, but in an imaginary country. And the second reason is that, instead of attempting to restrict the project of the present period, he has preferred to launch it vaguely as a thing imagined to occur at the onset of the 17th century, when, as Ronstead remarked in the initial stage direction of La Romances, the costumes were pretty. By the same expedients, the romantic Benevente succeeded in setting forth, so long ago as 1907, a play that has outlived already the many subsequent American elaborations of the same essential plot. It must be said, however, since an international comparison has unwittingly been instituted, that our American playwrights easily surpass their Spanish rivals in the desirable detail of a rapid rush of actions. Benevente's comedy is elaborately literary and much too wordy for our taste. Our audience has not been trained, like the public of the Latin countries, to listen with approving patience to a lengthy drawing out of lines. The text of this play was translated into English by John Garrett Underhill, the foremost American scholar in the unfamiliar field of current Spanish literature, and the official representative in this country of the Society of Spanish Authors. Mr. Underhill is a personal friend of Jacinto Benevente, and his rendering of the text must be accepted as authoritative. Most of our American plays seem pale and bloodless when compared with such pieces as La Magreda, a more emphatic composition by Yaquinto Benevente, which also was translated by John Garrett Underhill, and was presented under the altered title of The Passion Flower. A young woman, Acacia, 
is about to be married to a young man, Faustino. On the eve of the wedding, Faustino is shot and kills from ambush. Suspicion is directed against Norbert, a former suitor of the girl. But Norbert is exonerated by the court when he has proved a faultless alibi. Slowly, by watching the gradual presentment of many little bits of evidence, we learn that the crime has actually been committed by a dastardly servant, Rubio, who had been hired to do the deed by Esteban, the stepfather of Acacia herself. We wonder at Esteban's motive, and are ultimately shocked by the revelation that it arose from a guilty love for the girl, against which he long has vainly struggled. Esteban loves his stepdaughter so intensely that he was more ready to procure the murder of her fiancé than to accept the responsibility of her leaving his home. The girl herself has always repulsed the affectionate advances of Esteban, and has always felt jealous of him for having usurped the place of her dead father in the affections of her mother, Raimunda. But, in a terrible moment at the climax of the play, Acacia discovers that her imagined hatred for her stepfather has merely resulted from a lifelong repression of an overmastering love for him. When this horrible revelation is made patent, Raimunda tries to come between her daughter and her husband, but the guilty and befogged Esteban shoots her dead, and then gives himself up to the authorities. La Melquierda is a play that deals with primitive passions, but these passions are analyzed by the author with a scientific insight that removes the drama from the bullring to the laboratory. It requires acting that it shall be both powerful and subtle, both primordial and delicate. It is full of sound and fury, blood and sand. It offers a welcome contrast to the anemic exhibitions that are customary in the current theater of this country. End of chapter 19 Recorded by Todd Chapter 20 of Scene on the Stage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Warren Bergman Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton Chapter 20 Understanding the Russians, Maxim Gorky's Night Lodging Few statements are more silly than the usual assertion that human nature is the same the wide world over. The dog and the cat have different characters, though each of them is endowed with four legs and a tail, and we have lately learned that the psychology of the Germans is different from that of all the other races that walk upright on their rearward limbs. We shall never understand the Russians until we admit in the first place that human nature is not the same in Russia as it is in the United States. Mr. Kipling told us long ago that the Russians may be regarded either as the most eastern of western peoples or as the most western of eastern peoples. At any rate, they are not wholly of the Occident as we are. When the Englishman is in trouble, he conceals his feelings, talks lightly of trivial matters that have nothing to do with the occasion, and resolutely carries on. When the American is in trouble, he makes a joke of his difficulties and curses laughingly in the latest slang. When the Frenchman is in trouble, he analyzes his own situation clearly, arrives at a reasonable judgment from the facts, and then waves his hand aloft in a graceful gesture and says merely, C'est la guerre! When the German is in trouble, he weeps sentimental tears and calls upon his tribal deity. But when the Russian is in trouble, he luxuriates in this abnormal situation, wallows nakedly in the pathetic, and indulges in a veritable orgy of self-pity. He loves himself the more because his lot is hard. He worries about his soul to an extent that Western men will not permit themselves to worry and his abject attitude of thanking God for chastisement remains quite incomprehensible to the Occidental mind. It is well for us to understand the Russians, because they are more numerous than we are, and are possibly predestined to play a larger part in the future drama of humanity. The quickest way to understand them is to study their literature, and to compare it with ours. The Russian writers easily excel our own in sheer immensity, 
but they cannot compete with our Occidental artists in the matter of orderly arrangement. Here at once we sense a basic difference between two antithetic types of mind. The Russians exceed us in potentiality, in fruitfulness, but we exceed them in efficiency and in the scientific application of the practical. There is here and now before us no question of better or of worse. The immediate problem is to recognize and to define essential differences. The drama is the one art through which a people can speak most clearly, and an interchange of plays between the Russians and ourselves is greatly to be desired in the present period of mutual misunderstanding. Unfortunately, the drama in this country is so inconsiderable that there are no plays of American authorship that we could profitably send to Moscow. But Arthur Hopkins has made a move in the right direction by resolving to set before the American public a series of plays of Russian authorship. In 1918, he showed us The Living Corpse of Count Tolstoy, and in December 1919, he inaugurated a series of special matinees devoted to an exhibition of Night Lodging, a tragedy by Maxim Gorky, which had long been celebrated in nearly every city of world importance but New York. It may be doubted if night lodging would be commercially successful if it were presented in New York for a regular run, for it is totally foreign to our American ideas of entertainment. We are taken to a foul and filthy lodging house, inhabited by the scum and dregs of Russian humanity, a helter-skelter group of beggars, thieves, drunkards, prostitutes, murderers, and wastrels. We are made to witness their daily doings. We are made to overhear their momentary conversations. We are made to explore the darkest and most intimate recesses of their slimy souls. The first impression we receive is one of horror. Horror that such creatures should exist, and horror that any author with a manifest ability to wield a pen should permit his mind to brood so persistently on their existence. For night lodging is not true to life as life is visioned by our Occidental writers. Gorky's tragedy is sedulously faithful to facts, but its selection of facts from life is, to our minds, unfaithfully proportioned. There are seventeen people in this play. Suppose now that an enormous crowd of people should be gathered hugger-mugger in Trafalgar Square, the Plaza de la Concorde, Union Square, or the Lakefront in Chicago. And suppose, next, that somebody should hurl a bomb that should indiscriminately kill any seventeen people in this entire crowd. To the mind of such a man as Abraham Lincoln, it would be unimaginable that not one person in the seventeen should be worthy of respect, and that not one person in the seventeen should have a single friend to love him and to lament the deep damnation of his taking off. The mind of Abraham Lincoln is the American mind. We believe in people, but Maxim Gorky is a Russian. God only knows what he believes in, for he does not believe in God. He does not believe in life. He does not believe in people. No reason philosophy of life is apparent in this piece, but there is a single little clue that seems to open a tiny window on the author's mind. An old man, a sort of pilgrim wanders into the play toward the close of the first act and wanders out of it again before the last act is arrived at. The other characters are intolerant of this aged wanderer. He has no friends, and yet, to a Western audience, he seems comparatively likable. He is kind to people, without any reason to be kind, and he says one thing that is particularly worthy of remembrance. He asserts that human nature, even at its lowest, remains somehow human, and that none of us should ever dare to insult a human being by regarding him with pity. Pity, he tells us, is a base emotion, because it is born of egoism and is nearly related to contempt. Judge not that you be not judged. This is a great saying. Yet, if we may not pity the helpless and the hopeless of the world, what can we do for them? And what shall we do about them? 
Maxime Gorky does not answer, for his lips are sealed. He is like a miner in the bowels of the earth, so blinded by the stinking darkness that envelops him that he forgets that up above him, on the surface of the seas, many mariners are steering sleek and graceful ships by the shining of the everlasting stars. Yet this gloomy and discomfortable Russian is endowed with an immensity of mind that puts our native dramatists to shame. He splashes at a ten-league canvas with brushes of comet's hair, and we Westerners who yelp against him should perhaps regard ourselves as a pack of coddled little lapdogs baying at the moon. The moon is cold and dead, but who are we to bark against it? We may conserve our dignity most gracefully by confessing that we do not understand the Russians. To the Occidental mind, night lodging is a formless play. It has no plot. It has no beginning, no middle, and no end. It never rises to a climax, yet every moment is unaccountably dramatic. It might go on forever, like a Chinese drama. The spectator may come late and arrive at any moment. He may leave early and forsake the theater at any moment. Any ten minutes of night lodging is essentially the same as any other, and as good as any other. The piece offers merely a sort of peephole upon Russian life, or so much of Russian life as Maxim Gorky has cared to contemplate. And this life is, in the main, a rather dreary thing that drifts along with no particular accentuation of excitement. This is a totally different presentment from that shrewdly selected and meticulously patterned drama that we, in England and America, have inherited from France. But let us not surrender to the egoism of assuming that Maxime Gorky is not an artist. Let us assert merely that Gorky is a Russian, and that our minds work differently. We build our plays more cleverly, but seldom or never do we achieve that absolute sincerity of sheer reporting which is evident in every line of Maxime Gorky's dialogue. End of chapter 20 Read by Warren Bergman, Nina, Wisconsin, January 25th, 2023. Chapter 21 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sonia. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Chapter 21. Two plays by Count Leo Tolstoy. The Living Corpse and The Power of Darkness. Whenever a great master of one medium of art feels impelled to express himself through another medium with which he is comparatively unfamiliar, the result, though seldom completely satisfactory, is nearly always interesting and is often strikingly original. Michelangelo was primarily a sculptor, secondarily a painter, and only rarely did he turn his hand to architecture. When he was called upon to disentangle the confusion into which the pattern for St. Peter's had become involved, he did not succeed in working out the problem to a logical conclusion, but, obeying an heroic impulse, he crowned an architectural monstrosity with that incomparable dome, which is one of the glories of the world. A great man who is also a great artist within his chosen and accustomed sphere may bring to the practice of an unfamiliar craft a freshness of spirit that is rendered more acute because, for once, he is working as an amateur and not as a professional. Who is there who would not wish to read that fabled century of sonnets, which Raphael is reputed to have written for his lady? And is there a picture in all Florence that we would not gladly give for a sight of that lost drawing of an angel which Dante tells us that he was engaged upon one day when he was interrupted by the intrusion of certain people of importance? Doubtless Raphael was not another Petrarch, nor could Dante be regarded as a second Giotto, but these labours of their love must certainly have been irradiated with the very essence of their souls. Count Leo Tolstoy, before making his noble but regrettable decision to renounce the practice of creative literature in order to immerse his mind in religious meditation, had established an impregnable reputation as one of the greatest novelists that ever lived. On the other hand, 
he had had no training whatsoever as a dramatist in the first place he had never been a theatre-going man nor even a closet student of the masterpieces of dramatic literature and in the second place when tolstoy's career was at its prime the modern russian drama had not yet emerged and the russian theatre which is now so well equipped was in its infancy yet late in his life this great writer felt a strong impulsion to express himself in the dramatic form and regardless of his lack of training in an unaccustomed craft he wrote a few plays of which the most interesting is perhaps the living corpse the living corpse was written in nineteen o two when count tolstoy was seventy-four years old he did not live to complete the final revision of the text that he had intended but a full manuscript was found among his papers after his death and the piece was soon accorded a posthumous production it has been famous on the continent of europe for a decade and a half and in past years it has been acted in new york both in german and in yiddish the first american production in the english language was launched in october nineteen eighteen by arthur hopkins and this production afforded a welcome opportunity for studying this interesting play the first important point to be observed is that the structure of the living corpse is utterly unconventional it would appear that count tolstoy at the outset of the twentieth century was either ignorant or scornful of the trend which the dramaturgic art had taken throughout the three preceding generations it was eugene scribe in the decade of the eighteen thirties who initiated the nineteenth century formula of the well-made play this pattern was improved in the succeeding generation by alexandre dumas fils and in the decade of the eighteen nineties it was improved still further by sir arthur pinero scribe also was the teacher of tolstoy's contemporary henrik ibsen and ibsen is not only the greatest modern dramatist but also the most representative playwright of the nineteenth century he taught by his example a very high regard for strictness of technique no other plays of any period are so tightly and so carefully constructed as those of the great norwegian dramatist every line is made to answer to every other line and to delete a single speech or bit of business might lead to an unravelling of the entire pattern tolstoy was either ignorant of ibsen or unimpressed by his laborious example no effort has been made to pattern the living corpse in three acts or in four with every moment revealing a logical relation to every other moment instead the story is unfolded in a sequence of eleven episodes only two of these episodes happen in the same place so that ten different stage settings are required and the author handles the category of time as freely as he handles the category of place undoubtedly this narrative method was employed because it seemed most natural to the mind of a novelist he imagined his story in chapters not in acts and he set it forth in the form and order in which it had revealed itself to his imagination it may seriously be doubted that count tolstoy was conscious of the fact that his technical method more nearly resembled that of shakespeare than that of the best playwrights of the nineteenth century shakespeare's frequent changes of time and place his free and easy habit of constructing a play in an uncounted sequence of scenes were practically suited to the exigencies of the inner and outer stage for which his plays were fashioned but assuredly the russian novelist was not attempting to plan a piece for the elizabethan theatre neither could he have foreseen in nineteen o two that the subsequent invention of many stage appliances to make possible a more rapid shifting of scenery in the modern theatre would soon render the living corpse more stage-worthy than it was at the moment when it was composed many russian plays at present are constructed in a sequence of from half a dozen to a dozen scenes but this fact does not result so much from the example set by count tolstoy as from the simplification of scenery that has taken place within the last ten years the novelistic method of the living corpse is interesting from the outset because of its originality and as the play progresses the spectator gradually realizes that the construction is not nearly so haphazard as it seems the piece in fact is built like a huge pyramid in the early episodes the foundation is laid out upon a broad and ample base then little by little the superstructure is reared up growing always narrower and sharper at the same time that it is growing higher until at last the whole thing culminates in an acute point of dramatic agony 
the subject matter of the living corpse is no less unconventional than the technical method it was as long ago as eighteen ninety three that ferdinand brunetiere made his famous empirical announcement that the essence of the drama was an assertion of the human will and that the most dramatic scenes were those in which opposing human wills were shown in conflict yet the hero of the living corpse may almost be described as a man without a will he drifts through life along the line of least resistance and never asserts himself at all any practical playwright of the eighteen nineties would certainly have judged that the subject matter of the living corpse was hopelessly undramatic yet the undeniable fact remains that the play is intensely interesting in the theatre the story of the piece is so well known that a brief summary will suffice to recall it to the attention of the reader fedia the hero is cursed with the poetic temperament without being gifted with the real poet's power of attaining self-fulfilment through self-expression he drifts into long continued periods of drinking and spends most of his time with a tribe of singing gypsies masha a girl of this tribe is the one person in the world who inspires him to glimpses of his better self and for her he develops a very strong affection which remains however always scrupulously chaste meanwhile fedia's deserted wife named lisa begins to see more and more of a very worthy friend of hers and fedia's who has loved her for many years this friend named victor is an honourable man and does his best to induce fedia to return to lisa but when his best efforts to this end have proved of no avail he implores lisa to secure a divorce and to marry him fedia also is an honourable man he believes that his wife will be more happy as the wife of victor and he desires to grant her the divorce that she deserves but he is confronted by the uncomfortable fact that the divorce laws of russia are just as archaic as those of new york state lisa cannot secure a divorce unless she can prove in court that her husband has committed adultery a thing that he has never done his sensitive soul revolts against the usual expedient of hiring some woman of the streets to fabricate false evidence against him and he decides instead to kill himself in order to set lisa free to marry victor but when he raises the pistol to his head he realizes with dismay that he lacks sufficient will to pull the trigger in this dilemma masha the gypsy girl persuades him to pretend that he has committed suicide by jumping into the river to arrange ample circumstantial evidence of suicide and then to disappear forever this he does his supposititious death is adequately attested and in due time lisa and victor are married happily meanwhile fedya leading the aimless life of a living dead man sinks lower and lower into the very depth of the slums at last one night he tells his strange story to a companion in a cheap drinking den the story is overheard by a criminal who after failing to extort blackmail from the penniless fedya as the price of silence reports it to the authorities lisa victor and fedya are dragged into court and the innocent married couple are accused of deliberate bigamy the progress of the trial is very harrowing to all concerned because of the injustice of the laws and the stupidity of their administration finally fedya in an agony of self-reproach summons up the sudden courage to shoot himself in a corridor outside the courtroom and thereby solves the situation with a tragic last self-sacrifice this is in itself an interesting story but as count tolstoy has treated it the characters are immeasurably more important than the plot the accuracy of his observation the intimacy of his analysis the profundity of his sympathy produce an impression of the immensity of life that is rarely to be met with in the modern theatre though the living corpse according to the point of view may or may not be regarded as a great play there is no denying that it is a great work and that it was written by a great man but of all the russian plays that have been presented in new york the power of darkness by count tolstoy is the most easily appreciable by our occidental public it was written so long ago as eighteen eighty six before the modern russian drama had begun its progress toward that technical anarchy which is illustrated by such composition as maxim gorky's night lodging count tolstoy was not a theatre-goer and he was not a thorough student of the dramatic literature of the world yet in this play he followed the form with which habitual patrons of the theatre were familiar instead of attempting that novelistic pattern which he essayed nearly twenty years later in the living corpse 
most modern russian plays crowd an enormous canvas with a multitude of living figures but are lacking in composition and design but the power of darkness is patterned just as clearly as any play by ibsen or by dumas fils with whose contemporary efforts the great russian author remained obtusely unfamiliar this piece reveals that unity of plot which is demanded by our western minds it tells a single story with a cumulative intensity no details are introduced which are extraneous to the essential pattern a predestined climax is attained at the curtain fall of the penultimate act and the play closes with a logical catastrophe that might almost be described as a happy ending the piece is absorbing in its intellectual interest and overwhelming in its emotional appeal professors of hygienic science have taught us recently that germs of disease are more likely to multiply in darkness than in the curative light of the sun so long ago as eighteen eighty six count tolstoy informed the world that the germs of sin are more likely to multiply beneath the darkness of ignorance than beneath the beaming of the light of education he shows us the russian peasants as they live uncultured uneducated tragically ignorant he shows us that among such people an initial sin will naturally propagate itself from crime to crime until it has engendered a museum of horrors in one point and one only this play is unconventional according to our occidental standards it is not at all surprising that count tolstoy in eighteen eighty six had never heard of that empirical principle first announced in eighteen ninety three by ferdinand brunetiere to the effect that the drama should deal with an assertion of the human will nikita the hero of this play like fedya the hero of the living corpse which was written nearly twenty years later than the power of darkness is a man without a will he drifts through life along the line of least resistance he is not deliberately vicious yet he is impelled from crime to crime by influences that are stronger than himself the germs of sin are fructified within his soul by the power of darkness before long his tragic situation is akin to that of macbeth at that moment when he said i am in blood stepped in so far that should i wait no more returning were as tedious as go over nikita a simple-minded labourer is working on the land of peter a well-to-do peasant he falls illicitly in love with peter's second wife anisia nikita has previously seduced an orphan girl marina his pious father akim deems him bound in duty to marry this girl but his evil-minded mother matriona thinks otherwise this wicked old woman gives anisia certain powders for poisoning her husband peter and these powders are employed effectively nikita deserts marina and marries anisia soon he sickens of her and seduces her stepdaughter akulina the child of peter by his former marriage akulina becomes in time the mother of an illegitimate child when this baby is born the strong-willed matriona induces nikita to slay it and to bury it in the cellar to avoid scandal akulina is subsequently offered in marriage to a trusting youth of the neighbouring peasantry the festivities however are rudely interrupted when nikita having been converted by the persistent power of his father's inarticulate religious faith insists upon confessing his accumulated crimes to the assembled multitude this play is appallingly dramatic in the constantly increased intensity of its successive scenes it is another macbeth composed in modern terms and reimagined in the mood of realism the characters are terribly true and the dialogue is impressively poignant end of chapter 21chapter 22 of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by warren bergman scene on the stage by clayton hamilton chapter 22 ibsen once again it is more than a dozen years since madame nazimova made her first appearance in the english language in the part of hedda gabler to students who were thoroughly familiar with the play her impersonation of this character seemed to be based upon a misconception but it was at least well rendered and the very novelty of a hedda conceived as sensuous and languorous instead of coldly and brilliantly intelligent resulted in a great deal of unmerited praise from the reviewers 
Madame Nazimova had been previously seen in Russian as Regina in Ghosts, a part that she has not yet played in English, and her Hedda was soon followed by a rendering of Nora Helmer in A Doll's House. Her Nora, in contradistinction to her Hedda, was satisfactory in all respects and established her beyond cavil as an Ibsen actress of a very high order. A year later, she played Hilda Wangel to the master builder of Mr. Walter Hamden, whose performance of this massive part was monumental in its rugged grandeur and amazed all commentators on the current situation by scoring a commercial success, which kept the theater crowded week after week with a play that had previously been assumed to soar over the heads of the public. Two years later, Madame Nazimova exhibited a memorable rendering of Rita Almer's in Little Eilf, and her performance of this character, particularly in the first act, touched the high-water mark of her achievement as an actress of Ibsen. Yet, since the spring of 1910, Madame Nazimova had not again revisited the glimpses of Broadway with any play of Ibsen's, until she was persuaded by Mr. Arthur Hopkins to undertake a series of Ibsen revivals in 1918. The word revival is somewhat insulting to the greatest modern dramatist, because it suggests that his plays have been at some time dead and have needed a miraculous resuscitation. Yet in a theater which has falsely set a premium on novelty, it has crept into common usage in the vocabulary of comment. The Ibsen season was inaugurated by Mr. Hopkins at the Plymouth Theater on the evening of March 11, 1918, with the first performance of The Wild Duck that had ever been offered in the English language in New York though an excellent rendition of this play had been previously given in the German language in January 1917, with that admirable actor Herr Rudolf Christians in the role of Yalmar Ekdal. In this production, Madame Nazimova assumed, for the first time, the minor but delicate and difficult part of the little martyred Hedwig, and acquitted herself with credit. Hedda Gabler was resumed, with less success, on April 8th and A Doll's House, the most popular of all the Ibsen plays, was triumphantly repeated on April 29. These Ibsen revivals were generously patronized, especially by the studious classes who frequent the cheaper seats, and A Doll's House crowded the Plymouth Theater to capacity. The response of the public gave ample attestation to the fact that a decade is too long a period to banish Ibsen arbitrarily from the theaters of Broadway. Madame Nazimova's impersonations are not by any means of even merit. According to the judgment of the present commentator, her Nora is in all ways satisfactory, her Rita is exceptionally admirable, her Hedwig is cleverly adequate, her Hilda is merely passable, and her Hedda is utterly mistaken. Yet all of her performances of Ibsen, good and bad, are worth seeing many times because even at their poorest they afford repeated opportunities for studying the masterpieces of the greatest modern playwright. When The Wild Duck was presented by Mr. Hopkins, it came to most of the audience as a new play, after a decade which had been strangely bare of performances of Ibsen, and the effect upon the public and the critics was remarkable. Mr. Hopkinson's method of production is founded sanely on the theory that it is better to leave a play alone to work its will on the spectator than to attempt to decorate or to embellish or even to interpret it. His stage direction is admirable not so much because of what he does as because of what he refuses to do. Simplification is his method and simplicity is his excellence. In producing The Wild Duck, Mr. Hopkins did not allow himself to be overawed by the gigantic reputation of the author. He directed the performance with the same freshness and, one might almost say, the same irresponsibility that he might have shown in staging a script by John Doe, a promising but quite uncelebrated playwright. As a consequence of this easygoing method, the audience was surprised to discover that Ibsen is enjoyable and that it is possible to buy tickets for an Ibsen play because of the incentive of a wish for entertainment instead of a desire for instruction or a solemn sense of duty. The Wild Duck, though grim in subject matter and truly terrible in its culminating moments, was conceived essentially as a sardonic comedy. As Mr. Edmund Goss has justly said, 
The topsy-turvy nature of this theme made Ibsen as nearly rollicking as he ever became in his life. The surprising thing, therefore, is not that the audience should laugh at Ibsen's rollicking, but that anybody should have been surprised by the spontaneity of this laughter. And even more surprising was the tardy discovery of the reviewers that The Wild Duck is genuinely enjoyable in the theater. Ibsen had lost much in the appreciation of the public from the accidental fact that his plays had been banished from our current stage for a dozen years. During the passage of this decade, he had come to be regarded, to state the fact conveniently in slang, as a sort of highbrow instead of a sure enough competitor for the plaudits of an avid audience with so practical a pair of playwrights as Mr. George Broadhurst and Mr. Bayard Vailer. Ibsen died in 1906. And now, for the first time, he is beginning to be appreciated in this country from the disinterested point of view of sheer dramatic criticism. So long as he was still alive, his plays were studied not as plays, but under the different labels of literature, philosophy, or sociology. The casual patrons of our theater were told that they should see his dramas because of a sense of duty and not because of the incentive of enjoyment. And in pursuance of this method, even so popular a piece as A Doll's House was heralded by many commentators as a sort of family funeral. The reason for this cul-de-sac, which pocketed for many, many years the popularity of Ibsen as a purveyor of entertainment, is easily apparent. Our native knowledge of Ibsen was imported overseas from England, and it was in England that the misconception of this author as a highbrow first originated. Ibsen was discovered for the English public by Mr. William Archer and Mr. Edmund Goss. But when these two enlightened critics endeavored to deliver their discovery, they found themselves impeded by the medieval institution of the British censorship of plays. Because of this impediment, the very first performance of an Ibsen play in England, that epoch-making production of Ghosts, which was shown in 1891 by Mr. J. T. Grine, before the private audience of the Independent Theatre Society, was regarded by the general public as a thing tabooed and flung beyond the pale. In consequence of this condition, the comments called forth by this first performance of a play of Ibsen's in the English language were based upon contrasting theories of ethics instead of being based on theories of dramaturgic craftsmanship. The reviewers missed the point entirely. Ibsen was criticized in the England of the early 1890s as a sociologist, a philosopher, a man of letters, a moralist, a propagandist, in short, as everything except the one thing that he really was, a practical and interesting playwright. His technique as a professional dramatist was not discussed, despite the repeated pleas of so appealing a dramatic critic as Mr. Archer. Instead, his commentators, pro and con, contented themselves with throwing mud or throwing roses against his subject matter, which is of course the last thing to be considered by a genuine dramatic critic in analyzing any well-made play. Not what an author says, but how effectively he says it in the theater is the proper theme for analytic criticism. For in the great art of the drama, the message of an author is superior to comment, and nothing offers invitation to the technical interpreter but the mere efficiency displayed, or missed, in the elocution of this message to the public. Because of the incubus of the British censorship, an impression was spread abroad throughout the 1890s that Ibsen should be regarded as a philosophic thinker and a man of letters, instead of being judged as a playwright ambitious to receive the plaudits of the theatre-going public. From the effect of this misconceived impression, our casual American audience is only now beginning to recover. Our local public is now learning, tardily, to see that Ibsen was a playwright, first and last, and all the time. The truth of the matter now, at last, appears to be that Ibsen was a very great artist of the theater, and was nothing else at all. Quite obviously, in the cold light of our later learning, he cannot be accepted seriously as a man of letters. He had no literary training, and he never acquired the advantage of a literary culture. In the decade of his teens, he did not go to school. In the decade of his twenties, he was not even registered as a regular student in the provincial university of Christiania. His entire education was not literary, but theatrical. At the age of twenty-four, he went to Bergen, 
as the general stage manager of a stock company in that isolated town. And in this capacity, he worked a dozen hours every day throughout five successive years. His annual salary amounted in round numbers to $300. And his apprenticeship may be understood most quickly if we face the fact that throughout the formative period of his youth, he exerted all his energies at a dollar a day to the task of setting forth a new play every week with a stock company localized before the public of a little city as secluded as Schenectady, New York. In these years of his apprenticeship, Ibsen had no time to read, and all that he could learn was acquired incidentally from his necessary business of presenting to the local Bergen public many French plays of the school of Scribe. His own first play of any prominence, Lady Inga of Ostrat, was written in emulation of the current formula of Scribe, and this minor but inevitable incident is indicative of the important fact that Ibsen's education was derived not from the library, but from the stage. Never at any time, in the midst of a perilous attempt to earn his living against agonizing odds, did Ibsen ever find the leisure to become a man of letters. In his twenties and his thirties, he read a few plays of Schiller and a few plays of Shakespeare, and at the same period he seems to have become more familiar than he was willing later to admit with both parts of Goethe's Faust. But to the end of his days he remained distinctly, and this fact became with him a point of pride, a playwright who knew next to nothing of the history of literature. Though most Norwegians are accustomed, as a matter of course, to study many other languages, Ibsen never acquired an easy fluency in any foreign tongue but German. Late in his life, he said to one of his Boswells that he hated all the plays of Alexander Dumas' Fils, and added the unexpected comment, but of course I have never read them. The last remark was presumably more candid than the first, for Ibsen, in his later years, was genuinely proud of the fact that he had read little except the daily newspapers. When commentators pointed out that the patterned formula of ghosts recalled the technique of Euripides, he would retort irately that he had never read Euripides. It was not until the time of the Italian tour which Ibsen undertook in the middle of his thirties that he ever actually saw any of the major works of architecture, painting, or sculpture that are existent in the world. At this belated moment he attempted, to employ a phrase that is current in the narrowly restricted world of professional baseball, a delayed steal of culture and his experience ran parallel to that of our own Nathaniel Hawthorne, who also made a pilgrimage to Italy at a time of life too long deferred. Like Hawthorne, Ibsen appreciated the wrong paintings, admired the wrong statues, and waxed enthusiastic over the wrong works of architecture. While showing the sensitized impressibility of a responsive temperament, he betrayed also the effects of an early education that had been exceedingly defective, even in responding to the appeals of such aesthetic regions as Rome, Sorrento, and Amalfi, Ibsen remained the stage director of a stock company in Schenectady, instead of rising to the rarer atmosphere of a stimulated man of letters. If Ibsen lacked culture in the realm of letters, and he frequently, when interviewed, insisted on the point that he was not well read, it is even more obvious that he claimed no standing whatsoever as a sociologist or a philosopher. He regarded himself as a playwright, first and last and all the time. That is to say, a craftsman whose task it was to interest the public by holding, as twere, a mirror up to nature in the actual commercial theater. His teacher was Eugène Scribe, that exceedingly adroit technician who codified the formula of the well-made play, la pièce bien faite and the contemporary of whose exploits he was most justly jealous was Alexander Dumas' fils, who, like himself, attempted in his own way to improve and to perfect the formula of Scribe. Ibsen was not a philosopher, for he was ignorant of the accumulated records of philosophic literature. The author of Brand and Peer Gint is not to be regarded primarily as a poet for he had never studied any other universally important poem except the first and second parts of Goethe's Faust. To sum the matter up, he should not be considered in any other light than as an honest craftsman of the theatre who endeavoured, in accordance with that downright statement of the practical Pinero, 
to give rise to the greatest possible amount of that peculiar kind of emotional effect, the production of which is the one great function of the theater. Because of the distressing influence of a medieval British censorship, Ibsen was long regarded in the English-speaking theater as a sort of Dr. Munyon of the drama, lifting loftily an admonitory finger to the moralists and crying, I'm for health! while his opponents countered with a puritanical assertion that his purpose and effect were merely to disseminate disease. Now at last, in consequence of the repeated efforts of Madame Nazimova and the new enthusiasm of Mr. Arthur Hopkins, the undertakings of this downright manufacturer of plays for the general and normal public are beginning to be appreciated at their worth, as compositions which require the disinterested admiration of all who seek to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the theater of the world. End of chapter 22 Read by Warren Bergman, Nina, Wisconsin February 5th, 2023chapter 23 of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by warren bergman scene on the stage by clayton hamilton chapter 23 two plays by st john g irvine john ferguson and Jane Clegg. If art may fairly be defined as life seen through a temperament, it follows that the flavor of a work of art must depend less upon the sort of life that is looked at than upon the sort of temperament through which it is observed. The mind of the artist is more important than his subject matter. This is particularly evident in the domain of painting. It did not matter whether Rembrandt chose to paint a chine of beef or the face of an old man. The result in either instance was a work of art, because it was sure to show the painter's incomparable eye for chiaroscuro. In the theater, the untutored members of the public are likely to judge plays by their subject matter, to patronize one piece because they like the story and to neglect another because the narrative does not appeal to them. But for the critical observer, there is matter of more interest in the way in which the subject is handled by the dramatist. A block of stone is but a block of stone. If it be hacked into a statue, its worth will depend on what the artist does to it. One man might mold a better work of art in butter than another man in beaten gold. Life, the subject matter of all art, is everywhere adjacent to us. For the price of a ticket to the subway, we may read a hundred stories and a hundred faces all about us. Only most of us don't do it. We lack the seeing eye. The artist sees. He makes life interesting to the rest of us by showing us a way of looking at it. The life that he shows us may be commonplace, but his vision is not. Velazquez might have painted a corrugated ash can with the uttermost fidelity to fact, Yet his picture would have been a thing of beauty, and in consequence, a joy forever. There are ways of looking at the play of lights and shadows on an ash can, eternal ways. Life, like a dome of many-colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. But the mind of the artist is a prism with a magic power to recompose the scattered colors of the spectrum, into a clear and focused beam of that eternal light that never was on sea or land. There is very little in the plays of Mr. St. John Irvine to catch and capture the attention of those untutored theatre-goers who are avid for something novel or something sensational in subject matter. Mr. Irvine deals with commonplace people, with people just as ordinary as the man who is crammed against you in a crowded hour of the subway and whom you never see and he contents himself with situations that are traditional. His dramas are, in subject matter, as old as the hills. Yet the aged and familiar hills of Cumberland were very beautiful when William Wordsworth looked upon them. When Mr. Irvine writes a play, it is more than likely to be worth traveling many miles to see 
for the simple reason that Mr. Irvine is endowed with a mind that is exceptionally fine. This mind is a sort of window through which we are permitted to look at life. A window is not at all an unfamiliar object, but there are windows and other windows in this world, and that is the reason why Keats wrote his memorable phrase about charmed magic casements opening. In the facetious epilogue to Fanny's first play, Mr. Shaw satirically put into the mouth of a dramatic critic, Flaunor Bunnell, the remark, If it's by a good author, it's a good play, naturally. That stands to reason. Who is the author? This remark was regarded as uproariously funny by the anonymous writer of Fanny's first play and by a diverted public that had solved the secret of this anonymity. Yet there is a grain of serious truth in this amusing statement after all. If a play is by a good author, it is more than likely to be a good play. Naturally, for authorship to the discerning counts more than subject matter and nearly everything depends upon the sort of mind through which the subject matter passes in its transit from the archives which contain the thirty-six dramatic situations, enumerated by the investigating Gotzi, to the attention of a gathered and receptive audience. A bad author might even impede the appeal of the subject matter of the Trojan women, which in the opinion of the present commentator is the most pathetic play in all the world whereas a good author may easily lift his treatment of an unpromising subject to the level of enduring literature. In support of this argument, it is necessary only to compare what German scholars call the Ur-Hamlet with the revised Hamlet of William Shakespeare. Mr. St. John Irvine is very welcome to our theater because of the simple fact that he is a good author. It is a fine adventure to be permitted to look at some familiar character or some traditional situation through the window of his mind. We go to the theater, not to hear what Mr. Irvine has to talk about, but to listen to Mr. Irvine and to enjoy his way of talking. Thereby we pay a tribute to the artist and recognize the merit of his mind. In Jane Clegg, the heroine, who is an ordinary woman, has wrestled for a long time with the not uncustomary problem of living amicably with a husband who is unworthy of her. Some years before the play begins, she had caught him in a flagrant case of infidelity. But because of her economic dependence on her husband, and the crying need of her infant children for support, she had condoned this offense and had accepted the promise of her husband never to repeat it. Henry Clegg is a commercial traveler. Incidentally, he is a liar, a gambler, and a thief. His wife discovers these regretted facts successively, as the plot develops. She has recently inherited the sum of £7,000 from a deceased uncle and is now able to support, in case of need, not only herself but also her two children. When her husband gets into trouble, she is willing to help him out, and to shield him from going to jail, she even consents to advance, out of her legacy, a considerable sum of money. But the soul of Jane Clegg rebels against the situation when she discovers ultimately that her husband, Henry, has been plunged into it by an ill-advised association with a fancy woman. Henry Clegg has planned to run away to Canada, on stolen money, with his mistress. When Jane Clegg has discovered this, she does not try to compel her husband to remain at home. Instead, she opens wide the door and forces him forth to face a questionable future with the woman of his fancy. The final scene of Jane Clegg is, of course, immediately reminiscent of that great colloquy which concluded at Doll's House. Yet the dialogue at many points is even more poignantly intimate. And the episode is made by the genius of the author to appear both unfamiliar and engrossing. The antecedent action is entirely traditional, yet its progress is exalted far above the level of the commonplace by the uncustomary note of sheer sincerity in the author's attitude of mind. What he mainly cares about is characterization, and his characters are almost discomfortably real. His careful depiction of Henry Clegg an absolute rotter, as the author calls him in the lines, is a masterpiece of sheer delineation, and all the other characters are drawn to the life. John Ferguson, by the same author, is a great play, because it discusses a momentous theme through a medium of realistic utterance which, though apparently commonplace, reveals the virtue of utter intellectual integrity. 
In common with many other great plays, John Ferguson deals anew with narrative materials that had already been worn threadbare in the theater before the date of its composition. There is no surer way for any gifted author to win fame in the theater than by repeating a familiar story and surprising the audience by telling the truth about it, in violation of traditional expectancy. In John Ferguson, we meet once more the ancient motive of the mortgage on the farm, the long familiar heartache arising from the letter mailed too late, the conventional story of the maiden wronged and the murder of the villain who traduced her and the subsequent juggling of credit for this murder between the weak man who, for moral reasons, ought to have committed it, and the strong man who, for practical reasons, actually did the deed. The inspired half-wit who wanders in and out of the story, inciting better brains than his to action, is also a traditional figure in the drama. There is no element of novelty in this narrative, nor in the handling of it, and there is nothing new nor unaccustomed in any of the characters that people the conventional pattern. Yet Mr. Irvine has portrayed these characters with an astonishing profundity of insight, and his story is set forth with such sincerity and fervor as to convince the auditor that it is absolutely true. John Ferguson, considered solely on the basis of its subject matter, might be dismissed as old stuff to use a rather vulgar phrase that is popularly current in the theater. But this composition cannot rightly be regarded as old stuff when it is considered from the point of view of any commentator who is willing to delve beneath the subject matter to the theme. In one of the most memorable lines of modern poetry, Mr. Alfred Noyes has paid immortal tribute to the splendor of the indifference of God. And this magnificent indifference of an hypothetic deity to the personal concerns of even his most faithful servants affords the basis for this tragedy by Mr. Irvine. Here is a problem of perennial importance, a problem which, in fact, has evermore perturbed the foremost religious thinkers of mankind. In harmony with the famous syllogism of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, Matthew Arnold defined deity as the eternal not ourselves we are absolutely certain of our own existence and we are reasonably certain also of the existence of another power not ourselves that dominates the universe but matthew arnold added another phrase to his formula and by so doing appended an uncertainty to a reasonable certainty his full definition reads the eternal not ourselves that makes for righteousness that deity invariably makes for righteousness, as righteousness is humanly conceived, is an assumption that cannot be proved by logic and appears to be controverted by experience. The late William James pointed out the difficulty of imagining a God that is less just than the great and noble men that have imagined him. Yet if there is a supreme mind that dominates the universe, this deity may often be accused of dealing unjustly or seeming to deal unjustly with individual human beings. Virtue is not always rewarded, nor vice punished, in this world. The rain falls and the lightning strikes upon the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The noblest of mankind is hanged upon a cross, while villains prosper and leave fortunes to a church. Our own finite sense of justice would be more punctilious. Great thinkers dream of deity in the abstract, as the eternal not ourselves, but ordinary minds, accustomed to concreteness, require an image more tangible than that. They take their own most admirable attributes and imagine a deity in which these attributes are raised to the nth power. Thus God is evermore created in the image of man. Primitive people worship idols with a human body, but this body is represented as larger than life, more powerful, more terrible, more beautiful. In later stages of civilization, idol worship is discarded, and people progress from imagining a god with a human body to imagining a god with a human mind. This transition has been indicated in Dante's famous statement, Thus the scriptures speak of God as having hands and feet, but mean far otherwise. But though the tendency of this imaginary process points unerringly toward the ultimate abstract, the average mind, accustomed to concreteness, as birds to the air or fishes to the sea, 
is incapable of conceiving a deific mind that must be something other than a human mind, raised only to the nth power. Thus God is spoken of as he or him and not as it, though the impersonal pronoun would be more logically applicable to the eternal, not ourselves. The common concept of deity is still, at the stage of thinking to which mankind in general has climbed, conveniently and irremediably anthropomorphic. God is still created in the image of man and worshipped as a man, raised mentally to the nth power. The wise Goethe stated that even the most skeptical must be required to admit that the human mind is necessarily anthropomorphic when confronted with the problem of imagining a god. Thus, men in general have continued to speak of the eternal not ourselves in human terms, as God the Father, God the Mother, God the Brother, God the Friend. Yet a moral problem of profound importance arises when this not ourselves neglects to exercise toward human beings the beneficent functions of a parent, or a brother, or a friend. Either this neglect is real, or else it is merely apparent. But in either case, it is disturbing to men whose faith has been founded on the normal concept of a God endowed with a basically human mind. Our great religious dramatists from a very early period have seized upon this logical dilemma as their theme. Consider the book of Job, for instance. Job is a blameless man and a faithful servant of his God. Yet this very God afflicts him in a manner that must appear incomprehensible to any finite mind. At the climax of Prometheus Bound, which was written by Aeschylus, the most loftily religious of the tragic poets of ancient Athens, the hero who represents mankind, though chained to a rock and doomed to endure the torture of vultures gnawing at his liver, talks back to Zeus, who represents the eternal, not ourselves, and says, Although you are more powerful than I, I am more just than you. This defiance, so to speak, was flung in the face of God by suffering mankind two thousand and five hundred years ago, and it is not blasphemous to say that God has not yet justified his ways to man throughout the searching of all subsequent poetic literature. John Ferguson resembles the book of Job in the basic fact that it exhibits in detail the progressive torture of a blameless man by an eternal not ourselves that the hero himself believes to be not only just in judgment but also kindly in intention. John Ferguson, a peasant of Northern Ireland, is a faithful Christian of the Protestant persuasion. He believes in a personal God who is his father and his friend and he serves this God with absolute fidelity. He strives to love his enemies. He deliberately does good to those who have deliberately done him harm, and, when smitten on the one cheek, he stoically turns the other to his adversaries. Yet the very deity, or destiny, in which he trusts, for the names applied to the eternal not ourselves have differed in different centuries and lands, brings down his gray hairs with sorrow to the grave, accumulating horrors upon horror's head despite the innocence of his deserving. Truly this Irish peasant might cry aloft with Greek Prometheus, I am more just than that which tortures me. Instead he bows his head in penitence and kisses the rod wherewith he is chastised. John Ferguson, like Job of old, has led a blameless life. But through an illness incident to his advancing years, he is no longer able to work his farm. His farm is mortgaged to Henry Witherow, a hard man who seeks an early opportunity to foreclose the mortgage. John Ferguson appeals to his brother Andrew in America to send the necessary money to save the farm. Andrew sends the money, but carelessly forgets the mail day. Therefore, the money order arrives a fortnight too late to avert the terrible consequences that already have arisen from its non-delivery. When the belated letter comes, a maiden has been ruined, one man has been murdered, another has been jailed, and still another is stalking free with the guilt of murder on his conscience. Thereupon, the ruined girl cries out to her pious father, God's late da! 
and the seeming blasphemous ejaculation is one of the most terrible and tragic lines in modern dramatic literature. Why should God be late if God is both omniscient and all-powerful? This is the abiding question that none of our prophets nor our poets has ever yet been able to answer to the satisfaction of the seeking soul. Preachers try to put us off with the assurance that God knows better about such little matters than we do, and that we should be satisfied with the assertion that the eternal not ourselves works often through mysterious ways to make for righteousness. But this answer sounds like something said to quiet children. It lacks the ring of that eternal truth which moves the sun in heaven and the other stars. John Ferguson, in form, is a realistic play, and it fulfills its realistic function by reporting faithfully the facts of life as they might have occurred to a typical peasant family in County Down in the period of the 1880s. But in spirit, it is a poetic tragedy, whose basic theme is a thing to be considered not of an age but for all time. There is nothing either new or old in the idea of a tragic struggle between a just man and an unjust God. This idea was formulated by the dreaming Hebrews of old time. It was illustrated by the ancient Greeks, and it has come down through the ages as the greatest question that has never yet been answered by religious thought. Mr. Irvine, acknowledging his intellectual alliance with Aeschylus and with the author of the book of Job, has provided his drama with a chorus in accordance with the ancient pattern. He has managed to do this very cleverly, without disrupting the matter-of-fact appearance of his realistic composition. The play opens and closes with a reading from the English Bible, delivered as a matter of habit by the Bible-reading hero, and at each successive crisis of the action, this pious Irish peasant reaches naturally for his Bible and reads a verse or two aloud. The passages selected are chosen from the Psalms of David, and aesthetically they afford to the passage of the drama the same sort of philosophic and poetic commentary that was provided in ancient days by the choruses of Aeschylus. The plot is carried out by ordinary people, but every now and then the voice of God comments upon the plot through the medium of an ancient but eternal poet, David, King of Israel. End of chapter 23 Read by Warren Bergman Nino, Wisconsin February 24th, 2023chapter 24 of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by betty b scene on the stage by clayton hamilton the jewish art theater during the last 3 decades new york has developed from an essentially american city to a cosmopolitan metropolis in addition to many other elements, it now contains within itself the largest Jewish population that has ever been assembled in one place within the compass of recorded time. More than a million Jews, most of whom are recent immigrants from Eastern Europe, are now congregated in that section of Manhattan, which bulges eastward from the Bowery and stretches an arm across the bridge to Williamsburg. And this is a bigger population than Jerusalem could boast of in the heyday of its glory in the political sense these people are americans for most of them have been naturalized as citizens of the united states and their votes as individuals count just as heavily in a popular election as the votes of woodrow wilson william howard taft or any of the sons of theodore roosevelt but these newcomers to the melting pot are alien in race in religion in language in customs and in culture and a critic of the arts while not denying the validity of their participation in our body politic will find it most convenient to consider them as foreigners they print their own newspapers and they conduct their own theatre in a language that can neither be read nor understood by americans whose ancestors were born in this country and for the average citizen of the older stock a study of the ghetto of new york will be just as revelatory of other times and lands as a visit to the most foreign of foreign cities overseas. The language of this gigantic community of congregated Jews 
is not hebrew but yiddish hebrew is a scholarly and ancient language like greek or latin that has to be studied from books but yiddish is a comparatively recent speech that is still in the making it is derived from old high german but the grammar has been debased the vowel sounds have been vulgarized and the vocabulary has been cluttered with accretions from the slang of every country to which in recent centuries the jews have wandered yiddish has no historic standing as a learned language and to foreign ears it sounds acidulous and sharp it would seem to be unsuited for literary purposes yet a considerable yiddish literature has sprung into existence within the last quarter of a century both for the library and for the stage and the geographical center of this new creation is new york many of our citizens of older stock may be surprised to learn that in several communities of europe which we have never heard of new york is now revered as the center of yiddish culture in the current world it is an old joke of ours to regard the jews as primarily avid for money whereas they are not nearly so penurious as certain races like the scots nor so thrifty as certain other races like the french the fact is that the jews are primarily avid for culture they will go to any effort to educate themselves in new york they crowd the city college and overflow into columbia they are voracious readers and large listeners they are more like goethe's faust who desired a monopoly of learning than like marlowe's barabbas who desired a monopoly of wealth man to man they are better educated than their anglo-saxon fellow citizens of equal station and this fact is proved by their artistic undertakings and accomplishments the greatest glory of the largest jewish city of all time is the yiddish theatre and this theatre though young in years demands the serious consideration of disinterested critics the first important yiddish dramatist to win a place in history was the late jacob gordon whose career attained its climax about twenty years ago of gordon and his works i may speak with a certain authority for this author was an intimate friend of mine and i adapted into english with the valuable assistance of mr samuel shipman a play of gordon's entitled the kritzer sonata which subsequently served as a vehicle for several seasons for the late blanche walsh gordon was a russian jew and when he came to this country he was obliged to learn the yiddish language which was new to him he was an enormous bearded creature with large eyes and he looked as if he might be carrying a bomb in the pocket of his overcoat yet in reality he was a kindly and domestic person he lived when i first knew him in the bronx and afterwards he lived in brooklyn he was the prolific author of a hundred plays in yiddish a thousand stories and articles in russian and german and yiddish and fourteen children who have become americans and several evenings a week he used to deliver lectures on learned subjects in german or in yiddish to educate his people he made money from his plays but he always gave his lectures for nothing his plays were written in pencil in three cent copy books beginning at the back and working forward to the front he would write you a play whenever it was needed in a week or two the plots were seldom original like moliere gordon took his own where he found it but he would easily domesticate an old plot from shakespeare or from plautus or from alphonse daudet among the jewish people and employ it as a framework for an authentic study of jewish characters his plays were always veritably yiddish before he was through with them i used to admire gordon mainly for his copiousness for he was a giant like old duma who never grew tired at all and always got things done in detail he was a realist his observation was meticulous and his records were exact i could never judge his dialogue because i was too lazy to learn yiddish or even to study out the hebrew alphabet with which yiddish is recorded twenty years ago when gordon ruled the yiddish stage his innumerable plays were illustrated up and down the bowery by many able actors adler kessler moskowitz mrs kalich all of whom i knew and valued in the adventurous early days of the yiddish drama for instance i was one of the many people from uptown whose pleadings finally persuaded mrs kalich to learn the english language and to transfer her activities to the american stage since jacob gordon's day the yiddish theatre has developed 
it was always true in its report of life but latterly it has grown beautiful as well an obvious improvement has been made in the departments of scenery and lighting which were neglected by the busy gordon as subsidiary matters new authors like david pinsky who have come to us from europe are more poetical than gordon new actors like ben ami are more poetical than kessler the yiddish theatre mounts and mounts how does it now stand in comparison with our american theatre which is controlled by mr schubert and mr erlanger both of whom are jews this question when submitted to a disinterested critic may be answered very quickly the yiddish theatre in new york is now superior to the american theatre in new york at nearly every point the american theatre is aimed at money-making but the yiddish theatre is aimed at art the yiddish theatre is more cultivated and more cultured and this achievement has been registered by a group of people who have been resident among us for only a quarter of a century if we choose to regard these people as foreigners we are condemned to take our hats off to them but to remove the hat is a salutary exercise for it reminds us to respect the grand old name of gentlemen the marvelous growth of new york along lines that have been indicated has recently been emphasized by the taking over of the garden theater by an incorporated company entitled the jewish art theater many of us who have not yet attained the dignity of middle age remember the old garden theater as the place where we used to go to see the unforgotten mansfield and the unforgettable irving now this auditorium is raucous with the sharp and acid accents of the yiddish language yet undeniably the panorama that is exhibited upon the stage is more beautiful from the artistic point of view than most of the visions of life that are offered nightly in the newer theatres that are clustered in the region of times square the growing tendency of the yiddish people to overflow their foregone boundaries might imaginably have been resented if their advent in madison square had not been marked by an appreciable contribution to the art life of the metropolis but it would be absurdly uncritical to entertain a prejudice against the jews so long as the jews are able to equal or excel us in the art of the theatre the first artistic director of the jewish art theatre was emmanuel reicher mr reicher has long been recognized as one of the ablest actors and most progressive directors of the german stage he was the original exponent by arrangement with the author of several leading parts in the plays of ibsen and he was one of the initiators of the important movement which resulted in the organization of the deutsch frei buna in his direction of the jewish art theatre he has shown us something which requires a salutation the idol in die puste kretschme is a romantic folk comedy by peretz hirschbein a russian jew who has recently been allured to migrate to new york as the mecca of yiddish culture in the current world the play itself is singularly simple the name of the heroine is maita and maita loves her cousin itzik but maita's father named bendet abhors his nephew itzik because he suspects him of being a horse dealer bendet formally arranges a marriage between his daughter maita and Leibisch, but itzik spirits maita away and elopes with her then ensues a primordial scene set in a lonely place in a forest in which the passionate love of these two fugitives approaches its fruition they are separated by a bevy of pursuers led by their parents but subsequently in the end of all they are reunited the whole play is admirably acted the leading man ben ami reveals a sculptural sense in the handling of his body that reminds us of the greco-roman the leading woman celia adler is passionate and appealing and a female veteran named bina abramowitz contributes a mellow performance of the mother of the heroine the scenery is positively beautiful and the lighting is impeccable but the hand of a great directive artist emmanuel reicher is most clearly shown in the second act this act exhibits the wedding ceremony which celebrates the undesired linking of maita to Leibisch. throughout my long experience of going to the theatre I have never seen a crowd so admirably handled everybody seemed alive at every moment and i was reminded by this ensemble scene of the lasting reputation left behind them by the sax meiningen performers whom i never saw
because their work was done before my time no group acting so generally excellent as that of the second act of the idle inn has been shown within my memory at least upon the american stage end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org scene on the stage by clayton hamilton a great american play beyond the horizon by eugene g o'neill a little while ago i received a letter from a young gentleman who was serving as stage director for a stock company in a small provincial city stating that he quote, wished to acquire a complete knowledge of the art of writing plays unquote, and asking me to tell him how to do it it had not occurred to him apparently that his question might be difficult to answer i told him in reply that out of every hundred men who started out with his desire one or two might eventually find out that they were veritable playwrights whereas the other ninety-eight or ninety-nine would eventually find out that they were not and that these discoveries on the one hand or the other might be arrived at in a hundred different ways one man's meat would be another's poison some aspirants might be benefited by studying mr william archer's admirable textbook entitled playmaking others might be aided by taking courses with professor george pierce baker of harvard or professor brander matthews of columbia but still others might do better by following in the footsteps of mr george m cohan and eschewing universities and libraries i receive so many letters of this kind that it has sometimes occurred to me that the best and quickest way to answer them would be to write a book telling frankly what i know of the successive steps in the careers of several playwrights younger than myself whose gradual development i have been privileged to witness intimately if ever i should undertake the writing of this visioned volume an important chapter would have to be devoted to the work of eugene g o'neill eugene o'neill has been recognized for several seasons as the ablest author of one-act plays in the united states this reputation for doing much in little was established for him by the provincetown players the washington square players and other little theatre groups throughout the country and it was subsequently tested and affirmed through the secondary but more searching medium of publication the first full-length play by this promising young author has been awaited by the critics and the public with an eagerness that as usual has been underestimated by the managers beyond the horizon a tragedy in three acts was written in nineteen seventeen in nineteen eighteen an option to produce it was purchased by mr john d williams at the suggestion of mr george jean nathan our commercial managers often recognize a good play when they read it but after paying down five hundred dollars to tie it up they seem to have a habit of putting the manuscript in a pigeonhole forgetting all about it and allowing their rights to lapse mr williams to whom the public is indebted for many excellent productions appears in this particular regard to be no wiser than the rest of them it was owing mainly to the enthusiasm and to the dauntless energy of an exceptionally worthy actor mr richard bennett that this play was hailed out of the pigeonhole and presented to the public for the first time on the afternoon of february fourth nineteen twenty this long-awaited three-act tragedy was immediately recognized by all the critics as a great play and the public agreed with the critics in this extraordinary verdict in the whole history of the american drama not more than half a dozen plays have been set forth to which this ultimate adjective might be applied yet beyond the horizon is a great play and eugene o'neill who wrote it is a great dramatist he is still very young and much may be expected of him in the future yet should he die to-morrow these words might be inscribed upon his tombstone here lies an american author who gave the theatre a great play whenever an artist has achieved greatness many inconsiderable people hasten forward with anecdotes beginning with the time-worn formula quote, i knew him when unquote. it is not in this spirit that i would presume to write about eugene o'neill but that recent letter from the ambitious stage director of a stock company in a provincial city reminds me that the solemn and yet rather futile question which he earnestly propounded was asked of me some years ago 
by the prospective author of Beyond the Horizon. I am reminded also that the career of Eugene O'Neill is pregnant with many lessons, and I am tempted now to tell a little of what I know about it, if only as a way of answering future letters from youths who, quote, wish to acquire a complete knowledge of the art of writing plays, unquote. Eugene O'Neill, though the son of a famous actor, had never shown any aptitude or inclination for the stage. He had been, in many ways, a hard boy to manage. His father had dutifully sent him to college, but at the outset of his undergraduate career, Eugene had run away and gone to sea. He had roamed the ocean as an ordinary seaman in the forecastle. He had risen after many months to the estate of an able seaman in the service of the American line. He had ultimately been recaptured and brought home. The question now was what to do with him. Eugene was, evidently, a bad boy, and I was asked, if possible, to find some good in him and to devise some method for developing this good. I looked the lad over. He had large and dreamy eyes, a slender, somewhat frail, and yet athletic body, a habit of silence, and an evident disease of shyness. I had nothing to suggest. His father decided to adopt a punitive process that approached imprisonment. He left the lad alone throughout the winter in a quiet little boarding-house that overlooks the harbour of New London, and told him to behave himself. Eugene told me when I returned to my summer home at New London in the spring that he had been trying to write one-act plays, and asked me how to do it. "'Never mind how plays are written,' I advised him. "'Write down what you know about the sea and about the men who sail before the mast. This has been done in the novel. It has been done in the short story. It has not been done in the drama. Keep your eye on life, on life as you have seen it, and to hell with the rest.' He was always very shy about his writing, and I never pressed him for confidences. At last he asked me to look at some of the things that he had written, with a view to determining a possible disagreement between himself and his father upon the delicate point of his worthiness to be tolerated any longer by an already overstretched parental patience. I read some one-act plays about the life at sea, which so few people in this country of landlubbers know anything about. I decided not to tell Eugene how good they were, nor how promising they were, but I told his father. Eugene thought it might be a good plan to study playmaking with Professor Baker at Harvard. Mr. James O'Neill was hesitant, because this wayward boy had run away from college once before. I put in a plea, and the matter was arranged. I wrote to Professor Baker, and before many months I was gratified to learn that Eugene O'Neill was far and away the best of his pupils. When the one-act plays of Eugene O'Neill began to be produced and published, I was myself astounded at their power. Two points in this record appear to me especially important. The first point is that Eugene O'Neill began his work with a reservoir of real experience to draw from. The best thing that he ever did was to run away from college and to ship before the mast. The second point is that Eugene O'Neill has always written with eyes focused upon life, instead of writing with eyes focused on the theatre. A few years ago he transferred his residence from New London to Provincetown. In Provincetown he lives, cheaply and primitively, in a little cottage which is rooted in clean earth and offers a wide vista of the teeming and tumultuous sea. He knows nothing, hears nothing, and cares nothing about the theatre market that is centred in Times Square. He does not spend his days upon the doormats of the magnates of 42nd Street, hoping that they will ultimately pay him $500 to get rid of him. He does not spend his leisure hours lunching at the Knickerbocker, hoping to pick up an easy job of adapting a French farce to an American setting, or turning a forgotten American farce into a musical comedy. He neither needs nor desires money, because he has never been accustomed to its uses. Like Strickland in The Moon and Sixpence, he can tell the world to go to hell. He can think his thoughts and dream his dreams in loneliness beside the surging and suggestive sea, and he can write great dramas which the silly little world that is centered in Times Square can subsequently look upon with wonder. The inherent greatness of Beyond the Horizon is so subtle and elusive that it can scarcely be suggested by a summary of the plot. The play tells once more the dramatic story of a struggle between two brothers of contrasted temperaments, but these antithetic brothers, instead of hating each other, as they did, for instance, in The Master of Ballantrae, 
love each other ardently to the very end of the tragedy andrew and robert mayo are the two sons of james mayo a typical farmer of new england andrew was born to the soil and has already shown an aptitude for the soil he loves the farm he loves to plunge his hands into the cleanliness of the ancestral earth robert however knows nothing and cares nothing about farming ever since his early boyhood he has entertained a vague ambition to wander far beyond the horizon hedged in by the engirdling hills and to see the wide world that has been sung about in books of poetry robert's long desired chance to break away is presented to him when his maternal uncle captain scott of a sailing bark named sunda offers him a berth for a prospective voyage to many islands on the other side of the map on the eve of his departure robert is deterred by the unexpected confession of a neighboring country girl ruth atkins that she loves him more than she loves his brother andrew robert stays behind to marry ruth and the disappointed andrew sails away in robert's stead aboard the sunda it is soon shown that these decisions were mistaken robert unaccustomed to the soil makes a mess of the farm the more practical andrew makes a success of his undesired career at sea ruth soon grows to hate her husband for his inefficiency and grows to admire the more able brother that she might have married the conduct of the farm at home drifts downward from disaster to disaster and when andrew at last returns from his long wanderings it is too late to save the situation his beloved brother robert is dying of consumption robert's wife the tired ruth has developed a longing love for andrew whereas this stalwart adventurer in many regions has long ago forgotten his infatuation for ruth and nothing is left for anybody but to let the dead past bury its dead and to mourn a multitude of might-have-beens as spectators we are invited to witness the creeping decay of a family and to acknowledge that nothing could possibly be done to avert the catastrophe that was predestined there is no villain in the drama the guiltless characters are destroyed by the antipathy of their environment this play is peculiar in the fact that its effects are derived exclusively from the requirements of character and are never derived from the suggestions of theatrical artifice there is scarcely a moment in the drama which might be praised for sheer theatrical adroitness the author evidently knows enough about the theatre's ways to scorn the usual expedients that are productive of applause at every curtain fall what he cares about is life and a patterning of life as he has seen it and he cares not at all for the conventional formulas that may be current in times square where the horizon of the dramatist is more restricted than it is in provincetown the people of this play are absolutely real and utterly alive the action is absorbing from the outset and though slow in movement is accumulative in its tensity the dialogue is masterly in its simplicity and in its strict fidelity to character here is a play of which americans may well be proud it is the first great tragedy that has been contributed to the drama of the world by a native american playwright End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of seen on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org seen on the stage by clayton hamilton booth tarkington is a playwright it is both a privilege and a pleasure as they say in after-dinner speeches to welcome mr booth tarkington after many years of waiting into the limited group of authors who have made authentic contributions to our american dramatic literature the winner of the pulitzer prize for the best american novel of nineteen eighteen has long been recognized as one of our leading men of letters but ever since he wrote the man from home with mr harry leon wilson his plays whether planned alone or in collaboration have been nearly always disappointing the very critics who have praised most heartily his novels and short stories have regretted with the friendliest concern the apparent obfuscation of his talent when he has turned it to the service of the stage though a first-rate fiction writer without question mr tarkington has hitherto appeared as a third-rate playwright but recently in clarence he has written a comedy that is equally admirable as drama and as literature 
and the friendliest and most regretful of the critics of his past performances upon the stage have tossed their hats aloft in a loud hurrah for the ingratiating tark he has learned at last to launch over the footlights the magic that he has long been able to convey through the less complicated medium of the printed page hitherto the problem with the tarkington plays has been twofold for in the first place the author has not controlled his audiences and in the second place the author has not controlled his actors yet the actors and the public are the two subsidiary factors to an acted play that must be dominated by the author if he aspires to be respected as a dramatist in the case of the man from home for instance the audience was permitted to run away with the piece and to reverse the satirical intention of the authors both mr tarkington and mr wilson have repeatedly asserted to their friends that in this play they meant to poke fun at a typical man from kokomo by projecting him incongruously against a conventional background of european aristocracy and that they were very much surprised when our provincial public proceeded to regard this amiable roughneck as a sort of patriotic hero if mr tarkington a dozen years ago had been more familiar with the psychological reactions of the theatre-going public he would have understood that this reversal of his original intention was the one thing that turned a poor play from a failure into an astonishing success and if mr tarkington and mr wilson had been more familiar at that time with the technique of the drama they would have understood the reason why the public turned the whole thing topsy-turvy which was merely that whereas they took the pains to draw their man from kokomo with the uttermost fidelity to life they neglected to play fair with the other side of the contention and allowed themselves to represent the european aristocracy by a group of conventional lay figures made of straw mr tarkington has often apologized to his friends for the popular success of the man from home and has insisted that the sins of the public should not be heaped upon his shoulders and those of his collaborator but any playwright who permits the audience to run away with his piece and to overturn his own intention is not a master of his craft stimulated to renewed activity by the huge success of this initial effort messrs tarkington and wilson if one may judge the matter solely on the basis of the evidence proceeded for several seasons to regard the theatre as a joke at any rate these exceptionally able novelists turned out a subsequent series of bad plays in quick succession and seemed to be surprised when these left-handed pieces went down one by one to speedy failure thereafter came a time when these two collaborators both renounced the theatre as a bunch of sour grapes and decided to devote their sole attention to the more artistic task of writing novels but mr tarkington despite his real success in the realm of published fiction was never cured completely of his hankering for reputation in the theatre alone or with collaborators he has returned to the task of making plays again and yet again and the fact that he had grown to regard this task with a new seriousness became evident when he began to remonstrate against the adverse verdicts published by many of his personal friends among the professional critics of our current drama he tried so earnestly and tried so hard to make a play that should be worthy to be classed in the same artistic category with his own best novels and short stories that at times he convinced himself that he had turned the trick and allowed himself to be distressed when he received an apparently habitual hatch of adverse reviews we must now consider the second difficulty that has hitherto obstructed the career of mr tarkington as a dramatist he has not only failed to control his audiences but he has also neglected to control his actors with an artistic intention in his mind he has frequently permitted this intention to be vitiated by miscasting or by other manifestations of incompetence in the employment of the current theatre as a medium of expression it is not sufficient for an author so worthy of regard as mr tarkington to deliver a manuscript to a producing manager and let the matter go at that a dramatist should love the theatre well enough to spend his days and nights within its walls throughout the perilous period of rehearsals 
and he must finally be held responsible if the wrong actors are permitted to deliver to the public a wrong interpretation of his characters mr tarkington has sometimes complained because his regretful critics have judged his efforts for the theatre on the basis of the shown performance instead of on the basis of his unrehearsed manuscript but the business of the dramatic critic is to interpret what he sees on the stage not what he might have seen if the author had selected other intermediary artists to convey his message across the footlights clarence is far and away the best piece that mr tarkington has ever written and this veritable artist who years ago and for a little time seemed tempted to regard the theatre in a mood of airy cynicism should be prompted by the huge success of clarence to reward an ever-waiting public with other comedies as fine as this despite its title this comedy is primarily a study of a family and to draw a lifelike picture of a family is a task of greater difficulty than to draw half a dozen lifelike portraits of unrelated individuals to students of psychology the family must always remain one of the most interesting and one of the most puzzling of social institutions it is natural for human beings to seek and choose their friends the search is lifelong and choices are continually made from childhood up out of a thousand people we pick one as a companion because he is more congenial to us than any of the others with him we choose to share uncounted hours and count those moments wasted when we are interrupted by any of the multitude of our acquaintances friendship is so rare and wonderful a thing that any one is lucky who is able in an average lifetime to discover half a dozen different friends but the family throws people together by the unreasonable accident of consanguinity and often holds them together without choice sometimes they are friends more often they are not and in the latter and more common case the institution of the family imposes upon them a fictitious pretense of friendship brothers and sisters who are not at all congenial and who never in the world would have chosen each other as companions are brought up together in an intimacy which under these circumstances might almost be regarded as indelicate more often still an utter lack of friendship exists between parents and their children in the first place they are too far apart in age to understand each other and in the second place since most families are either rising or declining through the generations a son of twenty-five and a father of fifty belong very often to different levels of society under these circumstances crabbed age and youth cannot live together the imposition of an unnatural intimacy among people who are not congenial with each other results in a great deal of insincerity and insincerity is bad for the development of human character yet the family is so respected as an institution that very few novelists and dramatists have had the courage to describe it as a breeder of discontent and a deforming force in the development of individual character sir arthur pinero has so described it in his house in order and again in that bitter and sardonic masterpiece the thunderbolt which failed in the theatre because the average spectator regarded it as too unpleasant mr bernard shaw has also more than once set up the social institution of the family as a target for satirical attack mr tarkington in clarence is more genial he has shown us a family with all its faults yet the individual members of this family are all distinctly likable and we gather the impression that it is rather good for them to be forced to live together in an atmosphere of uncongeniality be it ever so hateful there is no place like home and the constant bickerings of the wheelers are made tolerable by the fact that each member of this family is always able to laugh at the foibles of the others the wheeler family consists of mr wheeler a wealthy business man of middle age who lives in englewood new jersey his son bobby and his daughter cora both of whom are in their teens his second wife who is too young to be their stepmother and a level-headed governess who is too pretty to collaborate without embarrassment in the necessarily intimate task of bringing up his children 
none of these people are capable of understanding any of the others and none of them would have chosen the others for friends if the accident of consanguinity had not flung them together in an intimacy that is hard to bear mr wheeler is able to conduct his large and intricate business without difficulty but he is utterly unable to conduct his family there is never a peaceful moment in his house in inglewood bobby has been expelled from three schools for shooting craps and is now threatened with a suit for breach of promise for having kissed the housemaid and cora has compromised herself by running off to a midnight party at the country club with a grass widower whom she regards romantically as the great love of her life when the distressed father of these madcap children confers confidentially with the governess about the best means to bring them to their senses he excites the unreasonable jealousy of his second wife even in his office in new york this magnate unperturbed by business worries cannot find a moment's peace for his sanctuary is invaded by the various members of his family and its customary atmosphere of calm efficiency is disturbed by raucous bickerings and unreasonable tears in a desperate moment mr wheeler impulsively decides to try an experiment which might have been recommended to his mind by some wise and calm philosopher this experiment is nothing more nor less than to introduce an utter stranger into the bosom of his family and to find out what will happen when the jangled members of his household are required to adjust themselves to this new and unknown personality fortunately an utter stranger is conveniently at hand in the person of a slouching private recently discharged from the artillery who has been sitting around for a couple of days in mr wheeler's outer office meekly asking for a job his given name is clarence but his last name remains a mystery till the end of the play because in the first act he is interrupted over and over again by mr wheeler's bumptious children while he is attempting to give it for purposes of record to mr wheeler's secretary clarence is soon installed in mr wheeler's household in a status that hovers vaguely between that of a servant and that of a guest he is adored by bobby and by cora as a hero of the great war and the admiration of these young romantics is not lessened when clarence tells them modestly that he was dragged into the army by the draft that his entire term of service was spent in driving army mules in texas instead of driving germans through the argonne forest and that his wound stripe was earned when he was accidentally shot in the liver at target practice these eager adolescents choose clarence as a welcome repository for their confidences because he has been in the army and has seen life as it really is and the unheroic private with the ailing liver listens quietly to their intimate confessions and gives them the same sort of worldly wise advice that they would not accept from their father their stepmother or their governess or indeed from any other person than an utter stranger clarence quickly shows himself to be a handy man about the house and makes himself equally useful as a plumber a piano tuner and an entertaining player on a borrowed saxophone he is soon adored by the dissatisfied stepmother of the family who is persuaded by this new interest in her nervous life to renounce her habitual tyranny of tears the governess finds it more difficult to make him out but that is merely because she loves him at first sight and hates herself for fearing that she might be fool enough to feel afraid that she might love him if of course she were not such a steady-headed governess a woman in other words whose calm sagacity could always be depended upon to arrest the slightest hint of waywardness in her emotions it is almost superfluous to report that this sagacious hesitant is the woman doomed by destiny to marry clarence at the end of the play the modest and mysterious clarence becomes more and more charming as the comedy proceeds it is essential to the pattern of the play that the richness of his personality should be revealed only gradually to the audience as this richness is presented bit by bit to the appreciative comprehension of the various members of the wheeler family everybody on both sides of the footlights is agreeably surprised when the slouching person who had seemed so ill at ease in an ill-fitting army uniform 
comports himself as an indubitable gentleman when he suddenly appears in a newly purchased suit of evening dress who is this plumber and piano tuner who is so sympathetic that he understands all confidences and can straighten out the most intricate of human entanglements without apparent effort it turns out in the end that clarence is a famous entomologist and that his final name is smith and the anti-climax of the second revelation relieves the climax of the first clarence in the good old english phrase is both a scholar and a gentleman and though in the end of all he steals away the governess after the most delicious proposal scene that has been written by any dramatist within the memory of the present commentator he leaves the wheeler family not only happier but wiser for his passing clarence as the ticket-buying public immediately proved is a play whose merits are easy to enjoy but it is not a piece that can be easily catalogued by the critical commentator and assigned to a definite place on the five-foot shelf of plays to be remembered one would hesitate to call clarence a great comedy because it seems to lack the bulk and weight that are suggested by the connotation of this ultimate adjective but it is a very fine comedy and in the drama the attribute of fineness is even rarer than the attribute of greatness to write a big scene in which a tragic heroine chews the carpet is easier by far than to write a running current of delightful comment on the humorous events that crop up every day in a typical american family mr tarkington's characters in clarence are manifestly true he has been especially successful in delineating bobby and cora the spoiled children of the wheeler family but this achievement perhaps is not surprising in view of the fact that mr tarkington has long been recognized as our leading literary authority on the psychology of adolescence the piece is more than adequately patterned but a slight shuffling of the order of the situations might possibly result in an appreciable augmentation of theatrical effectiveness in a couple of cases incidents that call down curtains might better have been disposed of in the middle of an act yielding prominence of place to other situations that are clearly more emphatic but the dialogue is so delightful that it tempts the commentator to repeat that enthusiastic phrase of ruskin's beyond all praise it is continuously humorous yet not a line of it could be quoted as a joke apart from the context the funniest things that are said appear to spring spontaneously from the characters under spur of the successive situations and the audience laughs not for the easy reason that the puppets are so witty but for the rarer reason that they are so human in clarence mr tarkington has succeeded from the outset to the end in evoking from the public the rich response of recognition so fine a play as this which does not even aspire to be considered great may finally be classed in the same category with such minor classics as the mollusk by hubert henry davies a little thing done well is more impressive than a bigger effort bungled clarence in both bulk and weight is but a little thing so is a cameo so is a pearl but the surging tide that washes down huge images in the sand cannot dissolve a pearl end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by seraphina scene on the stage by clayton hamilton the athenian drama and the american audience before the invention of printing there were few books in the world but all of these were worth reading so long as every extra copy of a literary work had to be written out by hand on parchment a certain care was exercised lest this lengthy labor should be wasted over words that were ephemeral the romans greeks and hebrews were human like ourselves and liable to human error they must have uttered every day 
the usual amount of trash, and this trash must have been passed about, from mouth to mouth, among the masses. But the ancients did not write it down. They allowed their trivial words to die, unknelled, uncoffined, and unknown, and they recorded in their libraries only those more memorable words that were luminous with intimations of immortality. The library of Alexandria was burned. Herculaneum was buried beneath an overwhelming flood of lava, and comparatively little now remains to us of ancient literature. But what remains is not ancient, in the narrow sense, and nearly all of it is really literature, that is to say, in the noble phrase of Emerson, a record of man thinking, and expressing his thoughts in unwitherable words. The invention of printing, and the enactment of that modern law which compels everybody willy-nilly to go to school and learn to read, has led to a widespread circulation of recorded utterances. But how many of these documents are literature? And those of us who ply the pen so busily in these days of rapid printing might profitably pause every now and then to ask ourselves whether we have ever written a single sentence that deserves to be engraved on granite and preserved from the erosion of innumerable future centuries. How much of our contemporary writing will be accepted finally as literature in the leisure of all time? The ancients felt a more reverent respect for books and authors than we entertain today, but they had more reason for this feeling. They were not poisoned by a state of things that accords a million readers every morning to the hirelings of Mr. William Randolph Hearst and reduces John Milton to what, in the profane vocabulary of our friends, the French, is eloquently called the name of a name. The ancients saw things in perspective and proportion. They never pretended, not even on the eve of a popular election, that all men are created equal. They announced, instead, that certain men were nobler than their fellows and were worthy, by inherent right, of being listened to attentively. The Greeks gave prizes for literary prowess, and when a man had won a public prize for authorship, he was erected to the aristocracy and considered a leading citizen. The ancients regarded their greatest authors as divine, and spread abroad the legend that these supermen had spoken to mankind with the authentic voice of God. The Hebrews accepted Isaiah not only as a poet, but also as a prophet, and claimed that he wrote better than he knew. The Romans believed that Virgil was not merely a perfect artist, but also an unconscious mouthpiece for the deity of deities. And after the slow passage of a thousand years, the greatest composition of the greatest man that ever lived was immediately called, not by himself, but by his readers, the Divine Comedy. There was no real reason, on the other hand, why this title should not have been selected by Dante himself, since he has told us more than once, with the serenity of perfect confidence, that the things he had to say were suggested not by his own mind, but by the irresistible and overwhelming inspiration of all the things that are. We are living now in an age of infidelity, when it is popular to laugh at high and far-off images of holy things, but we have no reason to dismiss as merely credulous the belief of our forefathers that their greatest poets were inspired from above. Without departing from the region of the intellect, it would be easy enough to prove that Dante is indeed, in a certain sense, divine, and there is also a reasonable motive for accepting several of the Hebrew writings, which have been gathered helter-skelter after many accidents of time into the canonical fold of the Old Testament, as authentic utterances of some power that is greater than ourselves. The Romans held a superstition, to repeat a word that has grown current in our present period of cynicism, that Virgil was so wise that he had hidden away an answer to every imaginable human problem in some passage of his Aeneid, and common men in need of guidance were advised to open his heroic poem blindfold, to place a finger on an accidental passage, and to read this passage as a mystical, oracular response to their imaginative inquisition. This pagan incantation is not yet outmoded. It is still possible to trust the ancient writers for an answer to our modern questionings. And, in these times of trouble, 
we may profitably turn to the tragic poets of the period of Pericles. Why is it that any so-called modern play, which is revived after an interval of only twenty or thirty years, seems nearly always irretrievably old-fashioned, while any adequate production of a play originally written in the age of Pericles appears always, in the phrase of Robert Browning, strange and new? This question is not difficult to answer. The Greeks, in contemplating any subject for a work of art, sought only and sought always for inklings of eternity. By imagination they removed their topics out of space, out of time, and regarded them from the point of view of an absolute and undisrupted leisure. They sought, in any subject, not for the transitory hintings of the here and now, but always and only for indications of the absolute and undeniable. By deliberate intention, they wrote, not of an age, but for all time. Another point to be recalled is that the tragic dramatists of ancient Athens were never tempted to pursue the ignis fatuous of novelty. No playwright, in those high and far-off days, was ever expected or permitted to invent a story. The Athenian dramatists dealt only with tales that had already been familiar to the public for a thousand years. Their function was, as artists, to extract a new and unexpected truth from the elucidation of an ancient fable, and not to catch the light attention of the public by the sudden flaunting of some flag of novelty. The augustness of Greek criticism may be measured by the fact that the Medea of Euripides took only a third prize in Athens in the year 431 BC. It was probably too modern or too revolutionary to satisfy the honorable judges who accorded the first prize to Euphorion, the son of Aeschylus. If Margaret Anglin had accomplished nothing else, she would be entitled to a vote of gratitude for proving that there is a large and eager public in this country which is willing to pay money for the privilege of seeing the tragic dramas of the Greeks. For Miss Anglin's first performance in New York of the Electra of Sophocles, on the afternoon of February 6, 1918, the house was crowded to the roof, and it must be remembered that Carnegie Hall is capable of seating more than 3,000 people. Miss Anglin was required, by a popular demand that was literally undeniable, to offer half a dozen repetitions of the Electra of Sophocles and the Medea of Euripides, and for each of these matinee performances, the gross receipts amounted, in round numbers, to six thousand dollars. There is always a great public for great art, and this Miss Anglin knows. She has taught our public also that Sophocles and Euripides are not dead names, to be listed merely in card catalogues of dusty libraries, but living names of living playwrights, fitted to arouse the emotions of a public young and eager for sensation. Like all great artists, Miss Anglin is gifted, quite uncommonly, with common sense. She understands the simple point, which has escaped the notice of innumerable scholars and professors, that the Athenian public attended the drama not in answer to the call of duty, but in answer to the call of pleasure. The aim of the theatre is not instruction, it is merely entertainment, and the most high-minded dramatist tries only to overwhelm the members of his audience with an awareness of God being with them when they know it not. Euripides and Sophocles are not aloof and distant, like the highbrows of this present time, for, in their own day, they fraternized with common men and sought to entertain the inarticulate but nonetheless appreciative gallery of helots who could neither read nor write. In ancient Athens, the original production of a play was an event that is comparable, in contemporary terms, to the staging, in New York, of the opening game in a series, to determine the world's championship in professional baseball. In the year 431 BC, the first prize for tragedy was accorded to Euphorion, the second to Sophocles, and the third to Euripides, for the composition of four plays, one of which was the Medea. When these prize-winning plays were acted, the whole town shut up shop and took a holiday, and sat upon the southern slope of the Acropolis to see what could be seen, and to enjoy whatever happened to be offered for enjoyment. These people, human like ourselves, 
they did not congregate by thousands in pursuit of education they assembled naturally in pursuit of entertainment they went to the theatre to be interested and excited and enthralled and in that typical season which is numbered now by scholarly historians as the first year of the eighty seventh olympiad euphorion and sophocles and euripides earned the prizes they had won by compelling the audience of a heterogeneous public which never numbered less than twenty thousand heads for any one performance miss anglin having seized the spirit of greek tragedy has decided that the thing to be pursued is not the interest of archaeology but the interest of immediate theatrical appeal she has handled the recorded text of euripides and sophocles as if these ancient dramatists were contemporary and were standing at her elbow throughout the tentative period devoted to rehearsals she has never allowed herself to think of either of these authors as any less alive than sir arthur pinero or mr augustus thomas or any less responsive to the predictable reactions of a contemporary audience she has discarded the mask and the cothurnus and many other minor and mechanical conventions of the ancient drama but she has preserved the wonder and the sting miss anglin's interpretations of euripides and sophocles were first disclosed in the summer of nineteen fifteen in the greek theatre at berkeley california rumors began immediately to drift eastward that she had discovered a couple of young authors who promised in due time to be accepted on broadway the present writer among others in the east received letters at the time which told the tale miss anglin had imagined for the end of the electra a bit of business that was thoroughly in keeping with the high intention of the dramatist orestes according to the orderly progression of the play has entrapped aegisthus and challenged him to fight a duel for his life the young avenger marches the elderly murderer off stage to the blood bedewed halls of agamemnon from this heroic region beyond the boundaries of the visible scene there comes a noise of the clash of steel on steel and of the groans and grunts of supermen engaged in mortal combat this sound is listened to by lone electra clad in dismal rags who looms before the audience as a pillar of cloud awaiting fearfully the outcome of the combat between the man who is her brother and the man who is her father's murderer off stage there arises in due time a cry of agony and then there comes a silence and a pause then from out the portal of the house of agamemnon is hurled the sword of the vanquished this token clatters hurtling down a stairway of enormous length electra shudders away from the symbol of defeat then stealthily she climbs down many steps to examine it with anguished curiosity with a wild cry she catches up and flings the thing aloft for she has recognized it as the sword of the hated murderer aegisthus then at last she dashes it beneath her feet and tramples on it with a tardy sense of triumph this point of high dramatic tensity concludes the play when miss anglin first presented the electra of sophocles in berkeley california this final moment was received with utter silence no hands were clapped together in the entire auditorium a friend of mine was standing in the wings and he told me in a letter that was written at the time that he heard miss anglin say aloud i've failed my god i've failed then after an appreciable pause there came a noise that sounded like the rushing of tide at mont st michel this noise was compounded of the cheering from ten thousand throats louder and louder grew the acclamation until it seemed to shake the skies then suddenly the stage itself was assaulted by hundreds and hundreds of clamorous spectators they swarmed about miss anglin and strove to touch her fingertips one old man whose face was bathed in tears tore his own hat into shreds and tossed the pieces high into the air that was what he wished to say in tribute to a dramatist who had been dead and buried for two dozen centuries a critical comparison between the electra of sophocles and the medea of euripides is apparently demanded in the present context but this comparison is difficult to make for many centuries it has been assumed 
as a common place of commentary that sophocles was a greater playwright than his younger rival yet this assertion has been challenged by such ancient critics as aristotle and such modern critics as goeth the final truth appears to be that sophocles was more abstract and general in his formulation of the records of experience and that euripides was more concrete and more particular in consequence of this distinction euripides now seems more modern and sophocles now appears to be more classical to my own mind the distinction between the two may be symbolized most quickly by reference to the cognate art of architecture sophocles reminds me of the parthenon and euripides reminds me of the corinthian temple at nimes the strength of euripides is based upon the particularity of his appeal to those personal and individual reactions which in every period appear to be most timely but the power of sophocles is founded on the generality of his appeal to emotions which are absolute and therefore beyond the reach of any hint of time euripides in his medea a comparatively early composition which two thousand three hundred and fifty years ago was accorded only a third prize in athens proclaimed and trumpeted the new insurgence of downtrodden women against dominating man some of the choruses of this play as translated by professor gilbert murray appear to have been written a year or two ago as feminist documents inspired by the modern insurrection of subjected women in listening to lines like these it is difficult for any auditor to realize that euripides has been dead for more than twenty centuries he appears to be with such a keen degree of militance a prophet of our own contemporary period it would be easy enough to argue that sophocles in his electra has surpassed in sheer dramatic power the appeal that was subsequently made by euripides in the medea but this traditional and scholarly adjudication would be divorced from the verdict of the contemporary public as a matter of record there can scarcely be a doubt that the theatre-going public of new york prefers the medea of euripides to the electra of sophocles for one thing our modern audience understands more easily the motives of medea who is actuated by jealousy and by the fury of a woman scorned than the motives of electra who is actuated by the incentive of blood vengeance and by an irrefragable belief in that eternal not ourselves that makes for righteousness and for another thing the modern audience is moved more easily by emotions that seem to have been dated from the present hour than by emotions that seem to be untimely because they have originally been imagined without reference to any thought of time euripides still appears to us as he seemed long ago to aristotle the most tragic of the poets but sophocles is more august and monumental in the architecture of his plays end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton A Reminiscence of the Middle Ages Guibor The neighborhood playhouse at 466 Grand Street, New York, has been the mecca of many memorable pilgrimages ever since its doors were first opened to the questing public by the beneficence of of Alice and Irene Lewison. But nothing that has ever been shown at this theatre has excelled in interest the presentation of Guibor, a French miracle play of the 14th century, which attracted overflowing audiences three nights a week throughout the months of January, February, and March 1919. This play was first acted in the year 1352, precisely 250 years before the initial performance of Shakespeare's Hamlet by a confraternity called the Puys, which was partly ecclesiastical and partly literary in its character. It was planned as one of forty items in a cycle of religious plays, all celebrating in one way or another the miracles of the Madonna, and its content is indicated by the traditional subtitle, Un miracle de Notre-Dame, 
Comment del Garda une femme d'estrée à l'arzé. The recent resurrection of this medieval drama was sponsored and directed by Yvette Guibert, who also played the title part and thereby made her first appearance as an actress on the English-speaking stage. As an actress, Madame Guibert, of course, is not so utterly incomparable as she is within the limits of her own unique and special art as a disuse, and her ear for English is not by any means so fine as her ear for French. Yet, despite the incidental handicaps to which she willingly submitted, she delivered a performance which was monumentally impressive. Representative artists of this caliber are not born more than once in a quarter of a century, and it is nearly so long as that, since Modjeska died and Deuce retired from the stage. In this performance, Madame Guibert was supported by many able and enthusiastic amateurs, including the Mrs. Lewison, the versatile young artist, Rollo Peters, L. Rogers Lytton, and Margarita Sargent. No professional company could possibly have rendered this old drama with so many indubitable indications of a genuine love for the occasion. The scenery and costumes for the production of Guibor were designed by Robert Edmund Jones, and, despite the current fame of this successful artist for the stage, it may be said with candor that he has never done anything more fine, in composition or in color, than his imaginative investure of this relic of a bygone age. The incidental music was gathered by Madame Guibert from her ample library of medieval sources, and this music was beautifully rendered by choral singers trained by Edith Quayle. Especially impressive was the singing of Richard's Hale, a young baritone endowed by nature with a gorgeous voice and equipped by study with a trained ability to use this great voice to the best advantage. The English version of the old French text was ably written by Anna Sprague MacDonald. The presentation of Guibor was, in every respect, so satisfactory that the only matter which requires comment from the critical reviewer is the inherent importance of this rather artless composition, which was written down by some nameless and forgotten author, or syndicate of authors, more than a half thousand years ago. In the first place, it may be stated that any veritable revelation of medieval art is greatly to be desired in this country at the present time. Alone among the mighty nations to which the predetermination of the future of the world has been allotted by the falling of the dice of destiny, our own country stands naked as a nation without a past. The ordinary citizens of England, France, or Italy, as they go about their daily business, walk beneath the shadow of many monuments of the Middle Ages, and are constantly reminded of the past by some gigantic relic like the Cathedral of Canterbury, the Cathedral of Amiens, and the Cathedral of Siena. In this country, we have inherited no cognate monuments of a world that used to be. Our most venerable buildings date merely from the 17th century, and most of these are being ruthlessly torn down in the interest of progress. Ancestrally, we Americans, if we count our lineage from a common atom, are just as old as the English, the French, or the Italians, but we are more in need of opportunities to recollect our ancient origin than our cousins overseas. In actuality, the modern world is too much with us, and it is difficult for us to trace back the tendrils of our best imaginings to the rich, dark soil of the world that used to be. To remind us vividly of the state of mind of our forefathers, we need a resurrection of the medieval drama more emphatically than an exhibition of this sort could possibly be needed by the contemporary public of Italy or France or England. Guibor is exceedingly important to the theater-going public of New York, by virtue of the fact that it reminds the audience that there was a theater-going public in the civic squares of France more than a half thousand years ago, and that the world was very much alive before the date of the discovery of America. In studying any work of medieval origin, we should remember always that the art of the Middle Ages was calculated carefully to appeal to a public that was illiterate. Throughout the thousand years which extended from the triumph of Christianity over the Roman world in the 4th century to the beginnings of the Renaissance of ancient culture, in the 14th century, nine-tenths of all the people who were born and buried in Europe passed through life without ever learning to read or write. 
literacy was reserved almost exclusively for the clergy, and, practically speaking, the only people who could read and write were dignitaries of the church. This, of course, is the main historic reason for the absolute supremacy of the church over the minds and hearts of the common people of the Middle Ages. Any ordinary citizen was required to believe what was told him by the priests, because he was cut off, by his lack of education, from the privilege of appealing, through any other medium than the church, to the written records of the accumulated wisdom of mankind. The church, as the sole custodian of literary learning and the chosen teacher of the vast literate populace throughout a thousand years, rendered in the main a good account of its stewardship. The people could not read. The people had to be taught. Therefore, it was necessary to teach them through the easily intelligible symbols of concrete art. Here we have the motive for the tremendous efflorescence of Gothic architecture, which forces modern critics to their knees to pay obeisance to the Middle Ages. John Ruskin was happily inspired with a phrase when he called the greatest monument of Gothic architecture the Bible of Amiens. It was indeed a Bible, a sacred book made up of many sermons writ in stone. And these sermons were so concrete, and therefore so intelligible to the unlettered mind, that it might be actually said that any one who ran might read them. All that the church could tell about the past, the present, and the future, the miracle of life and the mystery of death, and the triune ideal of beauty, truth, and righteousness, three in one and one in three, was trumpeted through solid stone to all the passing generations that were born and buried within the visible radius of this towering cathedral. Although the drama, as an art, had been excluded from the world for more than a thousand years, and that is the main reason, the present scribe is fain to think, why the centuries in question have been frequently labeled by learned historians as the Dark Ages, the church decided, in the 12th century, to reinvent the drama as the most effective medium through which the illiterate public might be convinced of the essential truth of many myths and legends of what may be described most quickly as the propaganda of medieval Christianity. This newly reinvented drama immediately scored a popular success, and the enthusiasm of the public was so obvious that, when the daily overturning of the calendar had whispered its way into the 14th century, the church and its affiliated organizations of representative men of letters were actively engaged in nearly every European country in pushing the drama as the most direct and therefore the most effective means of inculcating certain fundamental truths into the minds of an uneducated but eager and avid public. To this enthusiastic season of the 14th century, Guibor belongs. Its characteristic as a work of art are similar to those of any representative example of medieval architecture. It is simple, homely, direct, concrete, and, from the point of view of the more sophisticated modern mind, naive. This old play is surprisingly alive because it reveals an almost astonishing intimacy with life as it was actually lived in that far century which brought it forth. But, at certain moments, when it appears to appeal for a degree of credence that is difficult for the modern commentator to concede, you should remember that it was originally written for a public that had never read a book. In Victor Hugo's monumental novel, Notre Dame de Paris, there is a famous passage in which a medieval priest, holding in one hand a copy of a newly printed book and sweeping the other hand in a gesture toward the vast cathedral, announces, Si, si, tu la, cela. The invention of printing was destined to supersede the function of medieval architecture. It is no longer necessary to erect Bibles in stone to edify a public that is fed with information by newspapers that issue eight or ten editions every day. Our modern laws, which impose a common school education on every individual without even consulting his desires, bequeath a greater potency upon the printed words of a propagandist than can ever be achieved by any such announcement of a religious theory through the medium of lasting stone as has been imagined by the anachronistic projectors of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. The popular promulgation of the printed word has swiftly undermined the more specific and more concrete appeal of medieval art. Sisi tira cela. Printing will kill architecture. 
This prediction has been justified by the event. But any example of the drama of the Middle Ages should be judged by a contemporary critic not according to the theoretic terms of our modern printed literature, but according to the terms of that more explicit medieval architecture which was designed to convey eternal messages to a running public unacquainted with the special craft of reading. Any such expression must be homely and intimate and quite unblushingly naive. Guibor fulfills with ease these rather remarkable requirements. It is so simple in its thought that any child could understand it. It is so homely in its method that it reveals a memorable picture of the daily life of a French town in the Middle Ages. And it is so deliciously naive in mood that it calls forth the sort of sympathetic smile with which we accompany the patting on the head of a lovely and appealing child. One of the most delightful traits of the medieval public is that, being richly human, this public was quite illogically inconsistent in its moods. One point about the great art of the Greeks which is impressed upon us most emphatically is that these supermen, and the world may nevermore be privileged to look upon their like again, could think only, and feel only, in one way at any predetermined moment. The Parthenon is absolutely holy, and no man may laugh irreverently when the moon is looking down upon it, under pain of being stricken dead by the drastic anger of the gods. But every Bible that was written in stone by the medieval builders exhibits many passages whereby the running observer is invited to laugh aloud at some emphatic abnegation of the sacred mood in which the edifice, considered as a whole, has been conceived. To the mind of the present commentator, no other habitual detail of medieval art is so impressive as the simple and almost childish sense of humor that is ascribed continually by all the artists of the Middle Ages to the god that they revere abjectly. Guibor, which is a typical example of the religious drama of the 14th century, appears, at many points, naive and funny to a modern audience. But the thing to be remembered by the commentative audience is that this childishness of humor was not accidental, but intended. Writers of the Middle Ages, who plied their pens for the benefit of those who could not read, were not endeavoring to set the gods of their imaginations lofty above Olympus, but were trying rather to bring these gods within familiar converse with these citizens who wandered daily through the marketplace. The Virgin Mary, in Guibor, gives quick expression to a clearly appreciable sense of humor, and so do her attendant angels. This expression did not seem incongruous to the medieval mind. The reverent, unlettered people of the Middle Ages were wisely taught to laugh before they died, because death was fleeting, but laughter was immortal. To the modern observer, trained by recent accidents to a more consistent singularity of atmosphere, this fine example of the medieval drama is perhaps most interesting by reason of its multiplicity of moods. It salutes us with eternal laughter on its lips as a thing that is not at all afraid to die. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Scene on the Stage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. The Grandeur of English Prose. The Book of Job. Robert Louis Stevenson, in a letter written from Vailima, in December 1893, to Henry James, stated that his two aims in fiction might be described as, first, war to the adjective, second, death to the optic nerve. As a stylist, he regretted the growing tendency of the age to receive impressions through the eye alone. A public overfed on newspapers and magazines soon learns to skim them rapidly in search of subject matter and this faculty for gathering the content of a printed page with a single stroke of the eye is applied subsequently to the reading of books. Nothing could be more stultifying to an appreciation of either verse or prose than this pernicious practice. 
for verse and prose are auditory arts not visual and must be listened to and even murmured with the lips in order that their patterns may be appreciated to the optic nerve alone no remarkable appeal is made by such a sentence as dr quincy's moonlight and the first timid tremblings of the dawn were by the time blending but if this phrase be read aloud with loving intonation a notable appeal will certainly be made to ears that have not forgotten how to hear perhaps the most important function of stuart walker's portmanteau theatre is to remind a rarely listening public of the historic grandeur of our english prose the plays that he presents make patterns for the ear and might be appreciated by the blind this fact is now exceedingly unusual because the entire tendency of the theatre throughout the last half century has been in the contrary direction the contemporary drama has made a sort of fetish of the fact that it appeals primarily to the optic instead of to the auditory nerve it was developed by ibsen and his many staunch successors in a period of realism and in the interests of realism our recent dramatists have exerted the most punctilious literary tact in the effort to prevent themselves from writing any lines that might sound at all literary when spoken by the actors on the stage our contemporary drama for the most part is not written in verse nor even in prose it is written instead in conversation and the most successful playwrights of the present period are those who like sir james barry in england and mr george m cohan in america have mastered the difficult and tricky craft of writing lines that seem to catch and utter the casual drift of unpremeditated colloquy even romantic and poetic dramatists like maurice Maeterlinck have adopted the current habit of addressing themselves primarily to the eye instead of to the ear and have grown to rely more largely upon the visible appeal of scenery and lighting than upon the audible appeal that might be made by the whispery and slippered footfall of soft syllables or the fanfare of a trumpet blast of rhetoric truly our plays in general have become again like little children in the proverbial sense that when good they should be seen and not be heard but mr walker has at last discovered a romantic and poetic dramatist who still dares to write in prose who still prefers to appeal to the listening ear instead of twanging at the optic nerve as the capiadors of spain flaunt flaming cloaks to capture the attention of the charging bull since the passing of his fellow countryman john millington singe who was endowed with the eloquence of angels lord dunsany is the only dramatist who has appeared in the english-speaking theatre to remind the public of the grandeur of our ancient english prose even barry who began life as a man of letters has preferred to write his dialogue in conversation and even bernard shaw for all his literary wit has preferred to pretend that he was faithfully reporting the unpatterned speech of a generation that had never read aloud the exordium of milton's areopagitica the history of english prose like the history of english blank verse may be traced back to a great beginning along a single and undeviating line blank verse began in english in fifteen eighty eight with the drums and tramplings of tamburlaine the great the previous essays of surrey and sackville in this medium were really not important it was marlowe alone who moulded for us our enduring mighty line the new footfalls introduced successively by shakespeare milton fletcher shirley cowper wordsworth tennyson and stephen phillips are merely variations from a standard norm wherever english verse is chanted and listened to among the far-flung millions that engirdle the revolving world the accents of that aureoled and flame-haired youth who was slain by a serving man in fifteen ninety three at the early age of twenty-nine are still predominant and overwhelming english prose analogously dates backward along a direct undeviating line to the king james translation of the bible 
which remains for all time the greatest monument of prose in any modern language the nameless men who actuated by no foresight of posthumous celebrity built up verse by verse and chapter after chapter that amazing monument of literary art plucked unconsciously the loftiest of laurel wreaths and set it as a crown upon the brow of anonymity our earliest deliberate organists of english prose john milton and sir thomas brown played merely the same tune that had been already orchestrated by these nameless predecessors and it is not at all excessive to say that no man since the outset of the seventeenth century has ever learned to write great prose in english unless his ear had been trained from early childhood to appreciate the orchestral voluntaries of sir thomas brown de quincey and stevenson were brought up according to their own confessions on the religio medici ruskin and rudyard kipling according to their own statements were brought up on the english bible and no man apparently has ever yet attained a mastery of english prose whose ear in early childhood was not habitually trained to appreciate the slow dark march of measured and majestic syllables that was applauded in the high and far-off times of that curious and futile english king who patronized the arts and wrote a treatise on tobacco these remarks have been occasioned by stuart walker's production of the book of job in the eloquent english version of the king james translators this piece is probably the oldest dramaturgic composition still current in the theatre of the world and its very antiquity is clearly worthy of reverence it is constructed very simply and with unquestionable grandeur from the modern point of view it must be admitted however that the action is excessively subjective nothing seems to happen externally upon the stage before the very eyes of the spectators but everything happens instead within the souls of job and his assembled collocutors to the modern mind this internal and analytic method of setting forth a great dramatic theme is less impressive than the synthetic external method which was employed by the reigning dramatists of ancient greece the book of job despite its philosophical augustness can never touch the modern heart so poignantly as the trojan women of euripides but the book of job in that historic english version which was sent to press three centuries ago by an anonymous committee of immortal men of letters that had been assembled by an arbitrary fiat of king james was written with a grandeur of great prose that must remain for ever unforgettable so long as men have ears for hearkening end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of scene on the stage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org scene on the stage by clayton hamilton the laughter of the gods there is no longer any doubt that lord dunsany is a great dramatist though his first play in point of time the glittering gate was written so recently as nineteen o nine like the dawn at mandalay his reputation has quote, come up like thunder unquote. and in a single decade he has given proof that his dramatic works are destined to be lauded by generations yet unborn no other recent dramatist with the single exception of his fellow countryman john millington singe has been accepted so quickly by the critics as one of the immortals lord dunsany is the most original playwright who thus far has appeared since the nineteenth century was laid away in lavender his work seems strange and new because instead of striving like most of his contemporaries to always be up to date he prefers to contemplate the momentary deeds of time through the telescope of eternity in an age of realism he has dared to blow a brazen trumpet to announce a resurrection of romance in a scientific age he has dared to regard the universe with a mind that is essentially religious he has reverted to the immemorial method of inventing facts to illustrate a certain truth 
instead of employing the customary modern method of imitating actuality in a faint and far-off effort to suggest the underlying essence of reality he has imagined and realized a mythic world quote, some while before the fall of babylon unquote, which is more meaningful in utter truth than the little world that is revealed to the up-to-date observer of a harlem flat or of a hired room in houston street he has introduced into the practice of our modern theatre that enormous stage direction which robert louis stevenson wrote in eighteen eighty three in a personal letter to william ernest henley quote, a stately music enter god unquote. but now that lord dunsany has reached the age of forty it is necessary also to remark that the expression of his genius has thus far been confined within technical limits that are comparatively narrow a certain sameness is observable in all his plays a sameness in subject matter in structural method in mental mood and in literary style this consistency may be considered by his critics as a merit or a fault according to their point of view it is clearly possible to laud an artist for the fact that every page that he has ever printed was obviously written by himself and could not have been composed conceivably by any other author yet on the other hand there is perhaps a larger merit in the fact that it would be difficult to identify by internal evidence alone the author of falstaff's scenes in king henry the fourth parts one and two with the author of the tragedy of hamlet thus far lord dunsany as a dramatist has confined himself to the composition of one-act plays his only more extended effort alexander has not as yet been published or produced he has we hope a long career before him but on the evidence available on the occasion of his fortieth birthday it is not at all unfair to regard him as exclusively an artist in the one-act play just as edgar allan poe is fixed in history as exclusively an artist in the short story the strong point with both of these technicians is the intensity with which they are able to focus the imagination on a single definite and bounded project of the panorama of experience each of them is willing to sacrifice in range what he is able to gain in terrible intensity poe was not a novelist and lord dunsany has still to prove that he can build successfully a three-act or a four-act play both men can seize a big idea and see it steadily but this is a very different endeavor from seizing a great handful of experience and trying hard to see it as a whole in considering this technical detail enthusiastic students of the plays of lord dunsany should be warned against the error of being led astray by the unimportant fact that in the published text of the gods of the mountain the three successive episodes are headed by the captions the first act the second act and the third act nor by the corresponding fact that the laughter of the gods is announced upon the program as a play in three acts in the case of these two compositions and also in the case of king argumenus and the unknown warrior the momentary pauses in the action must be considered technically as the same sort of pauses for the sake of emphasis that were customarily marked with asterisks by guy de maupassant during the course of many of his most notable short stories the one-act play is distinguished technically from the full-length play not by the time required for its presentation nor by the number of its pauses marked naturally by the dropping of the curtain but by its purpose and its mood the purpose of the one-act play is to produce a single dramatic effect with the greatest economy of means that is consistent with the utmost emphasis and its mood is derived reasonably from a central insistence upon that factor which was finally phrased by poe as quote, totality of impression unquote. considered technically the laughter of the gods like the gods of the mountain which preceded it by seven years is not a play in three acts but a one-act play in three successive episodes of the one-act play lord dunsany is an absolute master just as poe and guy de maupassant are utter masters of the short story the technical resemblance between the irish dramatist and the american inventor of the modern concept of the short story as essentially an exercise in sheer constructive skill has not yet been sufficiently commented on but it may be easily established if the studious reader will compare the text of the queen's enemies with the text of the cask of Amontillado. but it is only in his structural technique that lord dunsany at all resembles poe in his ever more recurrent theme 
the inevitable overcoming of the drastic sin of pride or hubris by the primal power of ananki or necessity he is allied more closely with the ancient greeks and in his literary mood the irish dramatist more nearly resembles the belgian maurice maeterlinck than he resembles edgar allan poe these matters may be easily defined by commentative critics but the only bother is that lord dunsany has apparently been willing through several years of wonder and waiting to accept this easy labeling instead of breaking out and startling his admirers by doing something unexpected his latest works have not been disappointing on the other hand he has always satisfied a foreordained prediction by doing precisely what had been expected of him but it might have seemed a little more adventurous if the author had managed somehow to launch something so different from all his antecedent compositions that it could not possibly have been foreseen the laughter of the gods is not so august a composition as the gods of the mountain nor so thrilling a fabric as a night at an inn but it emphasizes the same theme that was announced in these antecedent compositions when a theme is really great there can be no critical objection to a repetition of it witness for example the ever more recurrent projects of the florentine painters who immortalized the great age of the renaissance but it is always a little disappointing to catch a great man at the age of forty in the act of writing what appears to be an imitation of his past endeavors the laughter of the gods a big play in itself would have seemed more overwhelming if it had not been anteceded by other and greater renderings of the same project by the same artist but comparisons as dogberry remarked are odorous and for the benefit of those who have not yet been privileged to witness this latest exhibition of the art of a playwright of indubitable genius it is desirable to report the plot of the laughter of the gods in the high and far-off times when babylon was something other than the echo of a name there dwelt a king called carnos in the metropolitan city of babul el charnak a teeming city lauded by men of many nations as a wonder of the world but this king grew weary of cities and moved himself with all his court to a lonely palace in the jungle seat of thek where wild beasts might be hunted in the heat of the day and where at the creeping on of twilight a million orchids paled to purple beneath a silvery sky in his jungle seat of thek the king was well contented for the region cooled his thoughts like the laying of soft hands upon a tired brow but his courtiers grew restive and desired to return to the teeming city of babul el charnak the ladies of the court were discontented because the single little street of thek which soon ended in the jungle was devoid of shops in which to spend their money and their time and they besought their husbands to persuade king carnos to take them back to the metropolis whither merchants were wont to bring their wares from all the corners of the world but the king persisted in his weariness of cities and announced that he would stay forever where the orchids paled to purple in the quiet twilight therefore his counsellors being stimulated to a deed of daring by the stinging of their wives conspired together and hatched a plot to scare the king away from his jungle seat of thek they seized upon a prophet of the ancient gods and commanded him to tell king carnos that thek was foredoomed to be destroyed three days from then at sunset with every living thing that still walked within its precincts this prophecy they argued might be uttered with good conscience since no reasonable man in those advanced and scientific times believed any longer in the ancient gods but the prophet still believed and protested against this contemplated deed of blasphemy his attitude was adamantine until one of the appealing counsellors revealed a knowledge of the fact that the prophet had secretly taken unto himself a third wife in defiance of the ancient law which limited to two the number of wives with whom prophets were permitted to cohabit thereupon the prophet was constrained to obey the counsellors and to deliver to king carnos the lying message of the gods king carnos listened sedately to this prophecy and knew it for a lie because it was not reasonable and because in those advanced and scientific times none but priests and weakling women believed any longer in the ancient gods therefore the king decreed that on the third day at sunset when the falling of the filtered sands of time should have proved the prophet to be in very fact a liar his head should be severed from his trunk 
by the royal executioner. The prophet was a large man, nurtured in religion, and what he feared throughout the ticking of the hours still allotted to him before the execution of his doom was not the awfulness of death itself, which is a customary and familiar thing, as when a wind arises and sweeps across a table crowded with innumerable lighted candles, but the greater awfulness of something unfamiliar, some special visitation of the anger of the ancient gods against the first and only prophet who had ever made them seem to lie throughout immemorable centuries. Time moved serenely till the coming on of sunset, on the third day after the announcement of the manufactured prophecy. The contented king looked out upon the jungle and saw the sea of orchids pale to purple beneath the quiet touch of the twilight. The tortured prophet waited for his death until the sun dropped down below the tangled trees and King Carnos turned magnificently toward the royal executioner and ordered, Take away that man. But then a rumble arose, quietly at first, like the sighing of the sea, and then, more noisy, like the congregated roar and rattle of all the thunders of the world. This rumble was the rumor of the grim, sardonic laughter of the gods. The jungle seat of Thek was overwhelmed and swallowed up, and every living thing that walked within its precincts was drenched and drowned beneath the heavy seas of absolute oblivion. The ancient gods who cannot lie had chosen to fulfill the prophecy which had been wished upon them in a mood of fear and trembling by one of their august apostles. End of chapter 30「Scene on the Stage」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Warren Bergman. Seen on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Chapter 31 Lord Dunsany Personal Impressions. On a gusty night in October 1919, an Irish peer, the 18th baron of his line, stood in the rain in front of a little theatre at 466 Grand Street, in the heart of the Russian-Jewish quarter of the Great East Side. He was easily distinguishable, because of his extraordinary height and the hulking army overcoat which housed him from the drizzle. Two or three hundred strangers, for the most part Jewish people of the neighborhood, grasped him by the hand, patted him on the back, and asked him to scrawl his name on the fly-leaves of many books which they produced from pockets and presented proudly. The tall man was treated both as the host and as the guest of an unusual occasion. Suddenly there came a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder. "'That must be Clesh, said Lord Dunsany. "'He has come a long way from India.' The Irish peer himself had come a long way from Dunsany Castle and Messine Ridge for the specific purpose of seeing a couple of plays which he had never seen before, The Queen's Enemies and A Night at an Inn, and finding out why so many commentators had made so large a noise about them. I could not be present at the neighborhood playhouse on this particular occasion, but I asked the author afterward to tell me how it felt to see a full-fledged performance, with an audience and all, of a couple of plays which he had sent overseas in manuscript. All the other playwrights I have ever known have worried and worked over their manuscripts day after day throughout the initial weeks of rehearsals and the secondary weeks of tryouts, and have been heartily sick of hearing their own lines repeated long before the date of a metropolitan first night. Dunsany answered that this unusual experience of his had proved once more that you can't tell much about a play until you see it on the stage. A night at an inn exceeded his own expectations, and he was surprised to note the thrill which it communicated to the audience. "'It's a very simple thing,' he said. "'Merely a story of some sailors who have stolen something and know that they are followed. Possibly it is effective because nearly everybody at some time or other has done something he was sorry for, has been afraid of retribution, and has felt the hot breath of a pursuing vengeance on the back of his neck.' With the Queen's enemies, on the other hand, the author was a little disappointed. When I wrote these two pieces, he told me, I thought that the Queen was a better play than the Inn. 
now i know that a night at the inn is the more dramatic of the two but don't mistake me he continued the inn is a more effective play than the queen but it isn't so fine an undertaking suppose that i should give a block of wood to a sculptor and ask him to carve it and suppose that he should cut it very well that is a night at the inn suppose next that i should give a tusk of ivory to the same sculptor and he should carve it not so well that is the queen's enemies it isn't so dramatic a play as the inn but it is intrinsically finer why do you think that i inquired because of the idea the author answered the idea of a night at an inn is rather ordinary that i suppose is the reason why it hits the audience so hard and as several critics like yourself have pointed out it is an idea of the same sort that i had used before in the gods of the mountain but i like the idea of the queen's enemies i heard about an ancient queen of egypt who invited all her enemies to a feast of reconciliation and suddenly drowned them this meant nothing until i could imagine the motive for this extraordinary deed several months later the motive occurred to me the dear little queen had done this for the very simple reason that she didn't like to have any enemies she wanted to be loved not to be hated the rest was easy for the play was made when the motive was discovered do you always begin with the motive i asked not always said dunsany i begin with anything or with next to nothing then suddenly i get started and go through in a hurry the main point is not to interrupt a mood writing is an easy thing when one is going strong and going fast it becomes a hard thing only when the onward rush is impeded most of my short plays have been written in a sitting or two the other day he said in december nineteen nineteen i got an idea for a short play in st louis i began the composition on the train and finished it before we arrived in chicago it's a little piece about a monk who grew a halo i hope that you will like it how about the gods of the mountain i asked i wrote that in three sessions lord dunsany answered two afternoons between tea and dinner and another hour on the third afternoon a night in an inn was written between tea and dinner in a single sitting that was very easy no trouble about the dialogue i suggested dialogue isn't difficult if you have been around with men a lot and listen to them somebody says something the next man doesn't quite agree and unobtrusively suggests a reservation the third man says no not at all the truth is and that is dialogue but the writing well of course there is such a thing as rhythm lord dunsany answered you agree with me though that the dramatic value of a play stands quite apart from any literary merit it may or may not show in the writing of its dialogue i do indeed don't damn me as a literary playwright you have read ten of my plays but i have already written more than twenty the best of them are still unpublished i am holding them back in the hope that people may be forced to see them before they have a chance of reading them that reminds me of pinero i replied ten years ago sir arthur started a friendly habit of sending me prompt copies of each of his new plays but he made me promise never to read these printed texts till after i had seen the plays in the theatre particularly if i should be called upon to write critical reviews of them i can understand that said lord dunsany i misjudged the queen and the inn until i saw them acted if you write a play so quickly i suggested I infer that the whole thing must be planned out in your mind before you start to write it. Among magazine men I am known as a quick writer. I publish more than half a hundred articles a year, and most of them are turned out in a single night. But before I sit down to write the first sentence, I have been thinking for three or four days, in the subway between the acts, or when other people were talking to me. In the real sense, the task has more nearly consumed a week than a day an impromptu speech takes only three or four minutes but sometimes with me if the occasion is important it spoils a day or two beforehand i can't imagine anybody writing the gods of the mountain in a few hours confined within three days unless a long period of preparation much of it subconscious to be sure had gone before sometimes lord dunsany said i have thought the matter out and know exactly what i am going to do that was the case with the gods 
but at other times i just get started and follow a mood as a hunter follows the hounds i will give you an example king argemenes i saw a king in rags digging up a bone gnawing at it hungrily and saying this is a good bone i started the play with no idea whatever of its subsequent development i merely wrote along to find out what would happen i have always thought so i replied ungraciously you know of course that this is one of the few plays of yours that i don't especially admire it seems to me inconsequential and not built up to a climax that must be because i didn't know the end when i started the beginning of course it is better to have things planned the author added and not to trust entirely to the impulsion of a mood in recording this conversation i have anteceded the chronological order of these haphazard personal impressions as a matter of fact the first time that i met lord dunsany was at a public dinner in his honour at which i endeavoured to do my duty as one of the speakers it was a good occasion of the customary sort when we were coming away i asked him if he were growing tired of publicity publicity he countered quickly you don't call this public you ought to have seen our trenches under messine ridge that's the most public place i've ever been in we were in a valley the germans were on a hill they could see down to our boot tops he looked at me and asked how tall are you six feet one or thereabouts i am six feet four our trenches were only six feet deep i shall never fear publicity again on a subsequent occasion i asked lord dunsany to tell me something of his life in the army i was brought up to be a soldier he replied i wasn't sent to oxford or to cambridge but to sandhurst i went through the south african affair and the whole of the recent war i have this to say about military preparation it doesn't educate a man it merely trains him a trained man can do one single thing with almost mechanical perfection but an educated man can do almost anything that he is called upon to do i was merely trained it is better to be educated the college is a better place for this than the army at another time i touched upon the point that lord dunsany had not yet enjoyed the dubious experience so common to the rest of us of peddling his plays from manager to manager i told him that most of the american playwrights to whom i had presented him were required by the nature of the game to devote much more of their time to the practical task of placing their plays than to the more attractive task of writing them lord dunsany answered that may be the reason why ten or a dozen of my best plays have not yet been acted i have never had the time to peddle them ninety-seven per cent or thereabouts of my actual life has been spent out of doors in the pursuit of various athletic activities such as following the hounds playing cricket hunting big game or serving as a professional soldier the remaining three per cent has been spent in the writing of my tales and plays the records of my dreams what time is left for peddling my literary wares i have recently written two or three plays of full length which treat of contemporary life in london how does one sell these things in london or new york this question surprised me until i made the astonishing discovery that i had actually earned more money from a single failure in our commercial theatre than lord dunsany has earned from all of the successes in our little theatres that have made him famous when the gods of the mountain was put into rehearsal at the haymarket theatre in london he was offered ten pounds for the world rights in perpetuity this contract struck him as inequitable and he requested that the world rights should be limited to five years this period has long ago elapsed but the author received less than fifty dollars for the first five years of the actual existence of what is probably the greatest short play in the world it is gratifying to record that he has since developed by experience a business sense that is more practical writing plays he told me is the one thing i most dearly love but i cannot talk of it at home in county meath my aunt would be scandalized if she should hear that i have written plays my neighbors would dismiss me as insane everybody else would think me a fool i had to come to your country to find a sympathetic audience i told him that sir arthur pinero after the comparative failure of mid-channel in london and the comparative success of the same piece in new york had said to me jocosely if it were not for america we couldn't keep alive 
Lord Dunson, he said, your public is surprisingly alert. Having been a lecturer myself, I answered adversely, when people seem to like our speeches and swarm around us to request us to sign books, we naturally think that they have brains. To this he answered, that is not the point. In your country I have met many people who are not ashamed to talk of art. In England nowadays the subject is laughed away from the carpet. When The Gods of the Mountain was first produced at the Haymarket Theatre, one rather snobbish critic said that the play was bad for the mere reason that it had been written by a nobleman. He ordered me back to my ancestral castle, just as Keats was ordered back, a century ago, to his apothecary pots. Why should Keats have been despised in a period of aristocracy, and why should I be despised in a period of democracy? It isn't my fault that I try to write beautiful tales and effective plays. It is only in your country that my attempts have been appreciated. I have no fame in England. I have scarcely any ranking among the authors of my own country. You know many more of them than I do, but I am grateful to your nation for the incentive to carry on. Poets thrive upon appreciation, and I need the sort of encouragement that has been granted to me by your hospitable people. How about that division of your life? I asked. Three percent of which, according to your smiling statement, has been devoted to your writing, and the overwhelming remainder to athletics. I have found this out, said Lord Dunsany, that you must not talk of art to the majority of men who follow active lives in the open air, like cricketers or huntsmen or soldiers. On the other hand, I have found out that among artists you may extol without embarrassment the virtues of the athletes of the world. Why is it that the men of action are always afraid of the men of dreams, whereas the men of dreams are never afraid of the men of action? It must be because the dream is always stronger than the act. Jeanne d'Arc is ever more potent to win a battle than a regiment of British soldiers. That is because this peasant girl of long ago has been made real by the imagination of millions of people. Nothing can at any time be realized but what has been imagined. I like the act of life in the open, and after four or five years in the war I actually feel uncomfortable in a room with the windows closed. But the act of life is very lonely. I can talk to a man of letters like yourself about cricketing or lion hunting or soldiering, and you will be interested, because artists are interested in everything. But I cannot talk about my dreams to cricketers or soldiers or lion hunters. They would think that something had gone wrong with me. I was very lonely in the trenches, and it has been a great pleasure for me to meet so many writers in America and to find that most of them are sportsmen as well. What do you think of the effect of the war upon the drama? I inquired. Four years of hell and heroism have trampled down the immediate actual and reminded us of the insistence of the perennial real. We have learned that idealism is the only absolute reality. The stricken world must reawaken, and the theater should be resurrected with it. The time has passed away for such faithful but depressing records of the drabbest aspects of our current life as the night lodging of Maxim Gorky, an act of which I saw the other day. A moment has arrived for reminding the theater-going public that such a thing as splendor is still to be discerned in the records of experience. Let us set before the public splendid images of beauty, for beauty is truth despite the critic who tried to send Keats back to his apothecary pots. Keats died without knowing whether he would be famous or not, said I. You are famous at forty. You have been luckier than Keats. Yes, I have been lucky, he replied, thanks mainly to your country, but that is as it should be. I am not speaking personally, but after all, I am a poet, and poets ought to be appreciated in their lifetime. In England, a poet has to die to be appreciated. Look at Rupert Brooke. They wouldn't read him while he lived. In England, I am merely a lord. Aren't you at all bored by being lionized in this country? Not at all. I like it, he replied. Lord Dunsany is a man who, whether you agree with him or not on any given point, is undeniably alive. He is excessively tall, loose-jointed, raw-boned, rather awkward, and encumbered with a large head and enormous hands and feet. He admits jocosely that, at home, he is generally regarded as the worst-dressed man in County Meath. 
he shambles along with a drooping posture accentuated doubtless by his long and cramping experience in the trenches under messine ridge but his mind is neither awkward nor drooping he talks fluently and well and his nature is so frank and simple that he is a very easy man to get acquainted with End of chapter 31、chapter、32、of Scene on the Stage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, Stage Left.org. Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton. Edmund Rostan. April 1, 1868. December 2, 1918. One advantage comes to us when we have passed that milestone of experience which marks the mezzo del cammin di nostra vita. While remaining unaware of any obvious decrease in physical or mental vigor, we grow ready to enjoy some of the delights which by tradition are reserved for age. In particular, we begin by gradual degrees to become conscious of that keenest pleasure of which the maturing mind is capable the joy of recalling the affluent impressions of adventures long ago and far away. We are eager, after thirty five, to remember what we used to be, and this new eagerness provides us with a new excitement. We discover with surprise that Thomas Campbell spoke the truth when he told us that. Tis distance lends enchantment to the view. It seems at first a strange and wondrous gift to be able to look backward over a purple vista of twenty or thirty years. Old age begins beforehand to assume a sort of aureole. For how wonderful a man is moved to think this life of ours will look when we are able to recall a past experience across a mist of half a century. Quand vous serez bien vieille, Occurs as the most pathetic phrase in all the sonnets that were ever written, but the counter phrase, quand vous étiez bien jeune, is possibly more poignant still to the imagination. When I picked up a paper and read the brief and tragic news that Edmond Rostand had joined the famous Nations of the Dead, I thought first not about the man himself, but about the much that he had meant to me a score of years ago when I was but a boy. In fairly recent years, I have published two or three critical and reasonable essays about the work of this intoxicating poet, but these essays were written in that reticent and careful manner which impose on the commentator a punctilious obligation to refer to himself as the present writer. Such sage pronouncements usually err by tilting all too timidly away from sheer enthusiasm. Several years ago, the present commentator, Apropos of Chanticleer, pronounced this sentence on Edmond Rostand quote, He is a consummate writer, surely, but he has the air of a spoiled child sporting in an illimitable playroom where all the toys are words. End quote. That's the sort of thing that critics write when they are under thirty. It is only after we are old enough to remember the lost days of our youth that we who ply the pen begin to speak out from the heart. To let ourselves go, as the phrase is, and to employ in print the genuinely modest pronoun I. By an accident of dates, I am able to recall the entire career of the laureled poet who lies dead in France at the early age of fifty. I never saw him in the flesh, but he is one of the very few contemporary writers from whom I have received that unforgettable, Exalted tingling of the spirit, which otherwise has been inspired in me only by Italian paintings, or Greek statues, or French cathedrals, or one of two great living people it has been my pleasure to know, like Madame Yvette Gilbert. Many critics have already weighed and estimated the importance of Edmond Rostand, but now I cannot think of him at all except as one of those who in my youth first taught me to love everlastingly. The loveliness of words. I was brought up, by a happy accident, to understand both languages, and in my childhood I read as many masterpieces of French literature as I read of English. But I had never heard of Edmond Rostand until the new year of 1898, when I was sixteen years of age. 
I still remember clearly the noise of the first news, heard all around the rolling globe, that Cyrano de Bergerac, produced in Paris on the night of December 28, 1897, was the most entrancing play that had ever yet been shown at any time on any stage. This news seemed at the moment to be unbelievable, and for several months we who waited in America were expecting a categorical denial of its authenticity. Meanwhile, however, many travelers from overseas returned with the assurance that the news was true. An unknown poet had positively written at the early age of 29 the most captivating play in history. To me, among innumerable others, this suggestion was stimulative of a feverish excitement. I put in an order at Brantano's for the text and bothered the bookstore for days and days and weeks and weeks until the first copies came to us across the ocean. I remember vaguely that there was a rather long delay, due doubtless to some accident of printing. At any rate, before the text arrived, all of us whose names were registered upon the waiting list had been made familiar by international reports with the project and the plot and I can still recollect my ecstatic joy at securing one of the first consignment of copies that was landed in this country. In those days, it was the year of the Spanish-American War, there was a shabby little cafe in 6th Avenue, on the east side just south of 28th Street, that was known as the Café du Bordeaux. It has long since been cleaned up and improved and modernized, as the Rey de Chaussée of the worthy establishment conducted for the comfort of the present generation of New Yorkers by the estimable Monsieur Moquin. But in the old days of which I speak, the Café de Bordeaux was a dingy place, frequented by impoverished Frenchmen who played backgammon on decaying boards or ancient gambling games with dirty decks of cards. Thither, at a moment now a score of years ago, I made my way, because at that time, it was one of three places in New York where one might secure a veritable Amer Picon, a Grenadine, and Eau de Sense. My virgin copy of Cyrano de Bergerac was sticking out of my pocket, and some French waiter, on vacation, saw it. I was set upon at once and made to open up the book and forced to read aloud. Je jette va grâce mon foutre, je fais lancement l'abandon du grand manteau. In a moment or two, the games of backgammon ceased, and the whispering of falling cards was quenched in silence. I was soon enthroned upon a table and reading, in my rhetorical schoolboyish manner, the sonorous series of trilettes beginning, Ce sont des cadettes de Gascogne, de Carbon de Castel Jaloux. At the end of the first stanza, that helter-skelter company of Frenchmen far from home broke spontaneously into cheers. I enjoyed my first and only triumph as an actor. That day within that place, men played no more. Thereafter, night after night, I squandered the after-midnight gas, reading and rereading the magic text of this entrancing play, and it is pleasant now to think that innumerable other boys whom I have never met were rendered sleepless at the same time by the same apparent miracle. Why can't we feel these things so keenly when we are nearly forty as in the brave days when we were under twenty? But to answer that question would be to solve the ever more recurrent riddle, why all the greatest actors are dead actors, and all the things most worthy of the seeing were seen always somewhere long ago. Perhaps my little boys will tell me when I am really old. I recall now that in recent years I have written one or two maturely reasoned articles to prove that Cyrano de Bergerac was not a great play after all. I have even asserted, on the lecture platform, that the project of the plot is fundamentally immoral. These intellectual considerations begin to seem important to dramatic critics who have passed the pinnacle of thirty, but they never bothered our appreciative minds when we were young enough to love things lovely without interruptive questionings or arrière pensée. Neither do they bother us when we are old enough to remember with delight the enthusiasms of our youth. Even now, while strolling home with the nights through silent streets, before the milk carts have begun to clatter, I often hear myself repeating to myself, Philosophe, physicien, Raymour, Breteur, musicien, et voyageur, et rien. When the news of the incomparable success of the new piece at the Pont Saint-Martin 
had been thoroughly authenticated. Richard Mansfield, the foremost American actor of the time, closed his season, slipped quietly across the ocean, and sat night after night watching from the front the performance of Coquelin. Mansfield was the first actor that I saw in the part. Coquelin I did not see until the autumn of 1900, when he opened in New York at the Garden Theater with Sarah Bernhardt as Roxanne. I shall never forget that opening. On Sunday, the day of the dress rehearsal, Coquelin was afflicted with an acute attack of intestinal indigestion. This ailment was so painful that he could not sleep at all for 48 hours. Yet on Monday, the first night of his public appearance, he carried off the whole stupendous undertaking with no indication whatsoever that anything was wrong. I saw him again on Tuesday night, and twice on Wednesday, and so on throughout the week. Eight performances of the same play in six successive days. Would to God that some ingratiating spirit might arise to make me love the theater now as I must have loved it then. Being thoroughly familiar with both Cyrano's, the others, even Wyndham, do not count, I am able to testify that Mansfield's was not by any means an imitation of Coquelin's. It was indeed deliberately different, and in many technical respects it was more obviously meritorious. Mansfield's performance was more clever, more astonishing, more brilliant. For instance, he outranged the scope of Coquelin in the scene in which the hero detains the Comte de Guiche by narrating his pretended adventures during the course of a descent from the moon. Mansfield chanted this entire passage mystically, making use of those cello tones of a voice which, for musical efficiency, was utterly unrivaled in the world. But despite the cleverness of Mansfield, I prefer the performance of Coquelin. I am sure now that Coquelin was greater for the simple reason that I find it more difficult after twenty years to remember what Coquelin did at any questionable moment than to remember what Mansfield did. Mansfield acted the part admirably. But Coquelin walked on and was Cyrano, and that was the only fact to be regarded. To this feeling, the supreme expression was accorded by the author in his dedication of the play. C'est à l'homme de Cyrano que je voulais dédier ce poème. Mais puisqu'elle a passé en vous, Coquelin, c'est à vous que je le dédie. In these hurried days, when so many other matters are demanding to be read about that the death of a great poet appears only as a momentary bubble on the tide of time, space and time are lacking for a record of impressions garnered from a loving recollection of the earliest performances of the other masterpieces of Edmond Rostand. I call them masterpieces now, without critical exception or reasonable reservation, because concerning this aristocrat of poets, it must at least be said that, Throughout his whole life of half a century, he never wrote a bad line and never touched a subject that he did not manage to adorn. Any poet who can haunt the ear for twenty years must manifestly be immortal. The newspapers tell me that Edmond Rostand died in Paris of influenza and pneumonia at 1.30 p.m. on December 2, 1918. I don't believe this news. Not really because so often and so often I have walked the streets of countless cities, saying over to myself, C'est chose bien commune de supérieur pour un blonde châtain ou blonde maîtresse. Lorsque blonde châtain ou blonde, on n'a sans peine. Moi, j'aime la lantenne princesse. That final phrase has always sounded to my ear like a backward flinging of full fingers over streaming strings. I have never heard anything more instrumental in all lyric literature. Edmund Rostand is dead, the papers tell me. But this poet cannot really die, so long as French remains a living language, and little boys are taught to listen to it in a loving country overseas. End of chapter 32. Read by Chuck Lavazzi, stageleft.org, March 2023. End of Scene on the Stage by Clayton Hamilton